Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first ever Culture of Democracy Summit. We are so excited to be here with you today. I am Stephanie Young. I am the executive director of When We All Vote, and I am so thrilled to welcome everyone to the first day of our summit. We have a long weekend planned, but this is just the beginning. For those of you who don't know us, When We All Vote is a nonpartisan organization uh, that was founded by Michelle Obama in 2018, and we are on a mission to change the culture around voting and to increase participation in each and every election by helping to close the race and the voting age gap. And that's what today's really about. Today is about changing the culture, whether it's the music we listen to, the shows we binge, or the influencers we follow. Everyone plays a role in shaping the culture of our democracy. That includes you. And you're going to hear from so many amazing people today. We've got panels focused on the state of climate change, reproductive justice, really the state of voting rights. We'll be talking about how do we engage Gen Z, and we'll spend time uh, talking about our democracy and how we all work together to strengthen it and protect it. I hope everybody leaves here today inspired, feeling energized, and excited to get involved. And I also hope you join us on Monday to hear from our founder, Michelle Obama. I want to give a big shout out to all of our speakers, our panelists, our friends, our supporters, our sponsors, and the entire One Wheel Vote team for making today possible. And I want to thank you again for joining us. As many of you know, when We All Vote is an initiative of Civic Nation, and to help us get started today, I want to kick it over to my good friend, CEO of Civic Nation, Kyle Lehrman. Kyle. Thank you, Stephanie. As Stephanie mentioned, I'm Kyle Lehrman, the CEO of Civic Nation. We're a nonpartisan, nonprofit ecosystem for organizing and education initiatives working to build a more inclusive and equitable America. And we're so proud to be the home of the One We All Vote initiative. Stephanie and I have been working together for many years and working together since the founding of When We All Vote, working side by side to bring this effort to life. And since she has taken on the role of executive director, she has been doing an absolutely incredible job taking When We All Vote to the next level. I couldn't be prouder of her and all the staff at When We All Vote and Civic Nation that made this summit possible. Back in 2018, when we first spoke with Michelle Obama about the idea to launch an initiative dedicated to closing the race and age voting gap, we knew that we couldn't just build an initiative that was focused on getting folks to show up at the polls every two years or every four years. In order to make real and lasting change, we needed to change the entire culture around voting and civic engagement in our country, making it something that permeates into music and sports and entertainment and calling on leaders from across our society to use the power they have to help their fellow Americans register and vote in every election. When We All Vote has achieved so much since it first began in 2018, and the Culture of Democracy Summit is the next big step in continuing this critical work and making sure that everyone can be a part of it. Thank you to all of you who have supported this event and helped get us here today. You're going to hear from some incredible speakers today who are leading the charge to change the culture of our democracy. I want to help kick us off by welcoming someone who has been with us since the beginning, someone who I've had the privilege to work with for many years and who makes all the work we do at When We All Vote and Civic Nation possible. Former senior advisor to President Barack Obama and the board chair of Civic Nation, Valerie Jarrett. Stephanie, I couldn't be more prouder of the work that our teams here at When We All Vote and Civic Nation have done to pull together this amazing event. Of course, none of this would be possible without the inspiration and leadership of our former First Lady, Michelle Obama, who has spent the last five years since When We All Vote launched, trying to ensure that we have educated and engaged voters in our country. None of this would be possible also without our sponsors, our donors, our supporters, and the generosity of our speakers who are joining us virtually today from all over the country. I can't think of a more important time for us to bring people together for this nonpartisan conversation about the roles that all of us play in protecting and strengthening our democracy. Because this is truly a critical moment for our democracy and for our country, our ability to make our voices heard at the ballot box is under attack, and the barriers to voting are being disproportionately felt 
by communities of color, voters with disabilities, and our young voters. That's exactly what we're going to focus on today. How do we build that culture together? And how can we ensure that we're not just focusing this work every two years or every four years when an election day rolls around, but every single day? Today is just the beginning of a wonderful collection of events we have planned for the Culture of Democracy Summit. And I want to thank you each and every single one of you for tuning in and being a part of this important moment. Thank you so much. Let's make this summit tremendous. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, and thank you guys again. I think there's a theme happening here. You keep hearing culture uh, over and over and over again. So uh, with that uh, said, with you know, that in mind, I'm thinking about the late, great Biggie Smalls. It was all a dream. This summit was all a dream. And it was, this is literally a dream realized. And a part of the dream was to ensure that we were bringing together the community of organizers and leading leaders in the voting rights uh, and voter protection spaces, uh, and especially the folks that are working alongside us to help register voters all over this country. So it is with great pleasure that I bring up Andrea Haley, who is the amazing CEO of Vote.org. We will be spotlighting a lot of uh, leaders today, and Andrea is one of them. She's been a great partner to When We All Vote, and we're so excited to have her here today. So with that, Andrea, come on up. <laughs> thank you, Stephanie. I want to say a huge thank you to the whole When We All Vote community and team and the team at Civic Nation. In particular, Stephanie, your leadership has been instrumental in so much of the work that's happened over the last year. And uh, you are a brilliant strategist and leader. And I just wanna thank you for having me here today. Um, my name is Andrea Haley and I work in voting rights because um, this is not just a job to me. It's deeply, deeply personal. Uh, in my family, originally from South Carolina, Anderson, South Carolina, my grandfather, left for World War II to fight um, for our country only to come back in a nation that challenged his ability to vote and to participate in local elections. Every generation in my family has faced the same challenges and I still do in Indianapolis, Indiana today. So that's why I come to this work and why I show up every day at vote.org to do the very best I can to make sure that all voters across our nation have access to the information they need to participate from polling place locations to drop boxes to absentee requests to registering over 4 million voters in the last election cycle. Vote.org remains a trusted source of nonpartisan information um, where everyone can access what they need to participate. So we can't do this work alone at Vote.org. It takes a community of people. It takes a community of organizations. Um, it takes everyone really caring about protecting the right to vote and realizing that the right to vote can get rolled back at any given moment in our country if we don't continuously show up. So if you are out there today, I don't care if you have one follower or 10 million followers. I don't care if you have a small platform, a large platform. If you want to become the vote captain of your family, your neighborhood, your community, your state, Make sure that people go to vote.org or any of our other organizations um, that are also out here and make sure that you have trusted information to give to your family and friends. Make sure they're registered to vote. Make sure people are participating. Um, it's essential that we turn out and protect our elections. And with that, I'm going to now introduce a few of my voting rights heroes, people who I personally admire and look up to every single day. Uh, it's my honor to bring in our next panel, which is um, uh, Sherilyn Eiffel and Mark Elias. And uh, we are going to be moder have moderated by um, Asian uh, Herndon. And I'm very uh, excited to introduce everyone and to turn the mic over. Hi, thank you all, and uh, I appreciate you having me. My name is Estet Herndon from the New York Times, and I am thankful for the, the um, opportunity to lead this panel and for my fellow panelists uh, uh, for joining me. I'll hop right into it. Um, 
you know, I have some set questions here, but then a, a summit about culture of democracy. I feel like I wouldn't be a good journalist if I didn't ask about what we saw yesterday, uh, 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 a hearing that was really about the erosion of a culture of democracy uh, that um, in, in terms of the bipartisan committee presenting what they saw on January 6th. I'm wondering what you two thought of that, uh, and 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 just a quick uh, a quick response once I end before I get to those uh, before I get to the, our real questions for today. Mark, please go ahead. Okay, I was going to say it's the same. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I'll break I'll break the ice here. Uh, um, so look, I was both terrified shocked and not shocked like in its in it in its um in its rawest form it was presented that we what we saw was a violent attack on american democracy uh on january 6 2021 and like i said that that both was shocking to see in its in its vividness and in here seeing the testimony but it was not shocking in that i think we have known for some time now that that is what happened on January 6th um, and that that threat, you know, has not ended. January 6th was not the end, it was not the beginning, it was the middle. Um, so, you know, we have to, we have to keep, keep vigilant and never forget. Mm -hmm. Sherilyn, there have been over 500 plus voter suppression bills that have been proposed at at least 19 states have passed laws, including some of the most extreme we've seen in places like Georgia or Texas that are uh, that have increased voting restrictions for folks. Uh, can you tell us how did we get here and specifically uh, uh, are, and specifically what are the populations that are most affected by these laws? Thank you so much and I'm grateful to, to everyone who's put together this summit, which I think is so important and I'm grateful to be included. Um, let me answer your first question very briefly first, because um, I agree wholeheartedly with Mark, and, uh, but I would add another lens to it. You know, when I was a girl, uh, quite young girl, trying not to date myself too much, uh, you know, I, I basically was kind of transformed by watching the Watergate hearings. Now, we watched the hearings because it was the only thing on uh, and all day. And uh, it was summertime and we were home as kids. And that's where I first saw Barbara Jordan, who became my inspiration. Uh, and I wanted to be like her. Uh, what I saw was not just that it became obvious as the summer wore on that the president and the people around him had done something terrible. I didn't understand all of the ins and outs of it. But what, I, what impressed me, what actually moved me, what actually set me in many ways on the path I ended up on was my excitement about seeing the fact that our country was dealing with it that Congress was on a bipartisan basis bringing this information out uh, and that there was a mechanism, there was a process for addressing an attack on our democracy. So I would just add to what Mark said that I'm so happy that last night was presented and that it was presented in prime time. Of course, what we saw was horrible, particularly the elements that demonstrate the coordination and planning. But I hope that the networks will not lose heart and will understand, Stephanie said, everyone has to do their part they also have to do their part. And I hope that they will continue to cover these hearings in prime time so that young people, like I was a young person, can see uh, these hearings and understand that in a democracy, there has to be an accountability structure and that they can see it and be a part of it. So that's number one. Number two, to your question, um, obviously it's black and brown voters who are disproportionately harmed by voter suppression laws and quite intentionally so, right? So this, they are not voter suppression laws that are agnostic about that. Uh, there is a deliberate attempt to target certainly black voters in particular, but we see it uh, affecting also disabled voters when uh, drop boxes are eliminated or are, are removed from outside polling places, uh, outside the uh, uh, Board of Elections to inside the Board of Elections. Uh, we see that students are disproportionately affected, that rural voters are disproportionately affected by voter suppression schemes. When you limit absentee voting, uh, the elderly, the disabled. So, so it actually is a scheme to shrink the electorate, but it's a very deliberate scheme uh, to try and uh, shrink a part of the electorate. Uh, and, um, and how did we get here? Um, I'm not of the view that we got here because of Trump. Um, I uh, joined the Legal Defense Fund, the organization that I led for 10 years and just stepped down from leadership uh, I joined that organization in 1988 as a voting rights lawyer. 
Uh, and I was trained under the great Lonnie Guineer and Pam Carlin, who were brilliant voting rights attorneys themselves. And so I've been doing voting rights work for a very long time. It's not as though I'm trying to get back to um, the, the great days of even the Obama administration or the Carter administration um, or the Clinton administration. We had lots of voting rights cases then, too, um, because, of course, uh, the states have a lot of control over the rules that govern how people vote. And so it's important for people to understand that this has been a long fight. But it's also important for people to understand that the fight has deeply intensified over the last seven years and that the tactics that are being used are new tactics in some ways in that they are directly targeting the integrity of the process itself. That is the counting of ballots. That is the integrity of the individuals who work in the polling place, uh, the physical threats to them. Um, and so we're seeing something quite intense, quite deliberate, quite frightening, and something that we have to get our hands around. Mm -hmm. Mark, to that point, American democracy has always been an ongoing project refined and expanded uh, uh, to kind of meet up to those original values. But in your view, what is unique about this moment and how is democracy being tested in new ways? Yeah, so look, I, I agree with everything Sherilyn says, and I, I think that it's being tested in new ways in two important respects. The first is that we have had an epidemic of voter suppression in this country for as long as this country has been around. Um, what we are seeing now, though, is a targeting, not just the beginning of the process, voter registration, right? If you think about the 1950s and the 1960s, the struggle was being able to allow people to register and being able to vote. What's really different now is how much of this is targeting what I call the back end of the process, how votes are cast, counted, and certified. Um, you know, we, we didn't really have a certification crisis in this country uh, until, uh, uh, until uh, relatively recently. Uh, and now it is not just the one-off exception that comes up by historical accident. It is actually part of the planned strategy uh, uh, by some to undermine elections uh, in in how they in how the the will of the electorate goes from being cast to being counted and certified. The second is, of course, that you know, and and I grew up in an age where um, engaging in bad behavior around voter suppression was socially unacceptable. That doesn't mean it didn't happen, but in the, you know, in the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, if you were a vote suppressor, you didn't advertise you were a vote suppressor. You kind of, you kind of hid that fact. And now it is actually a badge of honor by some that they were at the January 6th insurrection <laughs> were arrested. It is a badge of honor that they will say that they won't certify elections regardless of the accurate outcome. And that is, from a culture standpoint, incredibly dangerous because at the point that, that we have people who think it is more important to disenfranchise my neighbor, it is more important to discard the results of my community in furtherance of who I want to win or lose, um, that's a really, really dangerous part for democracy. And I, 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 I am the furthest thing from a fan of, of former Attorney General Barr. Um, I think he was a disgraceful Attorney General, period. But the clip paid, played uh, last night in the hearings from him, in which he said, you can't just have people deciding after the election not to uh, abide by its results. He's right. But neither he nor too many others uh, have done enough to prevent that. How should we think about the, the urgency of these threats? I mean, I remember once doing an interview with former Attorney General Eric Holder, in which he said without serious changes to our election infrastructure, that, quote, elections as we know it might, in America might be fundamentally changed. Um, Sherilyn, do you think that that is the stakes in which we're talking about here? I absolutely do. I absolutely do. And I think we ignore that reality at our peril. What is most distressing to me, Astiat, is that, you know, if you read the language of the Voting Rights Act itself, um, it's so clear that Congress anticipated, you know, Mark is right, we haven't seen back end 
um, vote suppression of this sort until kind of recently. But the truth is that um, Congress, in creating the Voting Rights Act, recognized the possibility that voter suppression would look differently in the future. And when you look at the, the, what, what we mean by voting that's protected under the Voting Rights Act, we don't only mean casting the ballot. It explicitly talks about casting the ballot, having the ballot counted, and having that count added to the official tally, right? And we see the language that was that is in Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Section 5 is the section that basically was um, uh, you know, disempowered by the Shelby versus uh, Holder decision in 2013 by John Roberts by kind of getting rid of the formula of required and jurisdictions that were required to submit voting changes for preclearance to a federal authority before enacting them. And that, of course, set off a wave of voter suppression. So that increase since 2013 is absolutely true. But in Section 5, what Congress said was that Section 5 and, and the Voting Rights Act in general was meant to address not only existing voter suppression schemes, but what they called, and I'm quoting the language, ingenious schemes that might be enacted in the future. So the act was so perfect in that it recognized that it would be a shape shifter, that at that time they were really focused on the South, that uh, white supremacists in the South would not easily comply. Uh, and so they created a mechanism that allowed it to encompass what voter suppression might look like in the future. They maybe didn't have voter ID laws as a problem in, at that time. They didn't have uh, drop boxes or some of the things that we're seeing now, um, but they had anticipated it. And so that's why we can't forget the Supreme Court's role in gutting the protection that had been created by Congress. Um, and now everything we do is without that protection until we have a strong enough uh, Congress that has enough senators who are willing to pass amendments to the Voting Rights Act to restore its strength. And for that, we need people to vote um, because we don't get that strength in Voting Rights Act unless we have a Senate that is prepared uh, to vote in favor of passing a refreshed Voting Rights Act and doing the kinds of things that Eric Holder was talking about, which is strengthening our election system. There's no shame in, in recognizing and having the, the weaknesses of your election system exposed. There is shame, however, in not addressing those weaknesses once they have been exposed. There is shame, however, in leaving your democracy vulnerable to the kind of tactics that we're seeing now simply because you won't act because you want to hold on to power. That is mm -hmm. shameful in a democracy. Mm -hmm. Mark, we have seen these issues and the, and the protection of voting rights become a bigger, bigger topic politically. You've seen uh, the Senate try to hold a vote on some of those uh, voting rights measures this year. We know that those uh, things were not able to pass. I, I mean, in my political reporter universe, it seems like the passage of this legislation, uh, uh, For People Act, uh, uh, others, think feels very unlikely at this moment. What is the reality that you would tell to you know, folks watching at home? What's the likelihood that we get uh, voting rights legislation from Congress? So there's no bigger disappointment in my mind than the failure of Congress to meet the moment um, uh, that it was presented with. Uh, there were important bills that were passed out of the House, the For the People Act, the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, uh, the then sort of combined version of those two that had a similar name, which I'll spare you all, um, but ultimately, the Senate couldn't do its job, right? I mean, the first job of elected body is to protect the, the integrity of elections and of democracy. And that was a major loss, and I don't want to sugarcoat that. Um, the, the likelihood that we will see those bills pass, the reauthorization and expansion and strengthening of the Voting Rights Act, critically important. Like the chances we will see that, I think, this year are virtually none. And I think that to echo what Sherilyn said, um, you know, everyone needs to wake up and participate in this process to protect voting rights. I think we are one to two election cycles away from losing our democracy for good unless people are willing to stand up and say, this is not okay. And we need people to register to vote. We need people to vote. Um, and we need people to understand that in the myriad of issues that present you in any given day, the crisis of climate, the crisis 
likely facing us after the Supreme Court renders its decision um, in the uh, reproductive rights case, the crisis of, of inflation. These are all genuine problems facing America. But if we don't understand that the single most pressing concern facing the future of our country is a destruction of, of voting rights and democracy, then we will lose to the other side for whom this is their one issue. You know, look at the videos you saw on TV last night. Look at the look at the hear the testimony you heard and understand that if we don't prioritize restoration and expansion and preservation of the Voting Rights Act, we will simply not have any of those other things. So I don't think we're going to have legislation this year, but we can't give up on Congress. We can't let them off the hook. This is their job. And there's a possibility and there's a possibility next year if, yeah. if people come out and vote this year, as I was suggesting, it's not as though we can never get those pieces of legislation, it's that it requires a different calculus in the Senate. And people have to recognize that we are talking about um, a political process that bills are passed through the legislature. Our legislature is the House and the Senate, the voting rights bills pass the House, and um, you know we're unable to pass in the Senate. So we need more um, senators who have the proclivity and who are interested in protecting the right of every eligible citizen to vote, which, you know, that should be a no-brainer. But as Mark said, it's a new day. Um, and so people need to understand, if we want to put in place those protections, and we do, we could do it next year if we had the kinds of um, senators who were prepared to fight for democracy, whatever their political party or affiliation, who believed that democracy was more important than power. Mm -hmm. A recent CNN poll showed that one in three American voters believe the president was not lawfully elected. I wonder for you all, uh, with, with, with the issue of democracy protection so central to your work, how do you deal with conspiracy and misinformation that has frankly uh, uh, become more deeply rooted in American politics? Well, we have a lot of crises, as Mark said, and democracy is an ecosystem. Uh, it is not just about voting, to be honest. Uh, voting is critical and central, but it is also about people having um, reliable information and understanding what the truth is, uh, that facts being central to the democracy. It also is about um, uh, you know, peaceful resolutions of, of issues. It is also about ensuring that um, there is fairness in the courts um, and fairness in the selection of who sits on courts, fairness in policing, fairness in education, all of those are elements of our democracy. And so when people talk about the conspiracy theory piece, that's because we uh, unfortunately have failed to understand the threat to democracy that misinformation and a movement that now has developed to uh, really promote anti-truth laws, how incredibly dangerous that is in a democracy. Every democracy that's fallen, and some that have done the most horrible things we can imagine, um, always include in their portfolio a demand that the truth not be known, a demand that uh, the few are in control of how history is taught. So when you see these bills around the country in various states trying to keep children in schools from knowing the truth about racism, about gender discrimination, about LGBTQ communities, when you see the banning of books happening around the country, that is also part of the threat to democracy at this moment. And so unfortunately, we have to multitask. Um, we have to be working on all of these things at once and closing those doors. We do have to figure out how we're going to handle what happens online uh, and the kinds of information and disinformation that people are exposed to. So we have a lot of work. This is a democracy moment. But as Mark pointed out, it begins, it begins with understanding um, the, the need to ensure that you can vote uh, and that you're participating in the political process. Now, voting's not the be all and end all. You have to march, you have to protest. Um, you know, those who believe in boycotts have to boycott. Uh, you know, those who believe in petitions have to sign petitions. Um, you know, those who believe in direct action uh, and sit-ins have to do that. There, it's a, there are all of these tools that are available to make your democracy better. Voting is one of them, but it happens to be the most important. And as the Supreme Court said, back in 1880, um, the right to vote is fundamental and preservative 
of all of the other rights because it creates the space in which you can do those other things. When you can't vote, then you can't push back against laws that are being passed in states that are stopping people from being able to protest, right? Or stopping people from being able to learn the truth. So we have to multitask in this moment. This is the hand we were dealt and we've got to play it. Uh, but we've got to play every hand. We don't get to sit some out and say, yeah, I don't feel like it this year. We've got to play every hand uh, if we're going to not only save democracy, which to some people may sound highfalutin, but to have the power over our own destiny. And I'm speaking now as a black woman and a person who's represented black communities for my career. If we want the ability to set the direction of our communities, if we want to change and transform the material condition of the lives of our families and communities, then we have to participate in order to have that power. Mark, so me, let me, can I add one quick yeah, no, point no. to the end of this? Because I don't often get to talk to very famous people from the New York Times. There is a role for the media in this. Hey, say it. You know, the fact is that cable news right now has more shows dedicated on a weekly basis to covering the media. Like literally the media talking about itself. More shows doing that than they do about democracy. There's not a single half hour that cable news can find in all of their shows to say every week we're going to talk about democracy. Your newspaper spends more time covering the New York Yankees than it does democracy. Now, I love the Yankees. I'm from New York. <laughs> I, I read your newspaper for coverage of the Yankees. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to go ahead and say I don't think that's true, but go ahead. <laughs> uh, uh, total number of articles on democracy versus the Yankees. Like, the media needs to be unabashedly pro-democracy. Mm -hmm. Like, not neutral, but pro-democracy. And we are seeing at the local level, the decimation of local coverage at the national level, we have seen a, a, a interest in covering democracy as a political issue and as a horse race, rather than as a fundamental right. I'm not saying every story. I'm not saying every reporter. I'm certainly not saying columnists. But I'm just saying, like, the, new, the media needs to realize that democracy doesn't end when the First Amendment, uh, where the First Amendment ends. It continues through the act of voting and participation. Yeah, I would point folks to the great coverage of democracy's erosion that's happening at the New York Times. I, uh, I have another, I mean, there's also an exhaustion among voters that is true. When you speak about uh, things happening on multiple fronts, that's something that individual people are feeling. They're dealing with uh, inflation. They're dealing with climate change. They're dealing with all of these things. How do you all, as people who are trying to motivate the public around this issue specifically, convince the, the public to prioritize democracy over things that are hurting them or, or maybe affecting them in the short term uh, 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 a little more deeply? You know, so that's why I, I, I said what I said earlier, which is, you know, talking about democracy rings my chimes, but I recognize uh, that it doesn't ring the chimes of, uh, you know, many of the people even I represent. It's not that they don't care about the contents of democracy. It's just that talking about democracy in that kind of esoteric way it doesn't mean something to them. But if you ask them, you know, what it means to them for their children to have a good education and have truthful information, to have their history taught in the schools, what it means to them to ensure that there can't be, um, you know, violence from the state, police violence without accountability. When you ask them whether they, um, you know, want to be able to vote and not stand in line for nine hours to have to cast their ballot. When you ask them, um, you know, whether they want to have access to, to good jobs. When you ask young people about climate uh, change and impending climate disaster, they are passionate about it. When you ask them about LGBTQ rights, they are passionate about it. That is all the content of democracy. So I think people do care about democracy. They just don't, they just don't respond to that, to that packaging of it. Um, and so the things that exhaust us, right? You know, economic justice, you know, access to schools, you know, access to quality education, being able to purchase a home, all of that stuff that exhausts us actually is part of the content of democracy. And so the way to give ourselves a bit of breathing room and a bit of rest space is to operate within an infrastructure, a democratic infrastructure that allows us to be able to work on the issues we care most passionately about and that matter most to us. Um, and, and I just don't think we have that luxury at this moment of being able to say, well, I just can't because I'm focused on gas prices. Gas prices has to do with a whole infrastructure that is part of our democracy as well, which is part of our uh, economic 
um, infrastructure. And there's a role for everyone to play, just to go back to what Mark said and to uh, get you off the hook a little bit here, Astia, from Mark's comments. I, I, it's not just journalism. It is the legal profession. I always start with my own profession, which has some work to do itself, the business community, the faith community. None of these communities should be agnostic or neutral about democracy. Democracy first, then the other things get to follow. So if you are a lawyer and you're agnostic about democracy in the United States, that is a problem. And our profession has to be more explicit about that reality. The same thing for business leaders, the same thing for the media. Every aspect of society has its part to do. Uh, and individual citizens have their part to do. We don't expect them. I don't expect um, people to think 24 seven about these issues. They can't and they shouldn't. Um, and that's part of why it's important to provide good information so people can understand, well, who do I listen to when I wanna know what's going on? They get the information. I need to register, that's the date, I can do it. And that's why initiatives like When We All Vote are so important. Get people good information, you know, do it quickly, do it in a, in a platform and in a way that they can understand it and absorb it easily. Make it easy for people to vote. Make sure that people can get to the polls, to have early voting, make sure that people can participate easily so that they can get on with their lives, which are filled with all kinds of issues that they have to address on a, on a daily basis. I'm usually not a fan of, of what gives you hope questions because I feel like as a journalist, <laughs> you know, like, you know, like, I don't really care. But, you know, I actually think that that's how we've been talking about a lot of bleak stuff, you know, the rise of conspiracy, the, the prospect of lack of voting rights legislation happening as well. And, and, and so I, I will end with both of that question to you all. What do you see on this front that actually uh, 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 think that you think is is a real motivating factor and does provide you a piece of hope? Well, I want to hear from Mark on this. First of all, I want to like, I want to bottle your last answer because the legal <laughs> profession has a lot to answer for. And the bar has been as irresponsible as any uh, set of organizations and corporate America. And I was not meaning to single out just the New York Times. Oh, I'm, I'm fine. I can deal with New York Times criticism. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm used what, to it. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> look, what gives me, what gives me hope is that Desmond Mead was able to convince more than 60% of Floridians to take a step towards enfranchisement and democracy. Like the fact is that when people are confronted with the unfairness and the indecency of, of taking away people's voting rights and restricting their ability to vote, people will do the right thing. But we need to be, we need organizations um, and that's why I'm so excited about what's happening today and why I, why Sherilyn has always been such a hero of mine, of people to constantly be pushing for that to happen. Because I think most people want to do the right thing and be decent. They don't want to look their neighbor in the eye and say, you shouldn't be allowed to participate. So that's what gives me hope. Really, Sherilyn, last word here. Yeah, really quickly. What gives me hope? Um, I believe that um, we have so much power. When I say we, I mean those who believe in democracy and justice and racial equality um, and gender equality and, and who believe that every person has the right to live a life of dignity. There are more of us um, than there are of those who don't believe that. And um, 2020 will stand out for me as an incredibly powerful moment. We were in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, that disproportionately was affecting the communities of people that I represent. But boy, did they stand on line for nine hours in Fulton County in that presidential primary. We still had the highest turnout of any election in the history of this country. And in Georgia, five million voters came out in November to cast a ballot in the November 2020 election. And 95% of those voters came back to vote in a special election in January, which if you've been doing election work as long as I have, you know, it's unheard of. Yeah. And that was in the middle of a pandemic. We didn't have a vaccine. We didn't have a vaccine. People were willing, knowing how deadly the disease was at that time, to risk their lives. And so that's why when people tell me that people maybe don't care about democracy, I, I push back because they, they showed that they were. Do you know what else they did? Millions came out in all 50 states at the height of the pandemic to protest after seeing the video of the torture and killing of George Floyd. Millions in all 50 states, the highest civil rights, the biggest civil rights protest this country has ever seen. 
at the time of the height of the pandemic. That shows us, and I think that scared a lot of people. I really do, because that showed the power of people who do believe in justice, who do believe in democracy, who are prepared to risk it to vote and participate. So I keep those pictures of lines at that primary election in April of 2020 in Milwaukee in my head, all those black people standing online with those masks on, those black people standing online for nine hours in Fulton County, in Harris County in the primary, uh, standing online and you know well after dark. Um, that's why I have hope. The people that I have been privileged to represent over my career always give me hope. It's the communities of people who show me always that um, they are a noble people, a noble people in this country, um, and, um, and that there are more of us than there are of people who are ignoble. Yeah, I think that's a great place to end. I was in Milwaukee uh, uh, for that time, and there was a scene I would not forget. The, 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 the level of commitment people had to wanting their voice heard was greater, as you said, than that real um, knowledge that uh, virus and really death was something that folks could be risking. Um, I want to thank my panelists for uh, a, a great panel, and thank you to when we all vote. We appreciate the time. Thank you. Hi, I'm Amanda Hollowell. I'm the Senior Director of National Organizing here at When We All Vote. There are so many ways that you can get engaged as a volunteer. Right now, you can join us for our Summer of Action. This summer, you can become a volunteer by being a chapter leader, joining our Vote Loud HBCU Squad Challenge, or just hosting a voter registration event in your community. It is important that we get our friends, families, and neighbors out to vote. And you are the trusted voice that can do this. Join us this summer and help us get people ready, excited, and energized to go vote. Help us in taking action to build our community power and to ensure that every single one of our neighbors, friends, and family members can make their voices heard this November. Your vote is your power, so you need to join us in this fight. Yo, what up, everybody? Welcome to the Culture of Democracy Summit. I am Jay Ellis, and I am proud to join When We All Vote in the fight to protect our right to vote and strengthen our democracy. You know, whether you're Lawrence Hive or not, your voices deserve to be heard in each and every election. A lot of us talk about presidential elections, but did you know that 99% of elected officials are at the state and local level? Uh, you didn't know that, did you? They make decisions that impact us every single day, from how our communities are policed and our schools are funded to the judges in our courts and our ability to vote. This year alone, more than 500 bills have been proposed by state lawmakers across the country that make it harder to vote and administer our elections because they know when we all vote, we show our power. Now, I saw firsthand growing up in South Carolina and Texas and Oklahoma and California, how it was the people, those we see at church and school and the grocery store uh, who created real change in our communities. Like, I hope we never take for granted what our ancestors, our grandparents, our parents fought for and what the next group of young people you'll see continue the fight for today. And if you don't believe in our power yet, and if you don't believe in our power yet, look no further than Georgia, where almost every eligible voter is registered and grassroots movements continue to grow. The next panel will show you how we work to protect our right to vote is done at the state level. The next panel the next panel will show you how the work to protect our right to vote is done at the state level. And to kick us off, I am happy to introduce Inse Ufut, CEO of New Georgia Project. Take it away, Inse. Hello, hello, peace, everyone. Uh, listen, <clears throat> on July 4th, this experiment in American democracy will be 246 years old. And upon taking a clear eyed view of its history, you'll notice that our country has oscillated between periods of expansion and restriction of the definition of citizen, of who can participate in our elections, of who can vote. 
Property restrictions were eliminated in the 1820s. It took another 100 years for white women to secure the right to vote in 1920. It would take another 45 years of organizing to pass the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that put federal muscle behind protecting voting rights for people of color. The 26th Amendment in 1971 lowered the voting age from 21 to 18. President Ford expanded voting rights to language minorities in 1975. And each and every one of those leaps forward for American democracy that organ ordinary Americans have organized for have been met with serious and significant backlash. In 2020, we saw historic levels of participation in our elections from every section of our uh, population. In my home state of Georgia, an unprecedented number of voters sent its first African American and a 33-year-old Jewish kid to the United States Senate. And that too was met with a swift and immediate backlash backlash when we saw the sad day uh, when we witnessed the January 6th insurrection. We've experienced big lies about our elections and unaccountable leaders fighting to suppress our votes. So many of our rights are also being attacked from the right to vote to the right to make, to make decisions about our bodies. We have people in office right now who don't believe in the very process that got them elected. It would be laughable if it wasn't such a serious matter. But despite the onslaught of assaults our democracy faces, it endures. Its wheels keep turning and it is because of us, our relentless organizers, our protest and our presence at the polls, because that is how democracy works. It feeds off of us. It requires TLC. It demands participation and it relies on our belief belief in ourselves and our power as a people and in the possibility of progress. So when you look to Georgia in awe, wondering how did that happen? Remember that it didn't just happen. We did it. We put in work. We're not afraid to get our hands dirty here, especially not when we're building a new America that works for all of us. And I do mean all of us, whether you're young, Black, Brown, Latino, Asian, Queer, if you've ever been left out of the political process, we welcome you with open arms into our organizing home. And that is how we build collective power. Um, since the New Georgia Project's founding, we've registered uh, over 600,000 voters and moved hundreds of thousands of people to the polls. And we do it the hard way by knocking on doors, calling people up, sending them texts, having real conversations with real people about things that matter. We meet voters where they are. We also do deep and relational organizing on the issues that our communities care about. We're constantly innovating, merging culture and creativity with purpose. With our youngest ever universe of voters, we've got to stay on our toes. And this year, we We've released a new voter education video game called This Is Not a Game, a nonpartisan ballot builder, uh, and an easy to use tool for voters to report issues at the polls. This is what the future of civic engagement looks like. And while I love to brag on how awesome the Peach State is, we are not unique in our potential in our efforts. And please understand that you all are now in for a treat. You are about to hear from some of the most dynamic civic leaders this country has ever known. These state leaders are constantly pushing and organizing and campaigning and memeing and protesting and lobbying and fighting for the progress that we know is possible. In North Carolina, in Georgia, and yes, in Texas, progress is possible. Change is within reach, and that's why we all have to keep at the business of this future building. It's up to us to create the future that we want our children to grow up in. Now is our time. I thank you all, uh, and I can't wait for our panel. Thanks so much, Ense, and thank you so much to When We All Vote for hosting this great panel that we're going to have right now. I am Ari Berman, senior reporter for Mother Jones, author of the book, Give Us the Ballot. And I am thrilled to moderate this panel on the state of our democracy, what's happening on the ground. Uh, last night in the January 6th hearings, we saw the incredibly high stakes for democracy at this moment in time. In 2020, we saw the highest turnout in 120 years, which you'd think people would have celebrated, uh, but instead it was followed by an unprecedented attempt to try to overturn the will of the voters. That was followed by an insurrection through other means with 19 states passing 34 new laws in 2021, restricting access to voting and a wave of election deniers running for office in 2022. 
So I am thrilled to talk to four of the best organizers on the ground about the fight for voting rights today to tell us what's really happening and the challenges and opportunities they see. Uh, so I am going to introduce them all one by one, and then we are going to uh, get into it. Uh, we have Tamika Atkins, who is executive director of Pro Georgia. Hi, Tamika. We have Brianna Brown, who is co-executive director of the Texas Organizing Project. Hi, Brianna. We have Juanika Fernandez, who is executive director of the Florida Civic Engagement Table. Hi, Juanika. And we have Judith LeBlanc, who is executive director of the Native Organizers Alliance. Hi, Judith. Thank you for joining us. Um, Tamika, we'll start with you, uh, keeping with the Georgia theme. Uh, talk to us about how some of the recently passed voter suppression laws, namely SB 202 in Georgia, is affecting the work that you're doing. Thanks, Ari. So after the record-breaking turnout in the 2020 presidential election, and then again in the U.S. Senate runoff in 2021, uh, Georgia immediately, uh, we faced backlash. Uh, two pieces of legislation were introduced. One is SB 202, introduced in 2021, and then a couple of months ago, we had HB 441. So SB 202 does a couple of things. One, it it reduced significantly the number of drop boxes across the state. It made it increasingly difficult for people to request and to vote by absentee ballot. It shortened the amount of time you can vote for early vote during elections. And I think the one piece that is most well known across the country is that it made it a crime for people to provide water and snacks to voters and to election volunteers and election administrators and poll workers, right? Georgia has some of the record like longest lines and we are no longer able to provide some comfort to encourage people to stay in line and engage in the act of voting. Most recently, HB 441, uh, it actually empowers the Georgia Bureau of Investigation uh, to be able to conduct its own investigation into alleged election fraud or election crimes. Now, on our end, we are concerned that the involvement of a federal agency is going to potentially intimidate voters from participating in the process. You know, between 202 and 441, these two bills have significant impact on voter trust and voter understanding um, of the election process. And we are now facing a new normal in our state. Thank you, Tamika. Brianna, I want to go to you next. Uh, there obviously was a lot of attention on the Texas voter suppression law passed last year. Uh, one of the things that I thought uh, was so interesting and disturbing about that law is it doesn't just have one provision making it harder to vote. It has about 20 different provisions that do that. So talk about uh, the impact of that law there and, and how you guys are fighting against it. Yeah, and it's interesting, you know, um, that slate of laws that was passed, their cousins to laws that were already on the books. Um, Texas, even prior to the 21, 2021 state legislature, already had some of the most restrictive voting rights laws on the books, from who could take advantage of mail-in ballots, to voter purges, to ex-offender participation, to massive closing of polling locations. Um, so that the laws that were passed in 2021 um, were standing on the shoulders of, of these laws that were already uh, on the books for, for decades. Um, we do our work across the state. We're a statewide organization. We are anchored in the counties that have the densest concentration of Black folks and Latinos in the state. Um, you know, our, our, our counties are the size of battleground states. Harris County, where Houston is, uh, was actually um, the target of a lot of those voter suppression laws that was that were passed in 2021. Uh, so uh, the uh, um, Harris County uh, County Commissioner's Court had passed a slate of uh, voter expansion efforts, uh, things like 24-hour uh, voting centers that allowed folks like students and third shift workers to participate at their convenience, drive through voting that helped tamper down um, concerns about COVID transmission. Um, they had passed all those things uh, and all of those things were a target of uh, the 2021 20, state legislature. Um, it's not surprising to us at all, having uh, been uh, living in this kind of uh, regime for you know, decades, 
Um, I think that it's interesting, though, you know, one of the, the, the jobs that we have as organizers uh, is to inspire participation and participation in particular folks that are not going to the polls. Um, and in Harris County, we were able to do that. Um, those innovations were passed by a progressive county commissioner's court that we had to fight for. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the advances of expanding the electorate there were quickly deleted in, in 2021. Uh, so, you know, one challenge that we have uh, is, you know, taking a ding to uh, our armor of being trusted messengers, right? So it's hard in one breath to say, yes, we got to... we. You gotta. We are. We are fighting for um, policies that that tangibly change our lives, right? Um, we win those policies, and those policies are taken away, you know, with swipes of pens. Uh, so now, uh, you know, one of the things that we know we have to do as organizers committed to to the fight uh, is to redouble bread and butter organizing efforts. Um, you know, we are inspired by the work of our sisters across the state, in particular Georgia. Uh, we believe Texas is the uh, is the next Georgia, um, and uh, it's really great to be on this panel uh, and to be sharing our playbook. Monica, I want to go to you next. Uh, talk about the law that Ron DeSantis signed as a Fox and Friends exclusive uh, and the impact that it's having in Florida. Wow. Okay. Well, first, before I jump into it and look at that, look at that introduction there, how you wrapped that up. Um, I want to say thank you uh, to having me and everyone that's involved in putting this summit together. I'd be remiss if I didn't say that. So thank you for having me. Extremely grateful to be here. Uh, like you said, I'm Monica, Executive Director of State Voices Florida. And how it's impacted us, we are a 501c3. We support a robust network of coalitions that are fighting for multiracial political power we're doing that by using data and civic participation and grassroots organizing. So you can imagine when we see these things that roll back uh, years and years of organizing and effort, how it's impacting uh, the people on the ground. Our table has almost 100 partners um, and we're covering a plethora of issues. And these voter suppression laws are just far reaching um, and impacting us in numerous ways. A lot of times our partners are laser focused on their work um, and at the table, we kind of provide the 30,000 foot view because they're siloed. Um, but we're working with these organizations to engage and continue to serve historically underrepresented and marginalized populations. Of course, that includes black people, indigenous people, other people of color, LGBTQ people, uh, low income individuals, women and youth. And so the big picture is that although this kind of feels like a punch in the gut, right? How it's affecting us here on the ground is these laws just shook us to the core initially. And after the reality hit of what was happening, I think that it lit a fire in organizations across the state. We immediately knew that we had to come together to first even understand what this 48 page law meant for us internally and how it was gonna impact uh, the community. We made partnerships with uh, our people like the ACLU and the Lawyers Committee, and they were extremely helpful in helping us just understand the impact of the process. And after that initial process, uh, it was time for us to roll up our sleeves and get to work, right? We're all familiar with that as organizers, especially grassroots organizers. We became even more laser focused on coordinating our efforts and highlighting the importance of long-term strategic planning. And internally, we just had to think about not only what it meant to us, but what it means to lay people who are not submerged in this work day to day. They probably don't even know what's happening or what these laws meant for them, because as someone stated earlier, democracy is often just thought of as an intangible process. And sometimes it doesn't often translate into spurring interest or action into voters that are most likely interested in things like paying the rent, health care for their families, jobs, etc. So we've had to get smarter about the ways that we make it uh, clear for voters that there is a power hungry faction that is focused on dragging our state backwards instead of delivering relief to our communities. We've had to connect those dots for voters struggling with housing and health care costs. And we've consistently had to combat what appears appears to be apathy by just reminding Florida that we have the power to overcome voter intimidation. And we've done that in the past often and we've won. And lastly, we're conscious that we want to make sure that we don't fall into the narrative that's being painted in Florida, right? We understand that these are voter suppression laws, but we want to continue to remind people that hope is not lost. 
that they can vote safely, that they have accessible elections. And we're just trying to pivot away from that language and focus on the fact that elections are free and they are fair. And we're just educating our people and focusing on the necessity that every vote must count. Judith, you don't just oversee one state, you oversee issues affecting an entire community. So can you talk about the issues that are affecting voter registration and voter turnout through the work that you're doing? So I'm, my name is Judith LeBlanc and I'm a citizen of the Caddo Nation. And I am the executive director of the Native Organizers Alliance, which is a national ecosystem or network of tribal, tribal entities, native community groups, and uh, traditional societies. And we work on an array of issues and at the center of our work is the struggle to protect and expand democracy and, pro and protecting the right to vote. You know, in the 19 states you mentioned that have already passed uh, laws to restrict voting, the majority of those states are states in which the native vote is politically significant. You know, the, it's often said that why count Native peoples when you, when you calculate uh, different uh, uh, surveys or you're calculating unemployment statistics? I mean, it's gone on forever. Uh, people say, well, Native people are numerically and statistically insignificant. But what we proved in the 2020 elections is that we're politically significant. That when, you, when you're in these 19 states, many of them have large uh, populations that live on our own self-governed land. And that the mobilization of the vote, the protection of the vote is a serious crisis on tribal, on tribal lands. Mainly because of the, the problem of distance and state after state keep uh, uh, making it illegal to help support uh, rural voters by being able to collect uh, ballots and to take them to the polling place or to be mailed. Now, what does that mean in Indian country? Well, that means that you have to have enough gas money to begin with to drive 100 miles to register to vote and, and then enough gas money to go and vote in a primary and then the general election. So distance is a huge factor and many of these states are specifically tagging Indians in that way. Because in South Dakota, for example, a court case I think was just a few weeks ago, uh, threw out a redistricting plan. And in South Dakota, the largest community of color, American Indian. And so the redistricting uh, plan that the state had created would have created one district where natives would be supermajority rather than two districts where we would be majorities. So it's, it's very simple, the issue of not only distance, but representations. And these laws, we're, we're fighting in different ways. For instance, one state, the state of North Dakota, passed a law that uh, restricted people from using IDs that, that, that did not have a street address. Well, natives have been voting for decades using post office boxes, because most reservations don't have street addresses. And when a, when a law like that is passed in a place like North Dakota, you're talking about restricting native political power and the ability of native people to actually speak out on policies. It's not simply the, might, the right to vote, but it's, it's also about affecting the 90% of elected officials who are on the local level. And we did a survey in 2020, um, over 80% of native voters vote on the basis of a platform or past voting record. 80% were a very educated electorate. And so the legislators in North Dakota, they understood who they were restricting. They understood who, they were putting into a difficult situation. But through tribal sovereign acts, we've been able to uh, work with tribes and ensure that tribes issue IDs with street addresses. Just like any city, a reservation can develop addresses. And that was a very complicated process, 
but we had we had to find a way to, to address it, but it's clearly an attack on native voting rights. Thank you, Judith. Uh, you all mentioned um, the impact of changing demographics, uh, but one of the things that's happening in, in, in a number of these states, the demographics are changing very quickly, but of course those demographics have to translate into actual political power. And Brianna, I want to address this question first to you. I think Texas has something like 3 million unregistered voters, which is larger than the population of more than half the states in the country. So I'm wondering when you think about the challenges you face to uh, voter registration and voter turnout, it seems like the first challenge you face is just getting people registered in the first place. Yes, I mean, I'm, I guess this is where you would insert the common refrain is everything is bigger in Texas. So there's always this like scale question when it comes to, you know, how we do our organizing, both uh, with uh, the electoral work that we do and with, you know, our bread and butter community organizing. It's interesting, you know, um, 700,000 of that 3 million that you mentioned are Black folks. Um, I think uh, the work that we do at top is very much about linking the face of Black and Latinos together. Uh, and uh, it's not always common knowledge that, you know, Texas is home to the largest Black population in the country. We have 3.9 million of us that call Texas home. Uh, we have the second most registered voters in the country, right behind our friends in Georgia at 1.8 million. And we have that other 700,000 Black folks that are eligible but not registered to vote. Um, some of that, some of the reason why we are not registered to vote uh, is connected to massive disinformation and misinformation campaigns uh, that um, keep folks who are ex-offenders from, from re-enfranchising themselves when they are eligible to be re-enfranchised. Um, you know, the F, part of the effort of the, the bills that were, were passed in uh, 2021, the, the voter suppression bills, um, was to criminalize the act of voting, uh, both uh, when you actually, if you could, you know, be fortunate enough to get a mail-in ballot, uh, or if you are trying to register to vote. Um, so I think the uh, the efforts to the efforts to to shrink the electorate um, have been very clear from um, our state leadership for for a very long time. Um, you know, we fundamentally believe that our democracy is healthiest when there is maximum participation, uh, and we've been committed to figuring out uh, through trial and error. Um, you know, how to scale uh, voter registration in particular and, and Black and Latino communities across Texas. Tamika, I want to go to you next. Um, there's been a lot of efforts to register voters in Georgia. I think they've been very successful. Um, but can you talk about the barriers that you're facing to registration and voting, either the barriers to registration or the barriers once we'll get registered to actually cast the ballot? So I think first I want to address the report that came out uh, that said that 95% of eligible Georgians were registered to vote in 2020. And, you know, that's a really significant stat. But I think to Brianna's point, that 5%, that 5% are our community members that are the hardest to reach. They are typically low income, under resourced and underrepresented communities. Uh, many of them are young. And many of them are folks who are formerly incarcerated, who have paid their, done their parole, paid their fines, and uh, served probation, but are unclear and unaware of the process for them to be able to be re-enfranchised and access their right to vote. So I think that that matters, right? Um, somehow this 95% number is also held up as there's no more work to do in Georgia. It's a very tricky thing. Voter registration is work that we must continue to do. Uh, first of all, one is that if your name has changed or if your address uh, has changed, you have to re-register to vote in Georgia. Uh, coupled with the fact that earlier this year, a discrepancy was found in our Department of Driver Services. So Georgia has, to the best of our ability, an automatic voter registration through our DDS. And that system was set, out, set up where you had to opt out of registering to vote, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a discrepancy was found that in 2021, again, I, not, I, you know, after we see record turnout in Georgia, that that was changed from opting out to opting in. And so if you did not check the box to opt in, you were not registered to vote. That was about 12 to 18 months of, of this switch in the system. And we saw a 40% drop and registered voters through the DDS, 
right? So now we're looking at voter confusion. Uh, folks are going to have to verify their voter registration because many people have now become accustomed to being registered to vote through the Department of Driver Services, right? When you combine this switch and opt out to opt in, it's been corrected as of March, but nevertheless, the impact is still there. Then you combine it with SB 202 and HB 441, right? That this, the, these moves are the foundation for voter suppression. Now in Georgia, I have the privilege to work with 49 community organizations across the state. And they have, they work on a, a variety of issues that matter to our shared community, but all of them agree that voter registration and voter turnout must be a part of any long-term plan to build sustainable power for our communities in Georgia. And what that means is that partners like Galeo, Georgia Association for Latino Elected Officials, the Georgia Coalition for the People's Agenda, Black Voters Matter, Women Watch Africa, right? That these are organizations that are trusted messengers in the community. And so when we continue to do voter registration and voter turnout efforts, as we continue to combat voter suppression, it takes local community members who have real relationships with the community on the ground. So when we look at um, the results of the impact of 2020 and we look at the impact of the pandemic and COVID-19, we've had to get innovative, right? So we've transitioned to a larger digital organizing platform. We have uh, very specific social media campaigns that are uh, attracting young people to vote. We run a billboard campaign, a voter education campaign across the state in 12 different languages, right? Again, we are all meeting our folks where they're at. And then just to circle back, when we look at the SB202 and HB441, right now, HB441, there aren't any legal challenges as of yet. HB441, right now, HB441, there aren't any legal challenges as of yet. But we are watching and waiting to see if there are any patterns of discrimination that allow some of our partners to present a challenge to HB 441. In the uh, respect to SB 202, there have been about nine different lawsuits and they've been combined um, in some pieces. But right now, we're all eagerly waiting to see what happens. Um, there may be a preliminary injunction on three pieces of SB 202, which means that some parts of the bill will not affect voting this fall. Um, so really, you know, there's the, the legal aspect of the work that we and our partners are doing, partners like the NAAC Legal Defense Fund, the ACLU of Georgia, and the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, but then it doesn't replace, it's in, it's, uh, in um, partnership with the grassroots organizing that's done every day, the relationship building, all led by trusted messengers on the ground. As we are coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are seeing an increase in the door knocking work that we do. Um, you know, our partners year round talk to over 3 million registered voters multiple times a year. So we are not just there to register people to vote in September. One is we are there in September, we're there in November and December, we're there in January, walk, talking to the same 3 million people and encouraging to come out to the legislative session. And then by the time we get to spring and summer, we are encouraging them to double check their registration status and to bring, uh, to support their friends and their family members and their community and registering to vote. That's called year round voter engagement. It's called integrated voter engagement because we have to look at voter registration as a part of building power for our communities. Thanks so much, Tamika. Uh, Juanika, I wanna ask you sort of two questions that relate to what um, Tamika was talking about, which is number one, the challenges that you're facing to registration and turnout, but also as Tamika started mentioning, some of the solutions that you've found to these problems as well. For sure. Um, I would I would say that we're starting to see a theme, right? These voter suppression bills uh, in Florida, it's SB 90. SB 90 is one of the biggest barriers we face to voter registration and voter turnout this year. Now, I won't bore you with the details of this 48 page law, but in short, uh, this law was passed by our governor of Florida and it imposes debilitating restrictions on vote by mail. It changes the rules for observers and it makes just voter registration more difficult overall in general. SB 90 makes it harder for voters to have access to secure ballot boxes, which further restricts uh, the hours of availability, which we already know is really difficult for many working uh, Floridians. 
Um, and the 2022 midterm elections are just the first set of elections since all of these changes have been made by SB 90. We haven't even seen the full extent of what these changes are going to mean uh, for Florida voters um, and election officials already tasked with implementing those strenuous uh, directives. In the midst of all of those things, as if that wasn't enough, um, our governor continues to add more fines, laws, and burdens on the voting process. It's irresponsible, it's reckless uh, to tack on further changes without considering the future challenges and consequences that lie ahead, um, but this has continued to happen. And then adding to those uncertainties, just laying out all of the challenges here and the barriers to voting, our maps have just now been finalized and our SOEs are still struggling to uh, complete their re-precincting process. And so for now, we're in a holding pattern. So what do we need? What are the answers to these? Well, Florida needs investments in election infrastructure, to be sure, to be certain. Um, and the table is providing that infrastructure or attempting to provide that infrastructure, but there's so much more work to be done. Florida needs increased voter education efforts. Uh, we need to increase access and transparency in the process um, and not continue to do these like logistical overhauls with have the, that have these considerable unintended consequences or some would say intended consequences for large and small counties. Um, and I would also note one big thing that's near and dear to my heart, that's another barrier is the third party voter registration. So there's been some changes to what it looks like and the fines associated with being third party voter registration uh, and those groups, many of whom are smaller, they're local based organizations um, and they're a significant part of our democracy. I think about groups like local boys and girls clubs. Um, raising a cap on these type of fines can lead to some chilling effects on these groups and outright just detour them from participating in civic engagement in general. Um, so some of the things that we're doing to combat that is just doing a lot more education, providing resources to these smaller groups and trying to make sure that we are educating them so that they don't feel like they don't want to participate in the process altogether. And I'll just wrap up this uh, question by saying I want to uh, quote uh, my sister Alexis Anderson Reed. She often says we must create a democracy in which everyone's vo voices are heard, where vo votes are counted and where needs are met. And the largest barrier that we seem to face right now in the state of Florida is that some people in our state are dead set against creating a democracy that reflects those sentiments. And it's our duty to push and pull until it's no longer just our vision, but the reality in the state of Florida and across the nation. Judith, you talked about some of the barriers that people face in uh, Indian country, the incredible distances people have to travel to vote, difficulties in returning ballots, uh, things like that. Uh, what solutions have you been able to come up with uh, to circumvent or, or in some ways mitigate some of those challenges to actually get people to the polls? Well, it, it's very much what Tamika described, and that is voting is critical to protecting and expanding democracy. But voting is not democracy in itself. On election day, we get a snapshot of political power. We get a snapshot of what the issues are that people are concerned about. It's a snapshot and it will change. And sometimes when there are outcomes that, that communities, people in communities don't agree with, there could be the idea of, well, voting doesn't matter. Real political power is what happens in between election days. And on, on election day, we are able to reflect the power of the grassroots and the voice of the grassroots if we're organized every day in between election days. That's one thing, that we've come to that conclusion. We are leading a training program to help people understand why voting is important, but why democracy must be protected and expanded. You know, last night I was, I was thinking about how democracy is not simply voting, it is also the narrative, the narrative. And I was watching the hearing last night and I was thinking, will the impact of this hearing motivate people to vote or feed cynicism? Since the, majority don't vote in this country. 
And in Indian country, what, what we're finding is that we have to have a blend of narrative, culture, and organizing techniques to engage people, to talk to people from the heart, to talk to people about how they have power. Most people don't recognize they have power. So voter organ, voting, voting rights and protection of the vote and organizing the moccasins on the ground who are in the communities that must be heard from, we are developing, helping them develop an understanding that you, you can't just rely on getting people in a car and having the right argument because if people responded to facts, no one would drive drunk. Am I right or wrong? What we need to do is to help people understand what's at stake, but also what is their role? What is their stake in it? And why for their family, for the community, they must step up and into that arena of voting and electoral struggle because it's a struggle. So everything we do election day to election day is where the real power is built because that's where the awareness comes. And whether or not these hearings will have an impact, what, I mean, the, what kind of impact? The jury is out. But the truth is that the essence of what was discussed there is about protecting a culture and apparatus and the people who are implementing the structures of democracy. Brianna, I want to go to you. Uh, how are you organizing given the restrictions in Texas. There is no more drive-through voting. There is no more 24-7 uh, voting. It's very difficult to vote by mail. There are no more drop boxes. I mean, I don't want to go on and on, but I think people get the idea. So what have you come up with in terms of solutions to the very restrictive process of voting in Texas? Well, I think it's you know really multi-pronged and some of it builds on what Judith was just describing. Um, so part of our theory of change at top is that we are working from cities and counties out to build to statewide power. Um, so thinking about these laws that were passed on the statewide level, what are the local opportunities to continue to protect the, in, the, in, the franchise? So before the voter suppression laws were passed uh, and signed into law, um, we organized with five district attorneys from the most populous counties in Texas, representing almost 10 million people, to send a letter to Governor Abbott stating their opposition to the bills that would threaten their constituents' uh, right to vote, particularly because of the criminal criminalizing of voting that was such a linchpin of these voter suppression laws that were passed. So in our state, having a collective counterpunch to the of electeds uh, to state leadership is really key. I think it helps us to win in the battle of ideas and to continue to inspire participation um, beyond talking about a candidate, right, about that larger question around um, participation in our democracy and what that means. So we'll continue to work that theory of change that mines for those local opportunities to help connect the dots uh, and, and build local power uh, in Black and Latino communities that build, hopefully, to statewide power. Uh, another component to the the fight around voter suppression laws that we're, we're continuing is to continue to call out companies. Uh, you know, Texas is home based to many Fortune 500 companies like AT&T, who made grand declarations following the uh, 2020 uprisings um, um, about Black Lives Mattering. Uh, and when it came to taking a stand on these voter suppression issues that deeply impact Black communities in particular, you know, there, mum was the word. Um, so in a lot of our organizing anyway, we are looking at the, the target behind the target. And when it, came, when it comes to this democracy reform work, we are continuing to, to, to call out companies and help people think um, with an imagination around that. Um, as I mentioned before, Texas has been ground zero for voter suppression for decades now, uh, and it's clear that we need to build with our communities a different vision about what's possible for our democracy. Um, so again, it's, I'm building on what Judith was saying just now. Um, we are building a Texas for all issue platform across the state that pulls on culture, that pulls on, on folks' imagination and stretching our imagination about what is possible. 
Uh, so much of hap what happens in Texas at the state level is antithetical to what is happening in our counties. Again, where the majority of communities of colors live in Texas and where just the majority of people live in Texas. So locally, we're electing candidates who reflect our values. Chief among them is that we know our worth and we believe that everyone is entitled to live with dignity. So progressive organizations across Texas, we're linking our struggles and our hopes to create a Texas for all platform that is big enough to hold the dreams of our ancestors and our children. Um, so the Texas for all platform uh, is an exciting uh, tool that we hope will inspire people to continue to participate, to continue to challenge and dare our democracy in Texas uh, to be better. And we see it as an antidote actually to, to voter suppression, that there is a larger vision, you know, that is possible. Um, and uh, we're doing that uh, through all the ways that we have, you know, we're emptying out the, the toolbox. Uh, you know, the goal of the work that we're doing in, in the 2022 midterms to inspire participation at the ballot box, whether we win or lose a race, uh, the real success will be like, have we gotten more people in the movement, right? Are more people down to uh, vote in a local election, come down to co county commissioner's court, court meeting, um, really opening up more and more avenues for, and more and more on ramps for participation in our democracy. Thanks, Brianna. One of the reasons why I think there was such high turnout in 2020 was there was so much attention on how to vote and the importance of voting. And I'm curious, I wanna ask this to all of you. Um, what is your plan to get voters to the polls in 2022? Do you see the same sort of enthusiasm for voting in 2022 compared to 2020? And then relatedly, this big question, the January 6th hearing is, does democracy still matter? Is it something that people still care about or are they preoccupied by all of these other issues, whether it's gas prices, inflation, et cetera? So um, Tamika, starting with you, uh, I just want you to talk about kind of what is the state of a, the electorate in Georgia right now as you head into 2022? You know, so I, you know, so let me back up. So 2020, I think folks look at 2020 in Georgia and they're like, what an anomaly. Um, when in reality, it was decades of organizing that led to that one moment. Uh, it was, you know, we have a, a tendency uh, to, to make democracy this kind of a drop-in thing in September. I can't overstate that enough because that has really been the general practice is you show up in September, um, tell folks to vote because their voice matters and then disappear. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> it took decades of year round being present, being in partnership with the community, uh, connecting the issues that matter to them to the act of voting and participating in our democracy. So it, that's what led to that that swell of 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 outreach and outrage in 2020, uh, coupled with you know the murder of George Floyd. Um, the murder of Breonna Taylor and other injustices that happened that year. Now, when we look at 2022, you know, we are seeing that the enthusiasm is still there. But I, I always, I, you know, when I'm on, when I'm talking to friends and community, I'm not like, you know, you should vote because democracy, right? That, like that, you know, democracy matters. Democracy reform is critical work. We all know that. But when I'm talking to folks, when we are having real conversations, when our partners are having real conversations with their communities, they're like, you, we want you to vote because we know health care is important to you, right? We know that having a job with wages that can, you can sustain you and your family matter to you. We know that we are in a housing crisis, right? And you are impacted by this housing, and cri housing crisis. It's the issues that matter that get folks out to vote. Pro-Georgia is a part of the State Voices Network, and we have a, a larger theory of change along with uh, uh, the Florida Table and Juanica, uh, the amazing Juanica. But we talk about access, engagement, and representation. We work to make sure that our folks, that, um, that all people can access uh, our democracy and they can access our ballot. We then work to make sure that they are engaged in the process of voting on the issues that matter to them the most. And then we work to make sure through representation that their votes are not diluted through packing, uh, cracking, redistricting, and gerrymandering. You know, when we look to 2022, we have uh, our priority is really to focus on down ballot voting, right? We know that we are going to get a lot of attention. There's a lot of significance for our gubernatorial race 
in Georgia. I think that that's just a well-known fact. And similarly to 2021 and the U.S. Senate uh, runoff race, folks in Georgia care about the public service commissioner race. We have some of the highest utility rates in the country. Um, people have liens, particularly older people and uh, uh, older folks of color have liens against their homes because of astronomical power bills, right? So that means the public service commissioner, it means the lieutenant governor, the secretary of state. There are other statewide races uh, that really impact our community. And we're looking to 2022 to encourage and support our folks in voting down ballot and providing them with the voter education that they need to be able to um, knowledgeably and confidently uh, participate in our democracy. We only have a few minutes left, but I just want to give the other panelists a chance to answer this question too. Judith, I'll start with you. The plan to get voters to the polls in 2022. Well, I, I, I think the same magic gumbo um, is as, as was in 2020 will be operative in 2022. Um, that, that there are issues that are on the ballot. There are issues that people are concerned about and that there is a clear and present danger of being stripped of the right to lift our voices up. And I just wanna say that you have to understand that for native communities on the front of our brain is the issue of sovereignty, our right to govern, to co-govern public lands, to control the fate and outcome and be stewards of land and water. And the truth is this, we are never going to uh, achieve our treaty rights, which is constitutionally guaranteed to be in co-governance and to govern our own lands unless we have a deeply democratic political system and a deeply democratic economic system. It's not sovereignty isn't going to be achieved tribe by tribe. It's about playing our role in this huge grassroots majority movement of people who are exercising our voices every day and especially on election day. And I think that that's the motivation that uh, many of our people, or tribal leaders and our community organizers, they realize that if we don't have a choice of, uh, of who's gonna be on the other side of the table when we're negotiating with the federal government around pipelines or the right to healthcare, if we don't take that opportunity, shame on us. Juanica? I was on mute. I need to have a shirt that says I'm on mute. Okay, so I would say I want to echo all of the things that my colleagues have said. It is so wonderful to be amongst like-minded individuals. And so I'm going to echo that. And then on top of that, I'm going to say that our role, as I see it, to get people out to the polls uh, is to make sure that we're disseminating um, information that they can uh, identify from trusted sources. I say that because we're living in a time where whoever says something over and over and says it the loudest must be right. Um, and that's gonna take us a lot of work to undo. And so making sure that we're in alignment, we have over a hundred partners at the table, that we're disseminating our messages over and over to ensure that the people in our communities know how they've been affected by the changing of the drop boxes and the different precinct locations is going to be essential to turning people out to vote. Facilitating those like-minded, um, those conversations between like-minded organizations, we're going to have to continue to do that so we're not uh, wasting resources and making sure that we're all on the same page. And then also to just let people know, I like to remind people of this whenever they feel like down if their person didn't win, right, that we are winning. All of these attacks on democracy are happening because we, the people, especially in the state of Florida, have made some amazing strides um, mm -hmm. over the past 10 to 15 years. You mentioned it earlier that despite the referenda threshold of 60%, uh, our friends at FRRC were able to restore the rights of citizens. We were able to increase the minimum wage. We passed medical marijuana. Um, and we also saw the passage of fair districts. So the power is in the people. And when we all come together, we want to remind them what a win looks like. And I would like to just give you a couple of numbers of what we think a win looks like um, to, to end all of this. Um, last year in 2020, we saw an eight point increase in turnout for AAPI. 
uh, two points for Black, three points for Hispanic, four points for white. But the astounding thing is Black youth ages 18 to 24 had an 8% increase in turnout and Hispanic youth had an 11% increase. That is something to celebrate. And that's something that when you can tell like, hey, our turnout is working. These are all things that should be celebrated, a higher turnout. We have to keep our eye on a prize. We have to continue to highlight our wins and push people to vote like they've never voted before because it's working and we won't be deterred. We won't be distracted. And we're going to continue to push Florida because Florida knows how to turn out voters. We need to continue to do that, not throw out the baby with the bathwater and just make sure that we're educating our people to put in place the people who are going to fight for their values um, and fighting for the soul of Floridians. Brianna, uh, really quickly, you're planning to get people to the polls in 2022. Yeah, well, I'm just going to co-sign what folks have said. Uh, issue, issue, issues, right? Um, last year in the San Antonio uh, municipal elections, um, we uh, had a, a, um, a referendum around police accountability that got more votes than the mayor's race got. Um, we People were motivated to go to the polls and vote on the issues. And I think that that is the thing that will get someone out of bed uh, to vote on a rainy Tuesday. Um, here in Texas, you know, we're, we lead the nation and folks are uninsured. If there's an idea that the governor could sign a piece of legislation, executive order that expands, you know, Medicaid and our access to health care, uh, that that's a more motivating um, message, a more motivating factor than, you know, voting for, you know, just a candidate. So I will co-sign, you know, uh, Tamika said around issues. I think we're starting early. We know that um, in order to combat some of the misinformation and disinformation campaigns around what the impact the voter suppression laws have been. We got to make sure that people have good information and that information becomes like fingertip. Uh, and, you know, that coordination piece, um, you know, in building this Texas for all this big vision, we got to be on the same page and um, maximize resources. Uh, and so, uh, in, in, in such a big state. Uh, so, drilling down on issues, making sure we're starting early and making sure we're in deep coordination with, with, with partners on the ground. And then lastly, everyone just go around and quickly tell everyone where they can find out more about you and your organization. You can find out more about ProGeorgia uh, and our public efforts at GoVoteGA.org. So www.GoVoteGA.org. Awesome. You can find out more about State Voices Florida and our amazing partners by going to StateVoicesFL.org. Um, and check us out there. You can find out about the work that we're doing at the Texas Organizing Project at www.organizetexas.org. It's such an honor for Native Organizers Alliance to be on this panel with all of you all amazing organizers. So if you want to find out more about what we're doing, nativeorganizing.org. And you can find me at, at Ari Berman on Twitter and at motherjones.com. And I want to thank when we all vote again for hosting us for this fabulous panel uh, and doing this amazing democracy summit. I see my friend Maria Teresa down there. So I'm assuming she is now going to uh, take it away. So Ari, it's such a pleasure to see you. It's so, such a pleasure to see so many partners. And I think the conversation you are having is spot on. The purpose of all of this is to make sure that we're getting ready, that we are absolutely energized. I want to thank, as I get started with, uh, first of all, for Michelle Obama for having the foresight of recognizing the importance of participation and having a conversation now, because what we have is a runway. I want to take a moment to also recognize that our communities have been through an incredible struggle that have put a lot of weight on many of us individually as leaders, as organizers, as part of larger communities, where we feel and we have been very much at the center of a lot of this disagreement on who should be participating in democracy. But then I also want to remind every single one of you, something that I have to remind myself, that we may be tired, we may be disappointed, we may feel that democracy is frail, but what happened in 2018 was that we mobilized, organized, ran for office, registered, and voted. We had, as a result, the most participation in a midterm election in 100 years. And the impact of that 
We had the most representative government in our 240 years of the United States. We had the most Native Americans. We had the most Muslim, the most LGBTQ, the most women. We had the most, including veterans. And we also had some of the youngest members of Congress. And what they produced in those two years in Congress was 400 pieces of legislation on how a collective America wants to govern. But we didn't stop there. 2018, I often say, it was a dress rehearsal. In 2020, we dusted ourselves off and a multicultural America with every single part of our movement came together and sent a very clear call to action of how we want and envision the 21st century of American leadership. By registering, organizing, voting, knocking on doors, doing the hard work, and putting our bodies physically in danger by standing in line and voting during a pandemic to send a clear message that yes, our health may be at risk, but our democracy was worth fighting for because we were not talking just about that moment, but about the future of this country. I serve as the a co-founder of Voto Latino. It's an organization that I helped found over 18 years ago. And the reason we helped found it was because I was growing up in Northern California under Pete Wilson, the original show me your papers law governor who decided that the way he was going to create political expediency was on the backs of Latino communities and Asian communities. I remember coming home from college, angry and upset and encouraging my aunts and my uncle and my grandmother to become US citizens. And just like I was having that conversation, millions of young Latinos and Asian Americans were having that same conversation. And sometimes when people ask me, well, you know, what happens to the Latino vote? I say, we gave you California, you're welcome. And then Voto Latino sparked the idea of, we knew that there was going to be a rising Latino community in Arizona, in Georgia, in Texas, in Nevada, in Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania, North Carolina. I'll get to Florida later. And we started helping, working closely with grassroots organizing to help build the political power of young people. You heard a speaker earlier say that the Latino youth vote increased by 11%. It increased by 11% because of the commitment of the people that are watching this and tuning in, recognizing the agency of young Latinos, of young African-Americans, of Native Americans, of young Asians, who definitely understand that our country is at a cross point. And I encourage all of you to continue to have these conversations with your loved ones. When they say that voting doesn't matter, I like to show examples of what we did in 2018 and the hardest part in 2022 what, sorry, in 2020, which was dislodge the potential fastest from office. And our work isn't done because they see the power of the youth vote, a multicultural America, where we're expecting 6 million more young people to turn 18 since the 2020 election for the midterms. And that is why they're trying to create obstructionist voter, registra uh, voter registration and voter voting booth laws because they recognize our power when young people in a multicultural America comes together. But that does not mean that we put our heads down. Our families, our communities, each other, we need to make sure that a multicultural America is successful because we are living and breathing an experiment that was conceived 240 years ago by people did not realizing that a multicultural America was going to be the solution to our nation's ills. And so as you continue down this path, I wanna thank you for your commitment. I wanna thank you for being there for, with each other. And more importantly, I wanna thank you for recognizing our possibility as a country when we all come together. I encourage you to join votolatino.org, but there's something else that Voto Latino created and it's called VoterPal. You can find it on your Android store. You can go ahead and find it on your uh, Apple store. And it's an app that decentralizes voter registration and it allows you to register your friends and family. So I encourage you to take your ownership and agency of the power of mobilizing our community at the very local level. But do join us. We believe deeply that when we register voters, we change states and results. At Voto Latino, in the last election alone, we registered over 650,000 people. 55% of them were young people. 58% of them were young voters. But the most importantly, 79% of the people we registered went out and voted. 
And that doesn't include the 3.7 million people we mobilized in Georgia, in Florida, in Texas, in North Carolina, in Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania, in Arizona, and Nevada. And what we did was that we worked together to give people a different vision of America. And when we participate, we know that we have a very different understanding of what our country should be. I don't have to convince you that climate change is real. I just have to convince you to vote for the leadership to ensure that we have a safe and secure planet. I want to thank again uh, Michelle Obama so much for putting us together. My hope is that next time we're in community, we are celebrating big wins. Thank you. And now I want to actually introduce some friends. They are going to be talking about reproductive choice and the importance of what is on the ballot because we need to be motivated, but we also need to recognize that the stakes could not be higher. There is no question that if we sit it out, we're talking about a group of individuals that want to take us back, back to the 1960s, because that's what they're litigating, a woman's right to choose, who has access to the voting booth, who has access to fair education. So with that, I, I, you know, I welcome the reproductive conversation right now that's about to happen. Thank you so much for those words, Maria. Um, I'm so excited to be the moderator for today's panel on the state of reproductive rights. Thank you so much for tuning in. And thank you, Mrs. Obama, for bringing us all together. I am Jada Gomez. I am the executive editor at Pop Sugar. I'll be leading this combo alongside Christina Solis, who is the political director of Color Colorado, and Minnie Timaraju, who is the president of NARAL, N-A-R-A-L, Pro-Choice America. And just to set the table a bit, um, this year, reproductive rights and justice are under attack in this country. And sometime in June, we expect a decision on Dobbs versus Jackson, the case in the Supreme Court deciding on the constitutionality of the Mississippi 15-week abortion ban. And in a leaked opinion that we saw last month, it looks like the Supreme Court will overturn Roe v. Wade with their opinion and thus make abortion illegal or severely restricted in 13 states, with many other states likely to follow. So our panel today will discuss how people can take action in states and cities and in the national conversation that is so imperative to our rights. So to kick it off, I um, wanted to ask a simple question, and I'll kick this to Christina. How did we get here? Yeah, thank you so much. And I feel honored to be on this panel. Um, I will try to keep it short and brief and not go into a full blown history lesson. Um, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. And Minnie and Jade, please feel free to jump in if I miss anything. But access to abortion really varied pre Roe v. Wade here in the US. Your ability to access abortion depended on which state you lived in and, as we know, what race you were a part of. So we know that white folks pre-Roe were able to access abortion, um, while black and brown folks often faced more barriers and had those more dangerous and unsafe abortions. When Roe was decided in 1973, um, it ruled that the uh, 14th Amendment granted the right to privacy, which protects the right to have an abortion, and it legalized abortion across the country up until viability. And ever since then, we know our opponents have been really working hard to roll back those protections, and they've been tricky with trap laws, um, so like the targeted regulations of abortion provider laws, uh, putting in additional barriers that may not seem like a direct uh, attack on abortion care, but really are. And they've been playing the long game with their eyes on the Supreme Court, particularly. So we know that our previous president um, was able to nominate three justices to the Supreme Court, um, more conservative justices, more opponents of abortion care um, in his term, which really set the stage for them to be able to take on this Dobbs case last year and gave them the opportunity to effectively overturn Roe v. Wade um, this coming month, whenever that decision comes out. So I think I'll leave it at there, but did I miss anything, Minnie? No, the only thing I would add, because since you mentioned trap laws, is, you know, Planned Parenthood v. Casey, and, you know, there have been several Supreme Court cases uh, that have, and there's been, I think, 50 years since Roe, 49 years of aggressive efforts at every level to restrict abortion access, right? So we didn't get here by accident. 
Um, I, there's a long arc of how we got here, uh, and we've seen like a aggressive whittling away at our rights. And for a lot of women of color, as you just pointed out, Christina, they don't have access even now uh, because of the extent of these restrictions. So um, to piggyback off that, Minnie, what was going through your mind when the news of the draft opinion um, kind of came through um, that there might be a possibility that Roe versus Wade might be overturned? There was an outcry on social media. Yeah. Everyone's talking about it. Um, as you're in, like you're in the field, um, what was going through your mind? You know, we've been planning for this for a very long time. You know, uh, you know, as my colleague Christina just mentioned, you know, we've been tracking this forever. We knew I worked on Secretary Clinton's presidential 2016. We knew the day she lost that Donald Trump would that we were going to start having to plan for scenarios like the one we're in right now. So it's been a long time coming. We knew if we lost control of the White House, uh, this was the clear next step. Um, I think once uh, Amy Coney Barrett was confirmed, that was sort of the final, like, oh my gosh, we have to start getting ready. Um, but look, once the Supreme Court granted, um, once they took on the case of Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health uh, Organization, it was pretty clear based, I mean, Christina just laid it out, that we didn't have the numbers on the court. So I guess what I'm trying to say is intellectually, all of us who do this work knew this was coming. Um, the leak was a bit of a shock. It was unprecedented. So the leak was jarring. And I think we all suspected that while Roe was going to be significantly gutted, if not overtly overturned, um, the court would try to moderate itself. And that's important for us to flag because they still will likely try to moderate their language and tone. Um, the Justice Alito opinion was fascinating because it was so clear. It was so aggressively anti-Roe. Um, that in many ways, you know, if you'd if we'd had this panel a month ago, I would have said our biggest challenge is going to be Roe is going to be overturned, but the American people don't believe it, and we have a believability gap, and we have a lot of public education to do on what's about to happen. So the Alito opinion kind of did the job for us, and that it woke a sweeping a sleeping giant of Americans up. Personally, no matter how intellectually you prepared you are for something, it hits you differently personally, and as a woman of color who came up in the movement in Texas, and I'm actually in Texas in my parents' house right now, um, it was deeply, deeply gutting and emotionally distressing because I could immediately think of dozens of women in my family, in my life, um, in my world who were going to immediately, who had already lost a fundamental right when the court didn't intervene in SB8 in Texas um, and were under direct threat. So it's complicated for those of us even in the movement, maybe more so, but um, it does present a unique opportunity to really, like I said, wake up a lot of Americans to the looming threat. I think that's a really great point of just waking up and realizing that, like you said a month ago, the fact is that most Americans would have ne never even thought that Roe v. Wade being overturned would be a thing. Um, and to follow me over to Christina, what would will that decision um, overturn, if over, um, Roe is overturned, what would that mean um, in the lives of Americans every day? Yeah, um, I mean, speaking mainly to like my community, the Latino community, 5.7 million Hispanics across this country are gonna lose access to abortion care when the second that Roe is overturned. And that means that we lose our ability to make decisions about our health care, about things that impact our lives. We lose that. It's gone for us. Um, it means that we may go back to unsafe procedures. Uh, and it means that we're really in danger, I think. Or I know, but I don't think. Minnie, would you like to, to uh, add something to that as well? No, I think, well, I'll add to it, but I think Christina's point can't be understated. You know, I'm from an immigrant community as well, the AAPI community, where we've already seen um, a lot of criminalization uh, in, the, in immigrant communities overall. 
And that's the other frontier that's a little different than pre row I was just on a call with older activists asking how this moment is different than pre-1973. And one of the big ones is criminalization of women of color and immigrant women, like we just saw in Texas with Lizelle Hernandez, her Herrera's case. You know, and we saw this famous case in Indiana, um, you know, um, Purvi Patel, Indian American, uh, where her where her um her stillbirth was criminalized. So what we have to, what that means I, for the average listener who may not be tracking all of this is with all of these restrictions and bans in place, and they won't be, we won't be protected by Roe anymore. We won't have constitutional protection. How are all these jurisdictions going to enforce them? What does that lead to? It leads to law enforcement, you know, in various entities across these states, uh, misinterpreting the law, prosecuting women for miscarriages and pregnant people, you know, denying coverage of care or access to um, life-saving medication and treatment because of a misunderstanding of what miscarriages versus abortion, um, confusion around over-the-counter, like confusion around Plan B versus a medication abortion. We're already seeing it in Texas, where effectively Roe doesn't exist. Um, thanks to what happened with SB8. And it's going to get harder and harder, particularly for communities of color, particularly for immigrant women, where we have another challenge, which is rampant disinformation, well-funded by the opposition, targeted immigrant limited English proficient communities. Um, so it's really just the perfect storm for more targeting of communities of color um, for something that should be a basic fundamental healthcare right. And so, um, Minnie, this one will be for you as well. Um, in 2021, we saw an unprecedented number of bills passed to restrict abortion access. What stories are we hearing from providers in those states about what the reality is looking like there? Yeah, you know, it's terrifying. I've been talking to my friends here in Texas. You know, uh, first of all, we're seeing from providers uh, a lot of challenges scrambled to get patients from point A to point B. So for example, in Texas, we have a six week ban. You know, so a lot of patients getting turned away, being told you can't, you know, get your services here anymore, but we're gonna try to help you maybe find your services in another state. And what does that look like? Even if they have the access to resources to find a provider that can then counsel them to find an abortion fund, they then have to navigate things like childcare because most people seeking an abortion already have children. They have to navigate being away from work for multiple days at a time in, you know, to go out of state, uh, that state might have a waiting period. They may have trap laws in the books that are not really designed for medical necessity, but to disincentivize abortion care. So they might have to jump through those hurdles as well. Um, let's say she gets there to that other state and has jumped all those hurdles. She might have to go back home and wait and then come back for the final procedure, depending on what procedure um, and what where she is in her, um, her pregnancy. So we have providers who are really stuck, like their job is to do total reproductive comprehensive care for their patients. They are limited already by a lot of, by state and local restrictions. And even in states where we don't already have bans in place, we have provider, we have insurance companies, we have um, big hospital systems um, already warning patient providers to be cautious and to ph in pharmacies about filling certain prescriptions because of this criminalization and this, this pending looming threat of Roe being gutted, we're already seeing a significant chilling effect on mainstream providers and a ton of burden on abortion specific providers who are now in the position, if you're in a state where there isn't a ban, like a Texas or a California, you are now, or my home where I live currently in Pennsylvania, we're already seeing patients coming from all over the country and the burden that's placing on the infrastructure of abortion care in states that don't have bans is also really consequential. And in some cases we anticipate being crippling. So um, it's dangerous for all of us, no matter what state you're in, no matter whether you think you're gonna have a ban or not, providers are really, they're the front line and they're really having a hard time. That's a really great point that we're already in red alert um, in a red alert mode. Absolutely. So Christina, Colorado recently passed the Reproductive Health Care Equity Act, a law that affirms a pregnant person's right, yes, um, to have an abortion in the state. How can other states work to protect and expand abortion access in their own legislature? Yes, uh, um, the Reproductive Health Equity Act, or REA, was incredible, and we're so proud of the work that we did. We were able to lead with our 
partners at Cobalt, um, which is an abortion fund here in the state, to pass this legislative session. Um, a little bit of context for folks who may not know about this bill, but Rhea modernized Colorado statute to protect reproductive rights as fundamental rights here in the state. We know that having access to the full spectrum of reproductive health care, including contraception and abortion, helps ensure that people can control their own bodies, lives, and their future. So our bill, now law signed in April, established three things that Every individual has the fundamental right to choose or refuse contraceptives. Um, every individual who becomes pregnant has fundamental rights to choose to continue a pregnancy, to give birth, or to have an abortion. And a fertilized egg, embryo, or fetus does not have independent rights under the state of law. So it was historic for our state. It defined abortion for the first time here in Colorado's history. And it's the first time that we've used gender neutral language in a bill of law. We were really intentional about moving away from women um, and using pregnant people, people who can have abortions and things like that. And we know this is a step one to protecting abortion and removing additional barriers um, to abortion care. 22 states right now have laws that could uh, be used to restrict the legal status of abortion, whether that's through a trigger law or a law that was on the books pre-Roe um, that would ban abortion, or nine states have unconstitutional post-Roe restrictions that Minnie was talking about too. Um, they're currently blocked by courts, but would come back into effect with a court order in Roe's absence. So I think there are a variety of ways that folks can really support and enact policies that protect abortion rights and access, um, whether that's through voters themselves using the voter initiative that initiated, I always get that wrong, word wrong, ballot initiatives, um, like looking at Michigan, what they are doing, uh, or the legislative process like we used here in Colorado. Um, every state really has the power to enact laws and policies that will protect their residents, as well as the folks who are traveling to those states to access abortion care. We know that since Texas abortion ban late last year, um, or maybe not so late last year either, we Colorado has seen an influx of patients. So we wanna be sure that we're protecting all of the folks who are coming to our state to access care. We also know, like I had mentioned before, that legality is really just the tip of the iceberg here. Um, states can be working to remove barriers to care and pass these progressive, and pass additional progressive policies Things like raising the minimum wage, making health care affordable and free, universal child care, safe, affordable housing, things that can really help a person and encompass the whole person um, when they're thinking, when they're trying to determine whether they want to start a family and all the different circumstances that really impact our abilities um, to live those safe, healthy, self-determined lives ourselves. So I think there's a variety of ways, different like tactics that we can really be utilizing across states to make sure that we're not just protecting access to abortion, but really expanding to encompass the whole situation that a person experiences when they're thinking about care. It's incredible. And uh, Christina, you offered so many ways that um, folks can get involved um, and keep this going. Um, but I also wanted to lob that over to many um, for people maybe who are watching us today who really want to get involved in their local communities to support abortion access for those people who need it most. And they're just literally starting out. What would um, how can they how can they help with the efforts? So I think the ballot initiative piece is huge. Uh, you know, in addition to Michigan, we're going to have uh, a defensive fight in Kansas uh, for their ballot initiative where they, there's actually constitutional protection for abortion already uh, in the Kansas Constitution and extremists are trying to remove it. So there's a time and then in California just announced a ballot initiative like Michigan to uh, enshrine abortion access and constitutions. These are so important because uh, it's really important to understand that um, if Republicans gain control of the Senate and the House next year, um, there is already talk of a national abortion ban, a federal national abortion ban. So the time to get engaged in your community is now. Uh, if you aren't already, and I feel like everyone listening to us today probably is, so I'll say the next step is getting your friends and family educated, informed, and involved about the threat to abortion access, but also the larger threat to democracy that's interconnected. You know, we just had that great discussion on voting rights. These are interconnected fights, right? You know, when I took over this role at NARAL, 
um, just about seven months ago, uh, one of the first questions I kept getting was, you know, if we're the, you know, I, I was reviewing all the polling, you know, all of our talking points, eight out of 10 Americans support a safe, you know, legal right to abortion. So if eight out of 10 Americans do this, support this, why aren't we winning? Um, and it's honestly a bigger fight around voting rights, democracy, access to the ballot box, gerrymandering, you know, all the things you're talking about on this important, you know, day of events are interconnected with why we haven't been able to score big legislative victories and wins around abortion, even though abortion is a very, very popular, incredibly safe procedure. So getting educated, getting involved in your local organizations, and then in the wake of what we expect a late June decision, that's when we think the Supreme Court is likely um, going to rule, although this is a terribly unpredictable court, so we should be ready for it to happen at any time. Um, look up your local abortion fund or go to the National Network of Abortion Funds website um, and Google them. They're easy to find and help find your local abortion fund and support them because these are the folks on the front line who are going to be connecting patients from point A to point B, getting them the resources, the education, the infrastructure to get access to abortion care. Um, that's going to be critically important. And then if you're not already engaged in local abortion advocacy organizations that are talking to their legislators, talking to their governors and AGs, um, talking to their federal officials about legislative fixes for these problems. These fights are going straight back into the states where they've always been, to be clear. Um, we really encourage you to do that as well. And you can do it through our orgs or find other orgs in your, there's so many of us. Um, I will say it's going to be a massive problem in 28 states are poised to ban abortion. So we need an abundance of solutions and partners. Um, and there's a lot of us, uh, but not enough volunteers and not enough activists. So we definitely have plenty of work for everybody to do. Yes, mission critical for volunteers and people getting involved for sure. Um, so this question, Minnie or Christina, feel free to jump in. Um, Minnie, you really struck me in the beginning when you had mentioned that folks are, you know, not always aware of some of the rights that we have that are at risk. Um, and so I wanted to follow up with that. What are other types of legislation that Americans should really look out for as we continue to see um, these restrictions bubbling up? What else should we be um, having our eyes out and ears out for? You know, you don't have to look very far, you know, if you, you know, in the wake of the leak, there were a lot of uh, really interesting uh, interviews of extremist Republican elected officials. I'll talk about the Mississippi governor. He was on the record talking about um, how there's nothing really off the table for them. They're looking at contraception, contraceptive access as an area. Uh, you know, if Roe falls uh, in the Alito opinion themselves, they indicated the, the, the under, the under, girding privacy, right to privacy that Christina talked about, the reason, the, you know, what Roe stands on. Once that's eroded and Roe falling will erode it, we've got to be on the lookout aggressively for restrictions on, again, contraceptive access, um, a right that is also predicated on privacy. You know, gay marriage is an issue that folks should be very concerned about. Civil rights issues for the entire LGBTQ plus community overall. Even in the most extreme cases, we've seen discussion around interracial marriage. I mean, it's hard to believe, but at this point, we shouldn't be surprised by anything. And again, it's all connected, I think, fundamentally to attacks on democracy. So the more, and this is important, I think as we see fundamental freedoms fall, a freedom that we've had for 50 years, almost 50 years, that Americans could not believe would be rolled back rolling back, it really emboldens our opposition in a way that is terrifying. And we need to be aggressively fighting back for our rights in a way that makes it very clear we will not go back and we will not let any other civil rights that Americans enjoy currently be eroded. Um, and there's an opportunity, you know, abortion has never been more popular or more motivating of an issue for the American people. I'll leave it at that. So there's an opportunity in this moment of outrage, and there will be outrage when the Alito opinion leaked. There were 450 rallies across the country, millions of people mobilized, and that's just on the official count. I mean, there were weeks and weeks of spontaneous organizing and protests. Um, all of the abortion rights organizations saw unprecedented fundraising and you know engagement numbers. Uh, this is going to awake, this is awakening, this is awakening, sorry, a sleeping giant of, 
of Americans, not just women, but men too, uh, because everybody understands that this is the canary in the coal mine of the first big fundamental constitutional protected right being rolled back in modern history. I think the last time this happened to a significant population of Americans was Reconstruction. Think about that. And are we going to let a fundamental freedom like this roll back on our watch? So I think, um, I don't know if I even answered your question directly, but yes, there's, a lot, we did. There's, a, there's an opportunity, but if, but there's also, a, there's also a threat, right? If we don't push back hard and make our voices heard, um, there's a lot more to come that we should be very, very worried about. Spot on for sure. Um, and before we close, I, I really wanted to ask a bit um, more just on a personal note. I mean, this work is, is hard um, that you've both uh, devoted your lives to and your careers to. Um, what keeps you going while you're doing this work? And what would you say to someone who just feels like the situation is so hopeless and there's just no hope right now? Um, that's a twofer. Uh, so, but I think it's just really important to kind of peel back that layer and just uh, have that combo on a human level. Just like how, how are you, how are you uh, staying um, healthy and motivated and, and mentally and all of those things? Um, Christina, we can start with you. Yeah, it's such a good question. And um, going back to Minnie's point, I think at the beginning of this conversation, like it affects you in different levels, right? Like the professional part of me knew this was a reality since 2016. We knew it was going, it was coming, didn't know when, but knew it was going to happen. And I'm exhausted for repeating that over and over again and people not believing until the leak happened last month. And so that's been hard to reckon with while another professional part is like just desensitized to it a little bit, right? Like we know it's coming. Um, and like, I think I can live in this Colorado bubble where we're okay for now. Um, we have Raya. We are a pretty progressive state and have been working to remove additional barriers. And we have a game plan for the next few years of how we're going to get there. Um, but like outside of that bubble and the personal level, it's devastating too. Thinking about all of the folks who are going to lose access, thinking about all of the this being, like Minnie was saying, this being the start of all of these fundamental rights that in my lifetime have been guaranteed um, and just, a, they were just there. So it's devastating. Um, but I think what really keeps me going, not to bring us all down, um, is the fact that I get to have really amazing conversations with the Latino community here in the state. I get to hear their hopes and dreams and they trust me with their stories. Um, and knowing that like we're in this work together, we are doing this together is what is really like bringing me joy right now and like really keeping me going in this work because it is really hard. Um, I think being able to talk to my community and have one-on-one -on -one conversations is just what's giving me life. We know that like small cultural shifts can happen in these conversations, these really real, sometimes difficult conversations with our family, friends, and loved ones that can slowly change minds and slowly change outcomes. Um, and so I think that's what's giving me hope and what I would encourage folks to do, like Minnie said, like have those conversations with people in your life and see if there's joy in that. I love that. Yes, absolutely. So for me, Jada, a lot of what Christina said applies, but I'll, I'll add to it. What gives me, I'll start with what gives me hope. Well, and if it's not too cheesy, I'll say Christina gives me hope and who she That's represents. not cheesy at all. That's wonderful. Who she gives, who she represents gives me hope because there's this rising generation of women of color, immigrant women taking over these movements, you know, taking over, running for office, getting elected, you know, um, rising to really powerful positions. That, you know, I'm 49, I'm as old as Roe v. Wade. I was born a month after Roe. So like in my lifetime, I've seen, when I started working in politics, it was all white male dominated, you know, even in places like Texas. So to, to come now and have the opportunity to be part of this movement that is so incredibly enriched by the reproductive justice movement, by young people, it gives me hope because 
they have done the culture shifting work that my generation was not able to successfully do. Abortion, talking about abortion is no longer stigmatized. People are much more comfortable telling their abortion story. All those things critically matter. What's also given me hope in this last month since the leak is the unprecedented attention I've heard and, you know, interest in this issue I've heard from places that were unlikely. You know, mainstream folks coming, I mean, like white male guys, like calling me and go, what can I do? I need to get involved in this. This affects me too. I'm like, yes, it does. We have things for you to do. You should be engaged in this. You need to tell your abortion story. You know, I think it was last year that Senator Gary Peters of Michigan told his abortion story as the partner of someone who had to suffer through um, a challenging pregnancy. Uh, and that was so powerful and important. And I just, I'm seeing more and more men um, embracing that they have that role as a storyteller um, and as an advocate. So that gives me a lot of hope. And those rallies gave me hope. I mean, I've been going to rallies for, I don't know, 20 something plus years, but it does feel like something's a little different that for the first time, even though we've been shouting it for a very long time, folks like Christina and I, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Look at these restrictions. I mean, I was working in the Texas legislature for Planned Parenthood when we passed the mandatory ultrasound bill over a decade ago, you know, and we were screaming it from the rooftops and people weren't paying attention. But guess what? Now people are paying attention and that gives me hope because that's an opportunity for us to really take advantage of the crisis. And out of great crisis comes innovation for all of us. So that excites me and makes me feel like we have an opportunity to do something really big and bold and re-envision what access to abortion should be beyond Roe. Um, a lot of debate about whether Roe and privacy was the right way to codify and enshrine access. Um, so there's a lot of cool, exciting stuff that can happen in the wake of this, but I don't want to undermine how terrible and dangerous it is that this is happening as well. It's complicated. It is complicated, and I, and I think you hit it again on the nail for me. Just the gems are really, like, sticking with me, but... <laughs> Something's different. Something is, yeah. different. Something is different. Even with gun violence, even with our friends in the gun violence community, which is a reproductive freedom issue as well, right? Like I shouldn't have to, I have little kids. I have to worry about sending them to school to be shot. It's a repro issue for me too. It's changing. It's There's something feels different. I think people are waking up to how incredibly dangerous the extremist Repu Republican agenda is for this country. I hope <laughs> It's a strong, it's a thread of hope, but it's a strong one for sure. Um, so thank you both for joining me for this really important conversation. And I know that I've, I've learned a lot and it's been really um, an honor for me to sit with two women who are just really doing the work. Um, where can we find you on social media as you continue your activism? I, I personally want to keep up and I know tons of people do too. Well, I'm at, at Min Tim uh, on Twitter. So that's um, that's part of my first name, part of my last name, M-I-N-T-I-M-M. -M. It's easier to probably find me through NARAL. We're at NARAL, N-A-R-A-L. And we're our website, if you still bother with websites, is prochoiceamerica.org. But we're on Insta, we're on Facebook. Um, and we're I'm getting better at my social. My the younger generation is, we're not, I don't know that we're on TikTok yet, but we're exploring it right now. <laughs> I will definitely be exploring TikTok this month. There's a lot of interesting <laughs> on TikTok. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely worth exploring. For sure. Yeah. And Christina, where can we find you? Yes. Um, my personal at Twitter is at CP Soli, so S-O-L-I-Z. Um, so you can follow me there, but also it's probably easier to go through Color's website. Um, our Twitter and Instagram is at Color, like Color Latina. Um, and then ColorLatina.org, ColorLatina.org is our website. We have tried TikTok. We've had good success. We have youth of Color fellows who are like young people who are actually good at TikTok. I can barely do Twitter despite being a younger person. Um, but we have had really good success with our Twitter, especially whenever we were promoting Raya and the signing and getting uh, getting young people involved there. Like TikTok was really good for us. So check yeah. out our TikTok too. I'm going to have to go figure it out. <laughs>
<laughs> yes. yes, and um, I'm definitely going to be uh, testing out my, I actually have to set up an account for TikTok for the in-person summit on Monday, so I will figure that out. But you can also find me on Twitter at Jada Gomez, J-A-D-A-G-O-M-E-Z, as well as our work on Pop Sugar, um, which is obviously pop and sugar. Um, so <laughs> about to follow you both and both of your organizations as soon as we wrap. But thank you again. Um, are there any, um, we have a few extra minutes and I know that the audience would love even more gems from you. Is there any anything that I didn't touch on that um, either of you would like to include? I'd love to, can, can I ask a question directly to Christina? Yes, absolutely. I, I think it's, can you, can you talk a little bit about how your organization started and why? I think it's so important for folks to understand the history of all these organizations. Yes. Um, so our organization started 24 years ago, actually. Um, there were four, can I swear on this? Like badass Latinas who yeah. came together saw that there was a lack of information in the Latino community specifically around reproductive health care and was trying to decide how to best combat that and how to provide resources to our community in our language, the way we talk about it, and like understanding the cultural lens that we come to or come from. So those four amazing women came together and they started Color actually 24 years ago. And the work has just expanded to be all encompassing. So moving from education to resources. Um, and as we enter our 25th year next year, we have grown, we do legislative work now, like I mentioned. Um, we have a Youth of Color Fellowship Program where we're doing leadership development. We have um, a Latina event increasing political strength program where we train young Latinas specifically on how to um, advocate, like we send them to DC, uh, what we did pre-pandemic, and this was our first year back to DC actually, right after the leak. Um, but just like let them know how to lobby and um, how to really get involved in civic engagement work. So, you know, whenever Latinas see a problem, we are the problem solvers of our families. Uh, so we do it at the state level as well. I love that so much. Um, when I first started working uh, in legal services early in my career in Texas, I was in South Texas and I met a lot of great organizers who were doing cafecitos and like organizing mm -hmm. the community and like sharing information, but everything from like your taxes to birth control to, you know, everything you needed to know as a working mom in South Texas. So I've seen it in action, the power of Latinas deciding to just take it in their own hands to educate their community. So awesome. That's, that's an inspiring story. And I didn't realize you were 24 years old. That's really exciting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we're the decision makers of our family. So it only makes sense that we take back the spaces that we haven't been invited to and stand up and provide our own information in the ways that we can understand it. So I think that's so exciting. And Jada, I'll just say, you know, I've had a chance in this job to get to meet and work with so many um, women of color led organizations across the country. And more and more women of color are taking on these leadership roles. I'm the first woman of color to run NARAL. And we have uh, a really important opportunity to reshape the discussion. So um, just really excited and encourage folks to look up the reproductive justice orgs in your community and get to know the Christinas in your community too. Um, and see where you can be supported there as well. Because these groups are frankly, I think it's okay for me to say, Christina, historically under-resourced compared to the mainstream national groups like us. So I think it's really important. Mm -hmm. Well, as a mixed race Latina, I my heart is beaming. I'm so proud of you, Christina. I'm so proud of you, Minnie, as well. I'm just really honored to have this combo with you. Um, so thank you so much for joining us and um, stay tuned for uh, the next the next panel on your roster. Thanks for, thanks, Mrs. Obama for having us. Yes, thank you so much, Mrs. Obama. Thank Bye you. Everyone.
there's a break Hello, there. everyone. My name is Asosa Osa. I am the Deputy Executive Director at Fair Fight Action, a voting rights organization um, uh, rooted in Georgia and founded by uh, Stacey Abrams. Uh, and hello to, to everyone joining the, the Culture of Democracy Summit. And thank you so much to When We All Vote for the critical work that you do to en engage eligible Americans in the democratic process. Uh, Fair Fight Action is proud to work alongside allies like When We All Vote to protect our freedom to vote and encourage all eligible voters to make their voices heard. I'm so proud to lead Fair Fight Action teams, and uh, it's a team grounded in the communities they serve and dedicated to defending our democracy. Uh, this group of change makers has helped make a new Georgia possible. And in 2022, we'll double down on our efforts to protect our, our freedom to vote. In 2021, Fair Fight Action helped bring voting rights to the forefront of the national agenda, advocating for change at the federal level and continuing our legislative efforts across the states. This year, we've done that work in tandem with our ongoing litigation against the Georgia Secretary of State. And we will maintain this momentum momentum in, in this massively important election year. At the state level, Fair Fight Action and our allies help mitigate the harm of anti-voting bills across the country. We successfully defeated provisions that would have ended no excuse vote by mail in, uh, and dramatically restricted student ID voting in New Hampshire and added restrictive vote, uh, photo ID uh, requirements in Arizona. And in Georgia, we sounded the alarm when SB202 first reared its ugly head. We quickly organized volunteers against the bill, which was designed to impede access to the ballot for voters of color. The attention that we brought to the bill resulted in a number of changes from its original draft, um, including the preservation of souls to the polls, the, uh, the preservation of no excuse vote by mail, the preservation of automatic voter registration, and the preservation of drop boxes in Georgia. The version of SB 202 signed into law by Brian Kemp is still a harmful anti-voter bill, but without organization, it could have been much worse. Uh, anti-voter bills, and efforts like SB202 are in response are in direct response to black, brown, and young voters turning out and claiming their power in 2020. And we are working to ensure that our communities continue to participate and make their voices heard. Working in concert with allied organizations uh, and activists, we are reaching out to our communities to make sure they have the most up-to-date information on how to make their voting plan with the changes brought by SB202. As Georgians are more have proven that they are more determined than ever ever to vote. It's critical that every eligible voter has the opportunity to get registered, to cast their ballot, and to have that ballot counted fairly. The freedom to vote is about so much more than winning or losing elections. Uh, the freedom to vote is about the freedom to live. Free and fair elections are the mechanism by which we achieve other policy victories um, that reflect our values from health care to gun control to reproductive justice to tackling systematic racism. And conferences like these are essential for ensuring that the many different groups working to advance our shared goals can continue to work in alignment. I'm so grateful to have had the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, and please join our work at fairfight.com. And now I'm excited to pass the mic to an esteemed actress and ally in this fight and co-chair of When We All Vote, Liza Koshi. Liza, take it away. What's up, everybody? And welcome to the Culture of Democracy Summit. Now, I'm Liza Koshi, and I am so stoked and honored to join When We All Vote today to introduce this ridiculously important next panel, the State of Environmental Justice. Now, what is environmental justice? It is a long definition. Here we go. The Environmental Protection Agency defines it as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Now, it is no secret that our environment has been rapidly deteriorating, and Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities are some of its hardest-hit victims. From poor air quality in our cities, which could be responsible for the high asthma rates in Black and Latinx children, to equal access to clean drinking water for all, regardless of a community's socioeconomic makeup, to protecting sacred lands and precious resources from being depleted by large corporations. Environmental justice impacts facets of our life we could easily take for granted. Like, how often are you thinking about, hmm, I wonder what was in that air I just took a breath of, or what is in that drink that I have next to me at all times? 
Listen, our earth needs us and we need to listen right back and take action. Now, here are some facts. Since the 1970s, the United States has warmed 2.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. And the concentration of heat trapping CO2 in the atmosphere has increased by an alarming 30%. Yeah, that's terrifying. Now, I know with everything else that's going on in the world, it may feel like there's nothing you can do, but there very much is. The first step is awareness and to learn. So please allow me to welcome today's speakers and teachers, GRIS Editor-in-Chief Nikhil Swaminathan, Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali from the National Wildlife Federation, and intersectional environmentalist very own Leah Thomas, and from Protect the Sacred, Ali Redhorse Young. Go ahead, take it away, Nikhil. So honored to be here with such an amazing panel uh, to talk about such an important subject, environmental justice. Um, I am Nikhil Swaminathan, the Editor-in-Chief and Interim CEO of GRIST, and I'm coming to you live from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, so environmental justice, it's a term that a decade ago we didn't hear that much in our daily or political discourse, but it's grown in prominence in recent years. That's unfortunately in response to threats to people's health and surroundings, such as the Flint water crisis and the protests over the development of the Dakota Access Pipeline. Uh, I know we just heard a definition, but let me give you a quick other definition from none other than Dr. Bob Bullard a distinguished professor at Houston's Texas Southern University, who's known as the father of environmental justice. He says environmental justice embraces the principle that all people and communities have a right to equal protection and equal enforcement of environmental laws and regulations. Effectively, what we're talking about here is the fact that when you look at the communities surrounding industrial facilities or in the path of new fossil fuel projects, there's a strong likelihood that they are low income communities and communities of color. As a corollary, the climate justice movement fights for the rights of communities suffering disproportionately from the effects of climate change, like flooding or extreme heat. Those communities tend to bear a striking resemblance to those living across from refineries or in the path of new pipelines. This panel is just totally primed to be able to answer questions and get us to the point where you totally understand the state of environmental justice in this country right now. And I'm so excited to start asking them questions. So let's get to it. So Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali, hello. Uh, it's been a while, but you're, you're a vet of the EPA and have worked on these issues for decades. So I feel it's only right to start with you. We've talked about a couple definitions of environmental justice, but I want to your assistance in seeing how this plays out in practice. Can you give us a few examples of the types of communities we're talking about, the types of injustices we're talking about? Um, just sort of set our feet on the ground here for this discussion, please. No, I appreciate it. It's good to see you again, brother. Yeah, let, let's anchor folks in the reality that's happening across our country. You know, we got between 200 and 300,000 people who are dying prematurely from air pollution every year in our country. More people are dying from air pollution than are dying from gun violence. More people are dying from air pollution than are dying from car crashes. More people are dying from air pollution than are dying from overdoses of drugs. All of those things are critically important and we should be focused on them. When I talk about air pollution, you know, we automatically have to go to Cancer Alley between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, where petrochemical corporations for as far as the eye can see and the communities who actually helped to found that area, uh, freed slave, enslaved people, are now dealing with some of the highest cancer rates in our country because of the exposures that are happening. Or you can go to the Manchester community in Houston, Texas, a hardworking Latinx community. When you go there, you roll down the windows of your car and you feel like you're breathing in gasoline fumes. There's no way that anyone in this country should be exposed to those types of impacts. Or in Rubbertown, in Louisville, Kentucky, once again, an African-American community that is dealing with the manufacturing uh, industrial processes and dealing with cancers, liver and kidney diseases, heart disease, and a number of other conditions that are going on. These are environmental injustices. Or you can look at the diesel, diesel death zone in Wilmington, California, where kids, when they're playing on the soccer fields, you know, you see the flaring that's happening in the background, and they're expected to be able to learn and also thrive in these types of situations. Or you can look at Benton Harbor, Michigan, 
which actually has higher levels of lead in their water than Flint, Michigan did. And we know the devastation that happened there. Princeville, North Carolina, once again, because of the lack of infrastructure investments in this African-American community, you now find that they keep getting hit with 100-year and 500-year floods and trying diligently to be able to build back. Or you can look at the fact that we've got 60 million people in our country over the last decade who've dealt with unsafe drinking water. Or you can look at the folks in the Black Belt who are literally walking around in human waste because of the lack of water infrastructure in those locations. These are just a few of the examples, just like in, in Puerto Rico, where our brothers and sisters after Hurricane Maria had to make, you know, life and death decisions uh, based upon the exposures that they were dealing with. We can go across our country and we see that these injustices, this environmental racism continues to happen time and time again to people of color and lower wealth communities and our indigenous brothers and sisters. Thank you so much. And I, I wonder if you could to go a little personal for a second, because I believe in previous conversations we've had, we talked about your grow, growing up in uh, West Virginia and Appalachia. And I just want you to paint a little picture of what what you saw growing up, what what's going on on the ground there. And I think it, it goes across races. Um, can you just share some of, uh, of that experience with us? Oh, sure. You know that, um, you know, I grew up in two places. I grew up in Appalachia and I grew up in Michigan. And there are similar dynamics, even if the different sets of exposures, the outcomes are the same. So, you know, growing up in Appalachia, right now you have a place like Institute, West Virginia, um, in the Kanawha Valley, where they are now dealing with, because of their sets of exposures from chemical corporations, you know, high, high cancer rates. It's a cancer cluster. Let's be very clear. But also, many of our white brothers and sisters also in Appalachia, you know, they're dealing with food insecurity issues. They're dealing with the flooding that's going on. You know, they're dealing with wells being impacted uh, from fracking and a number of other processes uh, that continues to place them also behind the eight ball, if you will. And you see this play out throughout Appalachia, along with the lack of investment in infrastructure for decade upon decade upon decade, whether you're in Kentucky or West Virginia, Ohio, Western Pennsylvania, uh, or there in West Virginia. Um, so both our lower wealth white brothers and sisters and folks of color um, and, of course, our indigenous brothers and sisters continue uh, to, to want to be made whole. They want to make sure that their voices are being heard and not that being heard, but also influencing the process. And they want to see investments finally coming uh, to the communities that have often been unseen and unheard and made to be sacrifice zones. And I want to I want to stay personal here and kick it to Ali for just a second. Um, so you moved back to the Navajo Nation after living in Los Angeles and in order to help organize and protect the community against COVID-19. But can you go broader and tell us about some of the environmental challenges facing the residents of the Navajo Nation? Absolutely. Um, first of all, Yad, eh, hello. Um, I'm very happy to be here and in conversation with all of these great people. Um, yeah, I mean, actually, the environmental challenges that we face in the Navajo Nation are are tied to COVID and the COVID numbers that we saw. And I think um, the when the Navajo Nation became the hardest hit community in the country um, per capita, we it revealed a lot to the world. Um, it's there were challenges that we know that we've lived with, um, but for the rest of the world, they learned that our people in the Navajo Nation, 30% um, of our people don't have running access to running water. 40% of our people don't have electricity. Um, and that is a direct result of um, the environmental challenges we faced in our nation. I was very um, candid with a lot of um, uh, journalists who would interview me and I would say, you know, I think there's a deeper issue here and we need to connect the dots. The fact that the hot spots within the Navajo Nation were those areas where uranium mining happened, um, you know, decades ago, where coal mining had existed until 2019. Um, you know, Peabody coal mine came in, um, and and they're just all of these dots that have impacted not only our Na the Navajo Nation but also Hopi lands, which is um, right. Um, ex uh, the land masses within the Navajo Nation. Um, and if you look up the Hopi, Navajo Hopi land dispute, you know, that was a dispute that was 
um, over um, this mining company coming into our indigenous lands and thousands of our residents were relocated and removed from their homelands um, in order for this um, um, mining um, spot to exist. And as a result, um, we, we have the death rates that were in these hotspots um, our elders who uh, consumed that contaminated water, um, that toxic water, um, our our grandpas that worked in um, in 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 the mines and actually were uranium miners, um, and they have um, they have you know ra radiation and they have um, lung diseases that they're still battling. And those are the people that were affected and impacted and, and ended up dying. So the death rates, I think, are a direct result of what our community has faced environmentally. Um, and like I said, that's uh, Peabody coal mine existed in, till 2019. And, um, and still there are mining, uranium mining spots that haven't been cleaned up. Um, and that, again, um, affects healthcare, et cetera, um, and just the, the impact that we have um, been facing because of COVID-19. Uh, and so those are things that I really want uh, folks to take a, a deeper dive into, and I want folks to really investigate that because I think it's not a coincidence. Yeah, and I, I actually want to dig in on this and bring in Leah and uh, Mustafa, if they have anything to share on the topic. I mean, this intersection between COVID and um, environmental justice communities uh, in general, it's something that we saw, especially early in the pandemic, and Grist called it out as calling COVID-19 another environmental justice issue. It's kind of top of mind for me at the moment because my six-year-old son tested positive this morning. But um, we, so... We, we are seeing a lot of overlap, um, just as Ali mentioned it, specific to the Navajo Nation, but I'm curious, I do, I, I have a question specifically for you, Leah, about in, intersections, so maybe we'll sort of start there, but I'm curious for both you and Mustafa, what you're seeing in terms of where COVID graphs on to inequities that were already present. I could start. Um, so I guess the terminology intersectional environmentalism started to take off during the COVID-19 pandemic. So around the summer of 2020. And I think it's because, um, because climate justice movements, as I'll expand on a little bit later, have always been intersectional in nature. Environmental justice movements have always been intersectional in nature. But during the summer of 2020, there were just so many things happening at once. So healthcare inequality, a pandemic, environmental injustices, and then also racial injustice at the same time. So I think a lot of people started to gravitate towards intersectional types of thinking to see all of these intersections because the same communities that were being impacted by racial injustice we're also being impacted by the healthcare crisis, and we're also not having the, the right to breathe in so many other ways. And then we have the pandemic and COVID-19, which is also something that is attempting to you know, steal people's breaths and attacking the respiratory system. So I think there was such an overwhelm during the summer of 2020 that so many people started to gravitate towards those intersections. And they saw that indigenous and black and brown communities were being hit the hardest, not just in one area, but in so many. So the whole system is something that we need to fix. So, yeah. Anything to add, Dr. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, first of all, good to see my sister, Leah. Um, and, you know, I wrote early uh, in the pandemic uh, about environmental justice and the impacts that were going to happen in our communities because we were clear about the sets of impacts that were already happening. We knew that in our communities because of the sets of exposures we had been dealing with, that a number of folks had pre-existing medical conditions. We also knew that another dynamic that you'll find in relationship to uh, environmental injustices is the fact that uh, clinics and hospitals in the rural context have been shut down 
So communities had a much more difficult time and were going to have a much more difficult time in being able to, to find treatment. We also knew that there were biases in the medical system. So when we talk about environmental injustices, we also look at policy, whether we're talking about transportation or health or housing or the environment or economic and how there have been biases and discrimination historically that have been built into that, that the ripples of those still play out in our communities. We knew that 24 million people across our country have asthma, 7 million kids, and we know that disproportionately it was African-American and Latinx children who are the ones who go to the emergency rooms and who ones who lose their lives prematurely. And we knew since this was an airborne virus that that would make them uh, even more vulnerable. We also knew that it was frontline workers who were the ones who couldn't sit in the front of their computers and do work, that they actually had to show up. They were driving the buses, they were driving the trains, they were working in the field, so forth and so on. And um, so we kept, you know, putting the alarm out there because of years of experience and understanding where our system had failed. What were the gaps in our social safety net, if you will? And COVID just placed an even bigger spotlight on that, that these injustices have to be addressed. When they don't, we make our economic system more vulnerable. We make our healthcare system more vulnerable. And of course, Black, Brown, Asian and Pacific Islander, Indigenous brothers and sisters and lower wealth communities' lives become more endangered. Um, and so now we have an opportunity. My grandmother says, when you know better, do better. We've now seen all of these lessons that have been shared with us. It's time for us to make sure that we are fixing the system so that the next pandemic does not place crosshairs on our community's lives. So important. I mean, I think everything that the three of you have touched on in the last few minutes has been really important. It's, I, I'm, gl I'm so glad we're not talking about EJ just in isolation, but as part of a larger um, set of circumstances that faces that face the communities that we're we're discussing. It, environmental just being an environmental justice community normally does not mean solely suffering an environmental injustice. There's often other elements tied to that, and, and in a way, it just sort of ties together all of the themes that are being discussed today at the Culture of Democracy Summit. Um, and so I want to move from sort of stating the problem, which is sort of what we've been doing up until this point, to, to talking about, you know, building movements and galvanizing action to right some of these wrongs. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay with you, Leah. Um, and I know you in particular have, have spent the last couple of years using the power of the internet to engage audiences and to, to bring people into the understanding of intersectional environmentalism. I think in the past, there used to be, at least in the environmental movement, and um, Dr. Ali, please uh, fact check me if you feel like I'm going awry. Um, there's been a sense that there was a mainstream environmental movement that was concerned with conservation and concerned with, um, you know, the, the, the protection of wild spaces and then, um, sure, air pollution and things like that. But then there was a more grassroots environmental justice movement that was staying very tightly, um, you know, around community issues. And I think that that's blurred with younger people. That's what I'm seeing. Uh, and that there's like one larger environmental movement where they sort of see the whole playing field. I'm wondering, you know, that's your message. And I'm wondering if you're, if it's resonating with young people and you're seeing them reflect that back to you. Yeah. And I think it's really important to understand why that siloing was happening. It was by design. So if we go to the Earth Day movement, which was um, you know, in the late 60s, 70s, they really did appropriate a lot of the successful tactics of the civil rights movement, and it was largely successful. There was 20 million people, there was the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, and so many incredible environmental policies. Um, however, if you look at who was present at the first Earth Day movement, it was not a whole lot of black and brown folks. And if you go to someone like Arturo Sandoval, who is the only Chicano organizer um, of the Earth Day movement, in his own words, he said that lack of representation of working class people and black and brown folks 
led to those laws that were created just diverting all of that pollution into black and brown communities. And then we have the wonderful environmental justice movement, which was black and brown led. But unfortunately, I would say by design, because of racism and other things, that 20 million people, they didn't support the environmental justice movement in the same way that I think they needed to. So there's been a siloing, but it's because of maybe a value difference of people of color for decades saying that our lives matter in the context of environmentalism and the broader environmental community not listening to them. And I think that that is a stain on environmental history that continues to this day. However, something that I'm really excited about, especially with Gen Z, is that they want to take their education into their own hands. And the only reason that I think the terminology intersectional environmentalism is resonating with so many young folks is they're saying, why am I not learning about the environmental justice movement in my environmental science class? My environmental education is incomplete if I'm not also learning about what communities are being impacted the most. So I've seen so many students successfully protest to get environmental justice classes added to their curriculums, and not only that, make it mandatory. And I think that's what we need because we no longer, we never should have had a siloing of these movements. We have to protect people in the context of protecting the planet. Um, so I think, yeah, there's just a lot of conversations about identity and what environmentalism means. And if environmentalism doesn't stand for just and the advocacy of all people, then what are we standing for in the first place? So I think it's trying to merge those movements. And yeah, I'm curious if Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali, I know I said your full name, if you have any thoughts on that as well, because there's a lot of interest in people wanting to learn about environmental justice history and then also make it mandatory. It shouldn't be separate. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you 100%. You know, um, I, I started off working on these issues as a student, and, and in the early days, we actually talked about holistic strategies uh, and, and making sure that that was sort of the centering that we were dealing with. Let's also just real quickly clear up uh, some misconceptions that we often allow folks to, to move forward on. So, you know, when we're talking about conservation, it was our indigenous brothers and sisters who were the original folks who lived in harmony uh, with the environment and honored the environment. You know, whether here in this country or in South America or in Canada um, or in Africa uh, or in Australia, you know, all these different places that indigenous people, indigenous brothers and sisters, and, you know, we use indigeneity in a broad sense, are also the ones who have been protecting, you know, our forests and our jungles and our wetlands. So when we have allowed the, and I mean this in the most loving sense, when we have allowed folks to whitewash uh, what uh, conservation is, and we have done a disservice in making sure that the fullness of the history that did not start, you know, in the 18th century or, or the early 19th century or wherever you want to come in that timeline. Um, so uh, I, I agree with my sister Leah, um, and we also have some real unique sets of opportunities when we follow an intersectional paradigm or a holistic uh, paradigm, uh, because we give on-ramps to so many different folks who have so many different skills and so many different needs. If we truly want to embrace a transformational moment, then that means that intersectionality uh, or, or a holistic strategy has to be uh, sort of the anchoring point uh, that we operate from. And Ali, I want to bring you in because Mustafa mentioned um, the role of indigenous peoples and conservation. But I'll, I'm curious, like, what you're seeing as you try to organize young people, young Native people, and what sort of, do you see any sort of generational shift as you're, as you're going through your work? Absolutely. And, and just to add, um, yeah, indigenous peoples protect 80% of the world's biodiversity. And I always say that is not a coincidence. Um, uh, and I, I've talked about um, how our peoples were moved, you know, and, and forced to be on certain reservations. Um, and wherever we moved, we were still able to, um, to really resource the land, to really um, have that relationship with the land. Uh, and then, you know, it, it, it's no wonder that... Um, you know, the government and, and 
um, colonizers then came back to those lands after we figured out how to live within those lands and wanted to take even more of it. Um, but that being said, you know, that's the history and that's the knowledge that our young people are know. And I always say that Indigenous youth are in a lot of ways more educated than ever. And there's also this cultural renaissance happening in our nations where our young people um, want to reconnect to our cultures. They want to learn those stories, our creation stories that teach us about having this special sacred relationship with Mother Earth. And I'm so confident that, you know, they're, they're, they are the leaders in this movement. They should be the leaders in this movement with the knowledge that we have from our ancestors. Um, and they're, they're very curious. Um, organizing last year when I led um, an activation in the Navajo Nation, um, my community on horseback to polling locations, I was in conversation with a lot of the young people and, and the folks who joined along the ride. And, you know, I asked them what what's motivating you and why why did you decide to to join this um this activation? And I heard uh from several people that being on horseback, being in our sacred homelands, riding upon our sacred homelands um, is what was inspiring them and, and it made them realize the beauty that we're, we should be protecting as, you know, the original stewards of this land. And so I just, I see that increasing. I see our, our young people, um, you know, I think we need to be calling on them and including them in this space a lot more. Um, I, I've heard about um, climate storytelling within Hollywood, and I'm urging, you know, those folks, uh, those creatives to call on Indigenous peoples in our wisdom and our stories, because that should be um, I, I feel that if that knowledge was not um, forced from our people you know, through board, the boarding school system, if it was not swept under the rug, we would be in a lot better place right now. And I want to um, just talk, because we've been talking a lot about the history and like how we've sort of arrived here. Um, I'm just curious from your perspective, Mustafa, um, it does seem like environmental justice has risen quite a bit and the discussion of it has risen quite a bit in prominence. I mean, it feels that way to me as a journalist covering climate and environment. I, I can only imagine what it feels like to you as somebody who's been working on these issues for decades. Um, are you seeing what I'm seeing or is this, did, the, did this move into the forefront for you um, years ago, and now I'm just seeing it. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> no, no, no. I, I think we were seeing some very similar things. You know, we have, in the beginning, we were in a survival mode, right? And people hear me talk about moving from surviving to thriving, if you will. Um, I, I share the story of the early days when I was a student going to my first environmental equity slash environmental justice meeting, walking down the hallway, and there were two older white gentlemen who were walking in front of me and they said, I don't know why we're going to this meeting because what these folks are sharing can't be true. They must be lying. So that was what we had to deal with in the early days. And then, of course, folks like Dr. Bullard and Dr. Wright and Peggy Shepard and Tom Goldtooth and Richard Moore, you know, they were all out there on the front lines trying to get folks to pay attention to these impacts that were happening inside of their communities. You know, over time, we have begun because you know, we started to have folks both in state houses and on Capitol Hill who began to, you know, uh, move in a, in a direction of, you know, putting a spotlight and making investments and those types of things. Um, and, and now we find a moment where we have, you know, the highest uh, levels of folks in our country um, who are now saying that, you know, we need to make investments in environmental justice. Foundations have shipped their portfolios. Um, we have legislation on the state level and, you know, we've got these executive orders on the federal level. Um, you have all these different things that are coming together. Leah shared, you know, also how incredibly important education is. So there are schools across the country now where sometimes you can get a degree in environmental justice or, you know, people continue to push to make sure that that curricula is being built 
Um, so we were moving in the direction. And then we also have just amazing projects that folks are finally paying attention to that if they were not communities of color, people would have grabbed hold of them and replicated them all across uh, the country. You know, projects like the Regenesis Project in Spartanburg, South Carolina, that took a $20,000 environmental justice small grant and leveraged over $300 million in changes. If, if I gave anybody else $20,000 and they were able to invest it in the stock market and make $300 million, they'd be on a speaking tour across the country. Everybody want to know how you were able to do that. Or you got folks uh, like Miss Margaret May out there in Kansas City in the Ivanhoe community who've been able to transform her community, you know, get, get the, you know, the drugs out, get green space and all these amazing things. Uh, or you got folks like the, the good folks down there in Turkey Creek, Mississippi, uh, who have been able to also play a, a role in transforming their communities. I share all this to say that storytelling is incredibly important, as was shared before. So these stories are finally starting to catch hold, but we need many more. We're starting to have some foundational pieces, you know, around policy and legislation, but we need more. Folks are starting to shift resources. But for the folks who've been doing the work and it hasn't even been resourced, we definitely need much more. Um, so if we are truly gonna move from surviving to thriving, then that's why each and every one of us is so incredibly important. We gotta get engaged, we gotta push. Uh, and, and if we do that, and then we also focus, uh, I never tell anybody who to vote for, but I do say vote for somebody who cares about your community. If we do those things, then we can truly make a transformational moment, have real authenticity, and it also folks can see change on the ground. Anyone want to jump in there? Otherwise, I have another question that I can, I because I have a, a follow on to that. So um, I am just curious, you know, the storytelling piece seems really, really important. And, you know, one of the things that's a challenge for us at Grist is we're telling these stories in different parts of the country, right? Like I've gone and visited Miss May in Ivanhoe and I, you know, we've told stories about um, groups on cancer, in Cancer Alley, we've, we've told stories about groups from uh, people working on the Navajo Nation. How do we unite all of that into essentially like an education for people who aren't in school? How do we, how does there become like an exchange of ideas so that what worked in Ivanhoe could potentially work somewhere else? You know, Gris is trying to do its part by telling those stories, but is there a more formal way, you know, both, all of you work through different levers, you know, Mustafa through your work, um, on the policy side, and then through the National Wildlife Federation, Leah, you know, you, you're doing a lot of sharing information and, and hearing from people online, and certainly, Ali, similar within your communities, like, how do we, how do we get these ideas to people so that we're, everybody who's sort of experiencing what they're experiencing in their local environment and local community is able to say, this is how we made change happen. Try this. I guess one thought would just be not underestimating social media, just meeting people where they're at. Even though I have like an environmental science background, there's a lot of snobbery in academia and even journalism at times to only want to reach like a niche audience of people. But if we wanna be able to activate as many people as possible, we can take that academic integrity and that journalistic integrity and share bits and piece of, pieces of it where millions of millions of people are and that happens to be on social media. We can fight through that climate misinformation and disinformation and even if someone has a 60 hour work week and they're on the bus, I want them to be able to pop open their Instagram feed or their Twitter. And if they hear or they're able to just read a quick story, a success story about someone being able to, I don't know, there's so many cases in California of land back that are happening more and more, whether it's through the purchase of land or because of you know local or state governments, et cetera. And someone being able to look at that and say, oh my goodness, this is a, an instance of land back or climate reparations that could maybe happen in my own community. Or, oh my goodness, who knew that there could be this hydroponic or whatever community garden in a community 
and that might inspire them to create that in their own community. So I think we can utilize what we have and just try to meet people where they're at and make sure that this information is accept as accessible as possible. And like I mentioned earlier, making sure we have academic integrity and journalistic integrity, but sharing that micro content, I think can be the first step to getting more people excited about the possibilities of the future. Um, there's an organization called Future Earth that was started by kind of a combination of unlikely allies, but it's really cool. So there's Max who has this background in, you know, environmental science and policy and all these sorts of things. And then Steph, who's like really cool in Hollywood and also like a really great climate activist. And they united and they created this organization and they share these good news stories every week. And a lot of people read those and they walk away with the possibilities of the things that they can do and it makes them feel really good. So I know I'm biased and I love social media, but I think it can be a great place to start. How about you, Ali? I'm curious, like I'm sure social media is extremely powerful for your work, um, but I'm also curious how you can take some of the indigenous storytelling you talked about earlier and bring it to non-indigenous communities and have them start thinking in a similar way to mm -hmm. how, in, in terms of stewardship, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, definitely social media. That's that's the uh, medium that Protect the Sacred has been utilizing since we started in 2020. And it, it has brought a ton of funding and um, resources to our communities. But I think also, you know, I want to remind my indigenous brothers and sisters that we're the original storytellers of this country and um, and we have that power, you know, it's the way it's the values and the teachings that have been passed down to from us or from our ancestors to us um, through storytelling and let's tap into that and let's be creative, whether it's a three minute video that's posted on Instagram or TikTok, um, and we have incredible indigenous TikTok influencers who who do educate on on social media um, to continue doing that. But also, um, you know, my other foot being in the entertainment industry, I think there's a lot of power there. You know, I, I'm a writer, creative, uh, and I want to push for more of those stories that. Um, come from from our people about lessons learned um, and how we've been able to retain um, our lands and be in, in a good positive reciprocal relationship with Mother Earth. I mean, I'll just chime in real quickly because sometimes folks forget that I was at the Hip Hop Caucus for a while. So, you, you know, organizations like that play a critical role. Um, because it is all about culture. If you really want to reach folks, then make sure that you are understanding uh, and connecting with culture. I mean, there's so many amazing artists that are out there who are now getting engaged, educating themselves, dedicating their time. I remember the first time that I met Taboo from the Black Eyed Peas and the work that he was doing on Stand Up for Standing Rock. You know, when I met Superman and I was just like, whoa, I mean, you just like, you, you got you got the whole package going on here. You, you got folks like, common you know who did uh trouble in the water you know talking about the water impacts that were going on you got my sister antonique smith you know bringing forward old beatles songs and giving it a whole 21st century flavor but also being authentic in the work um, that she does around environmental justice i mean you got the work of rihanna right now not only in her making contributions but also standing up and putting a spotlight on many of the issues that are going on so it is about culture it is about us also growing and evolving and bringing in folks from country music or bluegrass who are gonna be able to reach a, a set of constituents that maybe somebody from the hip hop community or somebody from the pop music um, would not be able to do. It is about us integrating as my sister Ali just shared. It is about us making sure that there is content to the storylines uh, of some of your favorite TV shows. It is about our telenovelas also having that content that is in there. So if we really want to win on these issues, if we really want to invite more folks in, then it has to be anchored in culture. And that means also that these entities have to begin to hire folks who have competencies in environmental justice. Environmental, when you really have competencies in environmental justice, you can talk about housing, transportation, you know, all these different types of issues. 
Um, so we can no longer also allow environmental justice or climate justice. And that's why I appreciate the work of Leah so much to make sure that people understand it touches everything that happens and that we cannot win on the climate crisis if we don't win on environmental injustice. And culture plays a key role in helping us to be able to achieve that. And just to go a little further with, I think culture is extremely important. I think you you all have hit on sort of the, you've all hit the nail on the head between storytelling and culture, but we're fighting an information war. Um, and that's, that's sort of at the root of a lot of what we're talking about throughout the day um, at the summit. And so I do think that there's some real value in, in sort of getting environmental justice type stories into Hollywood and onto TV. But there also is a sense that we consume specific cultures that, you know, kind of meet our identities. You know, we all we all not only get our political news from certain places, we also listen to this kind of music and, you know, read these kind of books and watch this kind of television. So I'm curious, like, what are how do we break down these? How do we get the message through? Um, what are the elements of the message that that transcend um, like our political tribes and our our bubble our various bubbles? One thing, and then also Ali, I'm really curious because you're a storyteller, but um, there's subtle things that can happen in storytelling and media, even just someone like, you know, biking more often. I remember I, I had a conversation with the streaming service and they were talking about all the subtle changes they were trying to implement into their shows, like using public transportation, having more water bottles, different things like that for their main characters to do. But then there's also, you know, we don't have to go all the way to dystopian movies that frighten people. There can also be conversations about the air quality just that happened to happen in their stories. Um, I think that's something that can really help to just normalize the conversation. Um, but yeah, I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts. Yeah, I, I definitely, the subtlety, um, I think, is, in storytelling is key. Um, but also, you know, there are ways as a storyteller to um, frame your stories, um, you know, thinking about um, your protagonist and their, you know, storytelling is about uh, really at the heart of it relationships and how we navigate this world. And, um, and when you can get um, a viewer to really buy into that relationship and cheer for their protagonist, um, no matter what your beliefs are, you're going to you're going to root for that protagonist. And there are ways like those subtle ways to build in um, when, when you kind of take a step back and you're like, you know, the, the, the deeper themes of, of these films, you can then analyze that. Yeah, you know, it is all about folks being able to see themselves reflected in what's being shared. Um, and that's why I think music plays a big role. I think film and TV plays a big role. One night I was, uh, at a hotel, I sat down uh, in this lobby and there was uh, a real famous, I won't call him out because uh, I don't want <laughs> to catch any heat, um, but we started having a conversation about fishing holes and he was telling me how, where he used to go fishing, there've been all these impacts now. By no means does he label himself a, as a climate champion, um, but he understood that because of pollution and increases in heat, that there have been some changes that are going on. So we had a deeper conversation. Um, if you have individuals like that um, who, you know, play in certain parts of the country, uh, then I think, you know, you, be, you began to create an opportunity, a safe space for people to have conversations. Um, and um, that's why I don't think there's a one size fits all. Um, I think that we have to have a number of just amazing organizations who are out there um, that are funded to be able to do the, the deep work that's necessary to make connections. Um, and to build bridges between communities. And I think as you begin to do that, then you have a much uh, stronger chance of being able to get to some of the deeper issues uh, and, and to, you know, just uh, help folks understand how we're all connected. That's wonderful. Um, I totally agree. And I, I think, you know, we have about two minutes left. And so um, I think it's really important. I just want to hear from 
each of you or any of you who feel like there's a part of this conversation that we haven't touched on that we really need to ensure um, the people who are listening to us and watching us right now know vis-a-vis -vis environmental justice like for the moment and moving forward. I know that's kind of open-ended. <laughs> That's well, a, okay, go ahead. No, 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 please, sister, you go. No, because mine's not super environmental justice related, but since we talked about intersectional environmentalism, I just want to give a shout out to Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, who created intersectional theory. And for people to know that intersectional theory isn't just a replacement term for diversity, equity, and inclusion, it has really strong roots in Black feminism. And as we continue to use that terminology, just making sure that we don't dilute its origins and appreciate all those incredible Black women uh, doing their thing. I'll just jump in real quick. You know, James Baldwin once said that if I love you, I have to make you conscious of the things you can't or don't see. Sometimes we don't make the connection between the civic process, democracy, um, and what's happening inside of our most vulnerable communities and the climate crisis. So as temperatures increase, as pollution increases, uh, we know that folks will be standing in lines longer, you know, if you don't, aren't allowed to have drop boxes that keep disappearing. Um, so there is a direct connection uh, between our ability to fully engage in the civic process, uh, to be able to truly see democracy working with us and for us um, by the sets of exposures that we're dealing with. You know, if you're standing in line, it's, uh, you know, 100 degrees outside, uh, but you can't have a drink of water or a candy bar, um, you know, that, that, that creates some dynamics that are there. And it, it creates dynamics for everybody. Um, so we just got to make sure that we understand there are these direct connections that are going on um, and that if we uh, are able to utilize our vote, um, then we can be transformational. And as my grandmother says, you have power unless you give it away. So we want to utilize our power to do positive things. Thank you so much, all of you. This was such an amazing discussion. I feel like we touched on so many different things and um, you guys were all amazing. So thank you so much. And thank you again to uh, When We All Vote. What an engaging discussion. Thank you so much, um, Nikhil, for leading uh, the conversation and to our panelists for their insight and their hard work. Este mensaje será repetido en español. My name is Adriana, and I am the director of educator engagement for my school votes. When We All Vote is a high school-based civic leadership program. At my school votes, we work with students leaders from across the country to provide them with the tools, resources, and guidance they need so they can collectively work towards solutions, challenges, and concerns like environmental justice. We do this with our MSB extracurricular club programs in our Civics 101 training series, where students can learn to organize, mobilize their peers, and it's all designed and led by students. Join this movement that is sweeping the nation. If you're a teacher, a high school student, parent, or a When We All Vote volunteer, we want you to help engage students everywhere. Go to We All Vote, join MSV to learn more. Mi nombre es Adriana Antiveros y soy la directora de participación educativa para el programa de MSB o Mi Escuela Vota, parte de When We All Vote. Este es un programa a nivel preparatoria de liderazgo cívico. En My School Vote trabajamos con estudiantes líderes de alrededor de todo el país para proveerlos con las herramientas, los recursos y la guianza que ellos necesitan para colectivamente trabajar en conjunto y encontrar soluciones a los problemas que les interesan, como el cambio climático. Hacemos esto por medio de nuestros clubes extracurriculares, nuestros entrenamientos de civismo, donde nuestros estudiantes aprenden a organizar y movilizar a sus compañeros. Todo esto ha sido diseñado y dirigido por estudiantes. Únete a este movimiento que está arrasando con la nación. Si eres un maestro, un estudiante, un padre de familia o voluntario de When We All Vote, queremos que nos ayudes a involucrar a tantos estudiantes como sea posible. Visita weallvote-joinmsv para aprender más. I am excited to introduce our new speaker and the CEO of Do Something, Dinora Gerashu.
How are you? I'm so excited to be here. I am Denora Gattaccio. I'm the CEO of DoSomething.org. It's so great to be with you here today and to share a little bit more about one of the largest organizations for young people and social change. Do Something has been sparking the civic light of young people and breeding a culture of democracy in young people for the last 29 years. As CEO, I leverage my passion and expertise to fuel young people to change the world by taking actions on the issues most pressing to them and their society. We center them in our work and we equip young people with the resources they need to claim our democracy. I do this work because I believe in the power of young people. I believe in the power of young people to change the world. And I believe in the power of young people because I was once a young person who lit her civic spark or maybe had her civic spark lit as a pregnant teen advocating for educational equity. I do this work to build a culture of democracy because I want every young person to know that they have the tools and skills necessary to improve the world. I'm excited and honored to speak at this Culture of Demo Democracy Summit because we're facing an urgent need to meet the needs of young people who are coming of age amidst an intersectional reckoning for equity and justice and a global pandemic in the digital age. Now is the time for young people to act. Next slide. Over the last two decades, Do Something has activated over 5 million young people to find their civic spark, their personal why. We've been the home for volunteerism on a quest to make it as cool as sports. I can say that we've done that, but now is the time for more because young people coming of age now support causes they care about with urgency and passion. We have gotten young people to be engaged as volunteers, but we're going a step further. We're asking them to take and push for systemic change and we're evolving our work to do that. We have a new mission and it's clear. We fuel young people to change the world. We're making sure that our youth activism hub can fuel young people and help them create meaningful change online and offline. Next slide. Like I said, we've been doing this with young people and there are 5 million young people in our network. And so if you go to the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit about where we are in this moment. Like I said, we're facing an intersectional reckoning and young people are at the forefront, pushing for that lasting and systemic and impactful change. And yet we're at a crossroads. Only two in 10 Americans trust the government in Washington to do what's right most of the time, according to the Pew Research Center poll that came out this week. And young people are bearing the burden of some of the most pressing challenges facing our world today. In order to affect change, we must tackle these issues with urgency and activate young people to change the world. Next slide. The last, the last two years have made clear that there's, it's time for a long overdue re-examination of what it means to change the world. And with these facts in hand, we have to do what we can to build this culture of democracy. Next slide. Let me tell you a little bit about what we think when we, understand, when we talk about knowing young people. 17 million young people will come of age and be voting age eligible between 2020 and 2024. That's so powerful and must be harnessed to create the democracy they deserve to inherit. They are watching, and it's so important to have this summit to talk about the culture of democracy we want to breed and for them to inherit. Next slide. When we talk to young people and do something's collective, what we hear them say is that they want a greener future, mental health supports that are accessible and diverse, an equitable society that centers them in their push for equity and inclusion, and most importantly, representation. Do something exists to help young people consciously step into claiming their power and claiming democracy for themselves and their communities. We have to be the community that helps them move this work forward. Next slide. What we know also to be true is that young people are asking us what, what can they do? And so this summit is powerful because it's giving all of us tangible solutions to take action on the issues most pressing to ourselves and to our community. Next slide. Without a healthy functioning democracy, we can actually move towards a culture of democracy and one that is reflective and inclusive of all of us. And so I would encourage all of us to really push for that systemic change, that top left quadrant. What does it take to meet, to breed a culture of democracy? It's really getting engaged in what I like to call the full context or of democracy. There are so many ways that we can get engaged. We can do online activism. We can do some of that traditional activism. But what we do know is that it's a full contact sport. And so choose the way you wanna engage in that sport and then get engaged. Next slide.
Wanted to just share again what it takes for young people to claim our democracy. We're in a moment where trust is low and where young people are saying they're turning away from politics. And so it's on us as we have this summit today to really spark that light and build that culture of democracy. So I'll end with the next slides of telling you a little bit more about how you can get engaged in the work we're doing to do something. We have a campaign right now that's really focused on helping young people um, avoid distracted driving as we all get on the road and school lets out for summer. And so if you look at, um, come to our site, do something.org, you'll learn more about how to build a zero crash future and avoid uh, distracted driving. And next slide, it's Pride Month and we're so proud of the work that we're doing um, to help young people really build a movement. It's called Proud and Loud. And so again, if you text Pride to 38383, you'll be able to learn more about the work we're doing to help young people be clear about the importance of inclusivity in our society. And with that, I would love to introduce Brett Rock, When We All Vote Chair and Champion for Changing the Culture of Voting to introduce the next panel. Thank you. Welcome to the inaugural Culture of Democracy Summit by When We All Vote. My name is Bremen Rock, and I'm so honored to introduce the next conversation with some of the country's most effective and groundbreaking young leaders. This November, there are hundreds of elections taking place in all levels of government, and we need to pay attention. Voters will elect 435 seats in the House of Representatives and 35 out of 100 seats in the Senate. You know, the people that pass or do not pass certain laws, you know what I'm talking about. So much is at stake during this election. Voting rights, reproductive rights, economic justice, criminal justice reforms, climate change, LGBTQ plus issues, and so much more. And turning out your schools and community to vote is a critical step in creating the change you want to see in the world. About 8 million young people would have turned 18 since the 2020 general election, which they could not have voted in. As the first generation immigrant myself from the Philippines, I unfortunately do not have the rights to vote just yet, which is why I'm encouraging everyone who could vote to vote. That's why I'm joining When We All Vote and it's My School Votes program, which provides high schools with impactful programming for students. Young people have the power to decide who the next senators and governors will be all across the country. Your vote is your power. Ensure your voice is heard and start my school vote program in your school. So back to today's conversation, from the screen to the street to the polls, what drives Gen Z to action? Did you know that 95% of Gen Zers own a smartphone and most of them, like me, prefers to use our smartphone rather than computer? And also, 8% of Gen Zers visit traditional news websites daily and 16% read the newspapers weekly. So what does this mean for the future of our democracy? Today's conversation is moderated by the great Judith Nwandu, who is a political host and the producer of The Shade Room. And she's joined by an incredible cast of young leaders, including Anto Chavez from United We Dream, a brave organization fighting for the rights of immigrant youth, which I personally feel very connected to. Deja Fox, founder of Gen Z Girl Gang and a renowned activist in her own rights. David Hogg, co-founder of March For Our Lives, which tomorrow, June 11th, is leading what will surely be one of the largest student rallies in history in the fight against gun violence. And Chelsea Miller, leader of Freedom March NYC, a nonviolent movement advocating for policy reform and mobilizing to become a youth-led civil rights organization for our generation. Thank you to all our viewers for caring about our community and for taking your future into your own hands. I am so inspired to be joined by this group of visionary leaders and I hope we inspire you to join us for this long fight. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us for the Culture of Democracy Summit. And Bretman, that was a fantastic intro. Thank you so much. I'm a huge fan. So um, I'm also a huge fan of everyone on this panel. I mean, we've got Deja Fox, founder of Gen Z Girl Gang, as you heard. Um, I actually bought a shirt, Deja. Uh, <laughs> it didn't fit me, so that's why I didn't wear it, but that's fine. 
Um, Anto, the work you do, <laughs> I ordered a size too small, by the way, it's not Deja's fault, but Anto, <laughs> thank you so much for all that you do with United We Dream. As Bretman said, he is an immigrant and isn't able to participate in voting, but a lot of what you do is helping people who are immigrants and just have a voice here in this country. And that's just so awesome. And then David, I mean, you've probably got a really busy weekend this weekend. Um, you're, you know, everything you're doing with March for Our Lives. So again, thank you to everyone for being on this panel. And with that being said, let's get into it, okay? So I looked it up because technically I was born in 1995. So some people say I'm millennial. Some people say I'm Gen Z. I say I'm Gen Z. I identify with Gen Z in a lot of ways. So what do you guys all think defines Gen Z? Like, how do you see yourself? How do you see what you value and your work? Uh, we could start with you, Deja. Yeah, I mean, when I think of Gen Z, I think one of the obvious markers uh, is our relationship to social media. We have this superpower that no one has ever had before to connect with other people anywhere in the world, anytime. Uh, we're kind of the Google it yourself generation, right? Whether you want to start a nonprofit, uh, you want to learn how to bake a cake, right? There's nothing we haven't been able to learn um, with just the like the powers that live in the palm of our hand. Um, and so I think in so many ways, we are an empowered generation. We're also a generation that grew up during the 2008 financial crisis, right? Who are now coming of age and forming our sense of selves, our networks, um, and our, our lives um, in some of the most uncertain economic times around this pandemic. Um, so many of us have lost years of school, uh, campus time uh, to Zoom University. Um, and I think what we're taking away from these moments of uncertainty in so many ways um, is that a lot of people in power maybe don't know as much as we thought they did. Right. And I think that we're seeing so many young people step in to create the things, the access, the care, the programs that we wish we'd had. Um, so that's that's how I would define Gen Z. OK, yeah, I definitely agree with you on our connection to social media and especially some of the things that we've gone through. That is how people define a generation. So we're the generation that grew up being old enough to remember things after, for example, 9-11, or like you said, the recession um, and everything that we're going through today, the pandemic and, you know, how it changed college. Luckily, I was able to graduate before it all ended, but just knowing so many of my Gen Z friends who were stuck and not sure if they even wanted to continue with school. I think that's just so true. Like we are defined by a lot of the things we went through, which does feed back into any engagement in voting. So, I mean, Anto, you have anything you want to add to that? Yes, uh, definitely. I think this is a great question. First, I must admit that I am the oldest person in this panel, having been born in 1997. And so that puts me, and it's interesting that you brought it up, Judith, but that puts me in an interesting spot and sort of a middle place, closer to what they call a zillennial. Um, this combined with the fact that I grew up with two millennial brothers has really allowed me to see the changes that we're making as Gen Zers. The biggest change to me that is refreshing for most of us and frustrating for the status quo really is that Gen Z isn't about accepting things as they are. And we especially won't accept them just because it is the way they have been for decades. We all are here to disrupt the systems that for too long have been kept in place to push marginalized folks down and to silence us. So I see myself as someone who wants to empower other Gen Z immigrant undocumented and queer youth and amplify their voices. At such young age, Gen Zers are not only advocating for their loved ones, but we're also doing so in creative and engaging ways. For most successful digital campaigns, you will find at least one Gen Zer behind the scenes. On top of that, I think this applies to a lot of Gen Zers who are videographers, country creators, and journalists, but I will speak for myself. I ultimately see myself as a vehicle for storytelling. As someone who can provide the space, the resources, and the tools for directly impacted people to share our stories, 
not for me to have personal gain, right? I want to open those new avenues that will allow folks to have historically being left out of conversations around immigrant justice, racial justice, LGBTQ plus issues, reproductive and abortion rights, gun safety, and so on, to speak from personal experience and shape the future of our democracy. These are my values, and I definitely make sure that my work reflects them every step of the way. Mm, snaps to that, snaps to that. Um, hey, Chelsea. <laughs> How are you? So we have a full panel. Next up, I just want to talk to David, and Chelsea, you can hear this question. David, what do you think defines Gen Z and how do you see your values and your work? Um, thanks for having me. Uh, I think what defines Gen Z is trauma. Um, to be honest, we grew up, a lot of us grew up in the, in, you know, I was born in 2000, 9-11 happened right, you know, just a year after I was born. Um, and we've grown, we've grown up in the wake of Columbine as well. Uh, and a new generation of kids that, unlike really any other before us, has gone through these horrific shootings, not just in our communities on a daily basis, you know, which has been happening since before our generations, but now the one place that many of us considered safe in every, almost every community or thought would, was thought to be the safest place, which is our schools, uh, isn't in almost any community anymore. Um, and whether or not that's because of, you know, people, instances like what happened at my school or the fact that we have more cops in our schools than ever before, and that only that may only make some students uh, that look like me feel safer or actually make them safer because we know that uh, the police do not treat students equally uh, when they don't look like me. Um, and I think what our generation is tasked with is how do we deal with that trauma and how do we address it so that another we don't pass it on to another generation? Because I think this is a product of failed leadership, if, I, if I'm being completely honest. And I think we've had good leaders uh, before. Um, it's just collectively, we didn't have near enough. And that's why we're here right now having to even be on this panel and talking about this stuff because none of us should have to be here right now because we should be able to be college students and enjoying our lives. But we couldn't be because the adults couldn't do their jobs. So now we, as the younger adults, have to do ours um, so that the kids in the future hopefully can just be kids and not be activists. Um, and I think a lot of what we're seeing right now is how do we deal with the changing identity of who America is, you know, at, at a scale larger than it's ever been seen before in American history in terms of our, our racial makeup as a country and things like that, and setting a new precedent of what does it mean to be an American that isn't built around some kind of Eurocentric, you know, entire identity, but really one of uh, a new one uh, that we're all working towards that I think a lot of our country is grappling with, especially older generations, because they, they did not grow up in the same world as, as we did. Um, but I think it's us learning how to cope and deal with that trauma in the societal and individual context that defines our generation more than anything. Mm, David, you're speaking facts. I mean, hearing that you're born in 2000 is kind of like, you know, you're probably one of the most, you know, and Anto, when were you born? I was born in 97, so I'm the older okay. one. Okay, okay. Well, <laughs> and David are the same year. Yes, Deja. Okay, okay. That's okay. I was like, somebody is 2000. Yeah, that's insane. But seeing all that you guys have accomplished in advocacy is crazy. But one thing you did say, David, was that people, I, Gen Z, a lot of times when we talk about what defines us, it is trauma. And then, you know, the specific trauma that you experienced in Florida, the school shooting, you know, look what it's done though. I think that's something that you were able to take and, you know, amplify that messaging. And it's interesting that here we are today, it's 2022 and you're revved back up because th this dilemma has not stopped. Like there has been no solution for it. And that's why we're here today. So thank you so much for coming, David, especially with such a busy weekend for you and Chelsea girl. Um, I want to ask you, you look great. What do you think defines Gen Z, you know, in your values and in your work? And then we'll get into the discussion. Yeah, absolutely. So first and foremost, thank you for having me. I, I have a lot to 
say and process. And I think that we all do. I think that we're in this space where so many of our movements are intersecting. I would say one of the unique qualities about Gen Z is the fact that we're able to do both, right? We can organize online and we understand the power of building community in that space. But I also think that there's something to be said on how we show up in person and how we show up in person for each other, right? And so a lot of my organizing looks like being in the movement space, being on the ground, Freedom Arch NYC was founded um, after the death of George Floyd and realizing that we needed to make sure that our voices were heard and we were centering community in that. And even today, right, um, just finished speaking out of school. So that's why you guys, I'm, I'm outside in, in my car taking this interview. But, you know, I would say that young people are in a place right now where they are both terrified, but also determined, right, to change the narrative, not just for our generation, but the next. And I think that we need to lean into that a lot more. And we need to give Gen Z the opportunity to not simply just be present at tables, but build tables sustainably for us. Mm. Exactly. Okay. Now, when you mentioned the George Floyd protests and everything from 2020, Chelsea, this kind of made me think of this question that I have for you guys. So obviously, Gen Z, we're plugged in on social media, but how do you think social media and the internet have enabled Gen Z to more easily educate one another, you guys educating people, leading organizations, and, you know, leading marches? Um, I'll start with you, Chelsea. How do you think social media has played like a major factor in what you do specifically? Yeah, absolutely. So I would say the biggest thing is being able to control our narrative, right? When we were first on the front lines in New York City, a lot of people were saying that, you know, all the protesters were either looters or rioters, right? This heavy narrative on property. And it was due to the efforts of young people that that narrative changed to then focus on not simply, right, the idea of what do we do next when it comes to damaged property, but what do we do next when it comes to lives? And how do we make sure that we are prioritizing Black bodies over property, right? And we know that there has been a history of that in this country. And so I would say that for us, a lot of our organizing is about retaking the narrative, but then also having very clear call to actions, right? So once we get the world's attention, which we want to say, and how do we make sure that we're doing it in a very inclusive way? And I think one of the frustrations with social media is that a lot of times we are talking in echo chambers because that's how the algorithm is designed. And so our task is to figure out how to break out of that and to reach the people who need this information so that they can mobilize as well. Mm, Interesting that you mentioned the echo chambers, but also the controlling the narrative. So digging a little deeper into that, how do you think um, when it comes to, so with Freedom March, you do things that are along the lines of like the Black Lives Matter um movement you're not blm but it's just you know it's just overall civil rights for black people how do you think twitter and everything like has you know what i mean like with twitter that's honestly where a lot of us get our news now i don't even want to google it anymore like i just go to twitter because i'm like i can get the information and the commentary all in one place and of course people you know the instagram version of i guess twitter you could say is like the shade room so just digging deep into what you've noticed on Twitter, have you noticed that this is actually the place to organize? Is there a certain platform that you use? What, what, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so Twitter, I think I have a love-hate relationship with Twitter. I think most people do, right? I think that it's definitely the platform where if you want to engage in real time and dialogue, that's the place to do it. But I would say that our organizing is very kind of multi-platform, right? So we use Instagram, TikTok, um, Twitter, right, is a great place to get information. I would say the biggest thing is using all of the platforms, right? Even Facebook and through like media partnerships and things of that sort. And so I would say the biggest thing is really being able to to reach people on several different platforms and also being mindful of the demographics on each. And so because we are a youth-led civil rights organization, a lot of our demographic is Gen Z millennials. And so we try to make sure that we kind of target the platforms that best serve um, those demographics, but then also make sure that the information is digestible. And I think that's one of the strong suits of somewhere like Twitter, 
because you have a limited amount of characters to get a lot of information in. And we know that we also live in the age where everyone's attention span is extremely short. And so we only have a certain amount of time to really be able to capture, right? Um, what exactly, again, those call to actions are and next steps across movements. Okay, now speaking of getting attention, we talked about that echo chamber, David. When on the traditional media side, you just released an op-ed. It was with a very popular news brand that some people would argue doesn't align with your beliefs like that, but it seems like you stepped over into that space writing about why gun reform is necessary from different sides of the aisle, right? So can you talk a little about that and then discuss, you know, how social media has helped you with um, March for Our Lives? Yeah, well, the, the op-ed that I just published in Fox News uh, was uh, not a decision that was made lightly, um, considering, you know, the way that a lot of these the news is covered um, with a certain slant. Uh, but I, I think the reality is uh, in 2018, when we got out and demanded action and uh, said, you know, screw this, screw that, uh, we need action. Um, we galvanized our own side, uh, you know, to help point out who we felt that the enemy was um, in terms of the gun lobby specifically. Uh, and we got everybody to our side that's going to be moved by that messaging. What we have to do now is use the moral authority of the moment um, to highlight the fact that these are kids that are dying. They are, you know, they, these are t-ball players. These are honor roll students. These are 10 year olds. They aren't Democrats or Republicans. And we need to figure out what we can agree on, even if small. Because as much as I would like to just pander, you know, to my own side, for example, um, I have to get 10 votes in the Senate. The movement has to get 10 votes in the Senate, or and, and that's going to come not just from Democrats. It physically can't. Um, and that's why I'm trying to do all that I can to get any action, you know. Um, even if it just stops one more shooting from happening, it's worth it. Uh, and that's why I made that decision today uh, to publish that op-ed there. You know, I, I've had many things said about me in that outlet previously that I'm not happy about. I've even famously led boycotts against certain news anchors on that network. Um, but the reality is we have to figure out, you know, where we can find the common ground to act, um, even if small, because I got to do everything I can to stop even just one more Parkland or one more shooting from happening. Um, and it's hard having that mindset because I don't want to have to compromise, you know, my own values. And I don't think I am. I think what I'm doing is just trying to find where we can find common ground while still sticking to my values at the same time. Um, and in regards to how social media has helped March, I think there's a common narrative that social media is always helpful to social movements. And I don't think that's the case. Um, I actually think it can be quite detrimental at times. Um, and what I mean by that is it, it's obviously helpful in the ways that we typically hear of networking and getting people involved and being able to say, you know, we want to do marches and plan them in two weeks. And now we have over 450 around the country and tens of thousands, if not over 100,000 people expected to show up in D.C. alone. Um, and there's no way that people would have ever heard about that, you know, via snail mail or, you know, party lines or whatever it might have been. Um, so it is helpful in that regard in mobilizing people and recruiting people and is spreading information very quickly. Um, but it's also hurtful um, or harmful to the movement, in my view, because it can it can create this i it can let the perfect be the enemy of the good constantly because it's it's easy to point out the flaws with something um when you're organizing and organizing unfortunately in every movement is incredibly messy especially with inexperienced young people who don't know what it's like to have professional boundaries who don't know what it's like not to call people and why they shouldn't call people at two in the morning about uh you know a march you know as a high schooler not knowing what a permit is for example um and I think, unfortunately, what we see a lot of the time in these movements is organizers turn on each other when they are exhausted and they believe that, you know, if they're doing everything that they can, clearly it's some problem within the movement. Um, when a lot of the times, I think a lot of these conversations are best had offline. Um, it's not that they aren't supposed to be had, they should be, but they're best had in person or privately, you know, because we have to remember to put our own interpersonal politics aside um, and have these conversations. And I'm not saying nobody should. It's just sometimes a lot of conversations are better had not in the public square because we as young people are constantly growing and evolving. You know, I've messed up. I've seen other organizers mess up. But as the movement, we have to be adapting and educating ourselves constantly and also giving each other grace, you know, to have that ability to learn, to learn over time because we're learning on the fly. Um, and I think in that way, it can be really harmful to movements 
um, because we are young people. We are learning a lot of the time. I've messed up. You know, we've seen I've seen many organizers mess up. And, you know, I've been on both sides of it where I've been part of the people that would call out people on social media. And I'm ashamed of that. I shouldn't have done that. Um, but it's stuff that I've learned to grow from. And I think in that way, it's it can be really hard to organize through social media because it's easy to point out the flaws in something. It's really hard to build something that's better. Um, and that's in that way, social media is kind of like a the ultimate, it's like a, a destruct, it's like a, an explosive device. It's really good at tearing stuff down and pointing out the flaws of the things. It's not great for necessarily building new things because there is always going to be a dissenting opinion. Um, and everybody, you know, is able to just say that or comment it. Um, and it can make it very hard. At least that's my view. And maybe I'm wrong, but that's just my thought. Okay. That's a very interesting perspective that social media is good at mobilizing people to tear something down an existing structure that's not working for us uh, the new generation or anyone in general or our democracy but it's a hard place to organize and build that's very interesting let's talk about social media as a tool that gen z has an advantage or an ed like a leg up in using so deja i see your tiktok <laughs> Yes. Woo. <laughs> TikTok. Um, you're really good at using social media to connect with people who share similar values as you, you know, advocating for women's rights. So talk about any strategies or any pressure that you feel to, you know, stay up to date with the times to make sure your messaging is being heard. Yeah. I got my start, as you know, organizing around sex education reform, right? Hyper-local, showing up to school board meetings, bringing my friends along, and storytelling. Um, and I grew that work over time as I became a more confident storyteller um, until just a year later when I was 16, I went toe-to-toe -to -toe with my senator around birth control access. And, you know, I shared pieces of my identity, pieces of my story as a woman of color, first-gen American, First, my family to want to go to college, right? Um, someone who experienced hidden homelessness in high school. And I shared these pieces of who I am publicly. Uh, someone recorded it on video, recorded this interaction. And the next morning I woke up and nearly 17 million people had seen it, right? And I was on even footing uh, in the public discourse with a U.S. senator. And I say that to say that the superpower that is social media is about democratizing who gets to hold that narrative, just like Chelsea was saying, right? It's about who gets to be the storytellers, who gets to be at the front. Um, and for so long, it was these major news outlets picking who's the most respectable, right? Not who's the most engaging or who's the most authentic or who is the most impacted. Uh, and I think we're seeing a real shift of that now. And it's translating not only to a shift, I hope, in terms of who is the face of our movements, right? Who is the spokesperson? But, you know, as I've stepped into my role as a strategist, it is also about saying, who is writing that messaging? Who is setting that strategy in place? Um, and, you know, I, I've gone on to work on presidential campaigns. I was the youngest presidential campaign staffer in modern history when I was 19. Um, and in large part, right, I stepped into a digital role, one that did not exist before I got there. Uh, and I think that is the in. That is where young people have the place and the leverage um, to say, I actually have this kind of expertise that no one else has. I am qualified in a way that, you know, your degree just couldn't make you. No one is getting a PhD in TikTok. Uh, young people are the experts. You are the expert. And I think when you stand in that personal expertise, right? When I stood in my expertise as someone who was accessing birth control, who is a young woman of color, right? And I stood in that expertise as someone who was raised using social media, who's had a phone in my hand for forever, um, I've really been able to find my own leadership and to really push people to see it too. Um, and I, I hope that other young people own that power. Mm, okay. Now this question, this next one, um, cause I see the time running down. I'm like, how this conversation is so good, but let's get into what, you know, some of the downsides of uh, Gen Z and social media and the news cycle and things that might be beyond our control. So I know very well that, things in the news cycle tend to just, you know, come and go, right? So right now, David, with everything that's going on with all of these mass shootings, your cause is like front and center, right? Right now. But Chelsea, I can understand, and Anto, there were certain things that happened in 2020 um, that maybe put 
your cause front and center and as the new cycle changes i just want to know what are your thoughts on the tendency of movements to become trends on social media and what would it take for gen z to take internet movements to the streets you guys obviously all know very well what it takes to get people from the screen to the streets and then eventually to the polls so chelsea i'll start with you what are your thoughts on these social media trends that come and go and how does that affect how you how you move <laughs> Yes. So I think that as an organizer, right, there is an understanding of the importance of time and also the importance of urgency. But I will say that that absolutely does not stop the work, right? Just because you don't see Black folks dying on your TV screens anymore does not mean that it's no longer an issue, right? And so I think that for us, it's about how do we get ahead of the conversations that we know need to be had? And how do we also make sure, especially as Black women organizers who are leading in this movement, that our stories do not get lost in the conversations that are currently mainstream, right? And so when we talk about gun violence, it's also important to understand that that's an issue that affects the Black community as well. And on top of that, that is also an issue that when we think about white supremacy as a social construct, right, we can understand that it also has implications on who gets to have guns and what is the purpose of guns to begin with, right? What is the history of that? Um, and so I think that it's really interesting as we have these conversations even around reproductive justice, gun violence, that we see that this is something that disproportionately impacts BIPOC communities. But oftentimes, if it's not labeled as a BIPOC issue, then we are no longer brought into those conversations. And so I think that the onus is on us as an entire movement to make sure that we are inclusive to those conversations. And I will say that we don't just show up and amplify our movements when it is convenient, right, for our organizations or our platforms, but we do so even when it, we don't see it as directly connected. Right. And so an example that I'll give is that for reproductive justice and Roe v. Wade, right, um, a lot of women in the reproductive space reached out to us, white women organizers in particular, to help lead marches. And we were very perplexed by this because in 2020, we did not see these women who claimed that they cared about lives and, and the protection of, of folks showing up for Black bodies in the same way that they are showing up for their bodies. Right. And so I think that that's really important as well to make sure that we are having those conversations and challenging organizers across the country to do better, honestly. Mm. Now, speaking of that, because you mentioned how certain marginalized voices like basically allyship comes when people feel it tends to come when people feel like they're actually involved in something. Mm -hmm. and, or attack, right. When well, you feel directly under attack, that is when you show up you show up to protect yourself and those who look like you. But the truth is that Black folks historically have always showed up for movements. When you talk about the Asian civil rights movement, when you talk about the women's rights movement, when you talk about issues in the LGBTQIA plus space, right? Marsha P. Johnson, a legend. And so it's really important for us to make sure that we bring these conversations into intersectional spaces. And honestly, if you are not an intersectional leader, you should not be leading. Mm, now, speaking of, I want to get to you, Anto, because how many people in this country obviously identify with being an undocumented immigrant or even having undocumented immigrant family members, right? So when it comes to this type of organizing that you're doing with um, United We Dream, how do you feel people who just kind of feel a little disconnected from the communities that you organize for, how do you feel social media helps you, you know, draw them into your cause? Do you feel that people don't show up as much for, you know, what you are all about? Like, just, just tell me what you think about that, because I've always wondered if people really have the capacity to show up for undocumented immigrants because so many people don't feel connected to it. But go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, Judith. Uh, I think the reality, like Chelsea mentioned, it is that so much of these things are interconnected. And we do have folks who um, will only step up when they feel threatened themselves. But when we think about social movements, especially those led by young people, it is important to name that these are often organizing efforts that take a lot of long, hard, sustained work. We can look at the immigrant youth movement um, and, and we join this fight often because we are directly impacted. We have a stake in the game. 
And so in order to move behind just surface level engagement with this movement or with any movement, we must ensure that we are active participants. And to do that, we have to move beyond being an activist and into being organizers, engaging in difficult conversations with friends, with family, with neighbors, understanding that immigrant justice is racial justice. Racial justice is LGBTQ plus rights right? And getting other people to take up our issue and getting them involved as well. It can be something as easy as joining an established movement organization like United with Dream, or even organizing a walkout in your school for an issue that you care about. But this is essential for us to combat the overexposure to violence in the media and thus being desensitized to that violence, and then push our demands outside of our screens. We have to see the streets and the polls as extensions of the work that we do on social media. So these platforms can serve as vehicles and move our demands forward as opposed to getting them stuck online. Um, we need to understand that digital and underground activism are not opposites and they can and they must support and elevate each other, right? We are not reinventing the wheel. Um, Chelsea mentioned Marsha P. Jensen, and so Marsha P. Jensen and Sylvia Rivera, a Black trans woman and a Latina trans woman, for example, were the pioneers of the LGBTQ plus race movement back in the 60s. They knew that immigrant justice is racial justice. They knew that trans people of color have always been at the forefront of the fight, and Black trans people. Then they definitely knew that pride has always been anti-enforcement, and that means police, and that means size, and that means CDP. So it's not about reinventing the wheel. There are generations who have paved the way for us already. However, it is much easier now to learn about these causes that you care about and to educate others about what you believe in. From places like TikTok to Instagram, we're seeing how folks are using their social media platforms to share or reshare important information. And last thing I'll say on this is that beyond this accessibility piece that is so, so important to reaching higher audiences and energizing them to take action, Social media has also functioned as a powerful connector that reminds us that we're not alone. As a queer Venezuelan immigrant, it is through Twitter, it is through Instagram, or even TikTok that I have found community myself and that I have felt seen. And that is what gives Gen Zers hope to me. And that's what makes us connect. And that's what makes us continue to use social media in this way. And it is the feeling of being in community, the feeling that I belong and that we can fight for the liberation of all of our communities, not just some of them. Mm, that's, that's, that's really the key thing is people developing a sense of community with people who don't look like them, whose issues are not their own because it's really all of ours. And for that reason, I do want to kind of wrap this up and get into how we can go from the streets, which you guys know very well you run the streets to the screens which you know the engagement on social media to the polls so whoever wants to go i'm sorry we do have under three minutes left so try to keep your answers limited to 20 30 seconds but what do you think our government misses when attempting to communicate um to our the younger generation like and just in general um what our government is failing to do as far as engaging Gen Z or what they're possibly doing correctly. But overall, what do you say is your plight in trying to get the people that you engage to actually vote? Because honestly, Gen Z, we voted 11% higher than like other age groups. You know, we, over half of us were in, uh, we were registered to vote in 2020 and over half of us actually showed up to the polls, which might be one of the highest numbers in modern history. So whoever wants to go, just speak on what you think needs to be done to get more Gen Zers out to the polls. I will just very quickly say this, that I think that Gen Z is a place where we are frustrated. Um, and I think that it's really important for us to remember that Gen Z is so diverse, right? There are folks who are abolitionists. There are folks who believe in reformation. There are folks who believe in completely reimagining these systems altogether. And what I will say is that when we are given the opportunity to create change, we show up to do that. And so we call BS a lot easier than I think previous generations. And so I think that we just need elected officials and leaders to show up with the same energy that we are putting forth. And that will ultimately lead to us 
creating right a more equitable world that includes Gen Z, but everyone, because realistically speaking, we can only do so much. Um, and then the last thing I would add is that we are seeing actually a push for a lot of Gen Z folks to become elected officials, um, running for office, taking up space in that way. Shout out to our future POTUS, Deja. And so, you know, <laughs> I think that there's definitely a lot of opportunities moving forward for us to make sure that we are elevating the voices of Gen Z folks who are trying to not only take it to the streets, but also to the polls and also to these rooms in Congress and the Hill, right, where those changes need to be made. Mm. Okay, so elected officials, Gen Z is actually starting to get into politics, and then maybe more Gen Z people do identify with them. Um, I see the time running down. I literally wish we could talk more. And actually, we do get to on Monday on stage. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, make sure you see us in person. On Monday, we'll be doing this again. I know, David, you have a lot to do um, traveling around with March for Our Lives. So you won't be there, but thank you so much for everyone just being a part of this. You guys had so many great things to say and I'm it's an honor to be here talking with you guys. So thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. We're a nonprofit that gets Gen Z out to vote. Next slide. And so Up To Us was founded about two years ago, just before the election, as a way to get Gen Z out to vote. We historically haven't voted at as high rates as our older counterparts have. And so we recruited about 40 people, mostly online, mostly young people, to help us put together our first uh, big campaign. And um, can you go to the next slide? A little bit more about our approach. So we actually do a lot of qualitative and quantitative research. Uh, before we actually do anything else to make sure that we know how to uh, move the needle with Gen Z on the issues that we're specifically trying to tackle. And once we do that, we tap into a deep network of partners, creators, and talent um, that we then use to create campaigns that actually resonate with our generation. And once we roll them out, we measure them in real time to make sure that they're working as, an, as intended and to find areas where we can improve them um, in, in uh while we're, while we're actually rolling them out um, to make sure that we're being as efficient as possible. Can you skip two slides? And so a little bit more about our impact in 2020. One more slide, please. A little bit more impact about our impact in 2020. So we registered 44,000 people to vote in just under 14 days at about 12 times less of a cost than uh, traditional voter registration methods. And our approach was then taken by our partner organizations to register um, just under, I think, 200,000 people to vote. And we also worked with some bigger celebrities to help create content to mobilize their audiences to vote as well. Um, next slide, a bit more about the specific system that we used. We partnered with this company called Impactive to develop out a very simple gamified voter registration system. And what that means is that just for checking your voter registration status, you got a entry to win a prize. In our case, it was a Tesla or a chance to chat with your favorite celebrity. And we also tried to make this entire experience really simple, just like a checkout flow you might see on Amazon or on Apple Pay or something like that. Next slide. Our partners are uh, critical to everything that we do, and I'm very grateful to them. They saw the value in the work that we are doing, and they opened doors for us when we were just getting a start and we had no experience or expertise in this space. Um, so I just wanted to give them a, a huge thank you. And then the last slide, please. And so I would say it really is up to our generation to fight for the future that we want to. Just because we may not vote at as high of a rate as older generations doesn't mean we're disengaged. It means that we have the most opportunity to make our generation's voice heard. And so I'd ask that everyone support young leaders in this space working to mobilize their peers. It's the best way that we're going to increase voter turnout and protect our democracy. And I just want to thank all of you for all the work that you've been doing on this issue as well. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back from lunch. Thank you for being a part of the inaugural Culture of Democracy Summit. Uh, we are so excited to have you here for the second half of our programming. There are some amazing speakers and panelists lined up this afternoon. Um, and so we're about to get started. I am Laura Miller, the Managing Director of Advocacy and Campaigns at When We All Vote. After a historic turnout in 2020, we have been working hard as a team to make voting more accessible for all. Since then, over 20,000 people, many I'm sure who are listening today, have taken action with us in the fight for voting rights. And in January of 2022, we launched, along with 30 other voting rights organizations, we released the Fight for Our Vote pledge in the New York Times. We are united in this conviction to organize and turn out voters in the 2022 midterms this year and make our democracy work for all of us. Collectively, we've committed to recruiting and training at least 100,000 volunteers, registering more than a million new voters, organizing at least 100,000 Americans to contact their senators to continue the call for voting rights, recruiting thousands of lawyers, committing to educate vote and committing to educate voters across this country so that they can vote safely in their states. We hope that everyone will join us in this fight by going to whenweallvote.org. Now, I want to introduce you to Christina Sinsu Ramirez, the president of NextGen. Christina and NextGen have been incredible champions and partners of When We All Vote for voting rights and making sure that young people all across this country are able to make their voices heard. Thank you so much for being with us today, Christina. Passing it to you. Thanks so much. And it's good to be here with everyone. So every day I get to wake up and defend the power of democracy. I lead the country's largest youth voting rights organization, Next Gen America. Together, we've registered 1.4 million young people. And last election, we helped mobilize one in nine young people that turned out, helping lead to the largest youth voter turnout in American history. At NextGen, we know that real democracy has always been a radical idea and that it has and will always be a threat to the powerful and elite. Because real democracy means there are no kings, there are no despots. Real democracy means the people rule. And our greatest needs and collective desires are met by a government that we get to build together. Because real democracy, we all know, is the great equalizer, where all of our votes, regardless of race, belief, religion, gender, or income, carries the same weight. We know our country hasn't always extended that right equally to all of us. It's taken organizing of suffragists, black leaders in the civil rights movement and young people and many others to make our country live up to its promise to guarantee all people the same rights. Every day I carry that knowledge of that history with me when I get to help register and mobilize young people across the country to make their voices heard and make change on the issues that matter to them. But we also all know that that right is under threat for many Americans and especially for young people of color. Now, I live in Texas, and we've seen an onslaught of voter suppression bills that have tried to undercut that power, the power of the people's rule, especially for young people of color. But I want to remind us that ultimately we hold the power. And that's what we did during the Texas legislative session. We wanted to remind young people of their tremendous power. So while the state legislature was discussing which bills they could pass to try and undercut our voting rights, we took in dozens of young organizers into the Texas Capitol with backpacks filled with over a quarter million rose petals, representing the number of young people of color that turn 18 every single year in our state. And we released them in the Texas Rotunda while 19-year-old Tori Balitierra sang Amazing Grace. And we did it as a symbol of our power and a message to legislators that if they wanted to suppress the power of our vote, that we were gonna fight back against their ugliness with our beauty, against their darkness with our light. That we know that ultimately the arc of history is long and it does bend towards justice, but we have to be the ones to bend it. And that's what we're trying to do at NextGen with the full weight and power of 70 million young people representing the largest and most diverse generation in American history. So to all the young people listening, I hope you'll join us because at NextGen, we aren't voting and organizing to go back to supposedly better days because we know we have yet to live our best days, that we have yet to become everything that the country as big, diverse, complicated, and beautiful as this one can be. So I'm now excited to introduce 
actress and powerhouse Yvette Nicole Brown, and just honored to be on this panel with other amazing organizers that are doing incredible work. Together, we have the power to build a democracy for all of us. Hey everybody, I'm Yvette Nicole Brown and I am overjoyed to welcome you to the Culture of Democracy Summit. I am so excited to introduce the next group of speakers for a conversation that's very close to my heart. Faith-led change, how the spiritual community inspires movements. Life has so many ups and downs, especially lately. And the only thing that has kept me together is my faith and I am not alone. Faith has also been at the epicenter of all major social movements and it's only through faith that we can change the hearts and minds of people and find the necessary common ground that will strengthen our communities and propel us forward. The great Malcolm X once said, my faith in God is such that I am not afraid. And it's this very courage and resolve which can only be attained through spirituality that is needed to navigate the storms that life throws at us. And one of the most important elements of faith is community. And the communities that faith leaders are able to build are capable of moving mountains. I am so honored to share space with this visionary group that together inspire millions of people through the power of faith. First, please welcome award-winning author and chairperson of the Shabazz Center, daughter of none other than the great Malcolm X himself, the fabulous Dr. Ilyasa Shabazz. Next is the great Reverend Dr. William Joseph Barber II. He is president and senior lecturer of the Repairs of the Breach and co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign. Next is the awesome Bishop Reginald Thomas Jackson, the presiding prelate of the 6th Episcopal District AME Church. And last, but not least, today's amazing moderator, Latasha Brown, co-founder of Black Voters Matter. Enjoy. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the waters. We shall not be moved. Greetings. I wanted to start in the spirit of that song because I think that captures what our discussion will be about. That many may know that song on any Sunday morning in the Deep South or in churches all around this country. You may hear that song, but also if you on the front lines and movements from Selma stretching to Texas to all over this nation, you would have heard that same song. And why is that the case? It's because at the intersection of faith, of the faith community, has always been, in terms of even the social justice movement, there has been a faith, there's been an element of the faith community that has been there, that has served as leaders, as visionaries. And part of the reason why I think that has been the case, and I'm so excited about this discussion, is because it's within, within the faith community that we're literally talking about universal brotherhood and sisterhood. That is within the faith community that many of the leaders that stand at that intersection of social justice are actually being able to recognize that movements are beyond the politics in the moment, but it's really around us claiming our humanity, for us to stand in the space of love, for us to stand in the space of being unified with our brotherhood and our sisterhood, and for us to stand in the space that we're really being reflective of how can we move forward as a community. And so in light of that, what I want to do is I want to jump right into this conversation with three amazing faith leaders that I love, respect, admire, and work with um, in various roles. And so I want to start, I want to come with you to you, um, Bishop Jackson, I want to start with you around the question around how has faith played a critical role in the biggest social justice movements that have happened? You're on mute, Re Reverend Bishop Jackson. Let me say again, good afternoon. Glad to be with the panelists and for this opportunity. Let me say it is faith which has really fueled the churches or the spiritual community's movement on issues of social justice. You know, in the Lord's Prayer, which all of us know, uh, Jesus utters some words which motivate and shape uh, my determination and my activism. And what he says is, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. And that's what we are about. We are about kingdom work. Injustice requires kingdom work. Unrighteousness requires kingdom work. And so the faith community responds to the need for justice and for equality and for fairness. And so that's the faith that motivates and moves us and nothing for the advancement, especially of people of color in this country has occurred 
without the leadership of the faith community. We, when we think about social justice movements, we also think about, you know, the element of how how have faith has played a role, you know, but oftentimes it has been the merging and the brotherhood and the sisterhood of many different religious beliefs and many different um, faiths that have brought together and been the I want you to share your perspective around how faith has played a role in social justice movements in this nation. Who's your question? Oh, is that who's the question for? That was for you, Dr. Shabazz. Oh, okay. You, yeah. Yes. Well, first, you know, it is it's such an honor to see you again, um, Sister Latasha, to see this really amazing panel. Um, you know, I think it's harder to identify a social movement where faith did not play a role than to find one where it did. I think that the civil rights movement is the perfect example of the importance of interfaith action to move the needle of history uh, forward. Um, Christians, Muslims, Jews, believers, non-believers, we all joined hands to change the way the world worked. Granted, they didn't always agree back in the 60s on the methods or outcomes, but they knew that change was imminent. And if we're honest about injustice, if we're honest about uh, intimidation, corruption, terror, one cannot talk about Malcolm's work apart from his faith. Um, it was his faith that enabled him to speak truth to power. In the 1950s, you had young American people who were marching, demonstrating, protesting, much like the young people today, wanting integration, asking for civil rights. And Malcolm came along just in his 20s and said, we demand our human rights as your brother. We demand our human rights as ordained by God. He was anchored in his faith. He introduced a human rights agenda to the civil rights movement. My father said something really beautiful like, if I can die having brought any light, having exposed any meaningful truth that would help destroy the uh, the malignant of the cancer uh, that's malignant in the body of America, then all the credit is due to God and the mistakes are his own. I think that that is quite indicative of, uh, of these movements. You know, as you were sharing around how there has been kind of this intersection, both you and Bishop have shared that there hasn't been any social movements. There's very, very few social movements that there has not been an element of faith. And I want to come to you, um, Bishop Barber, because you are actually leading a national movement that is literally centered the poor people's campaign and poor people's movement. You are co-leading a movement that is centered in in, in the, the beliefs that undergird um, your faith. And I want to for you to share why do you, I want to come to the question around when we're talking about a social justice movements, that there's an element of faith. Help us understand why. What is the role? Why, how, why is every single social movement, there's some element of faith that we find in? You're on mute, um, Bishop Barber. Thank you so much, Latasha, and to the other guests that are here. You know, I am with the Poor People's Campaign, the National Call for Moral Revival, we have 42 coordinating committees around the country, nearly a half million people in our action network, and over 2,000 clergy of all different uh, faiths in this country. And then last 2020, we touched 2 million voters in 10 states uh, around an agenda to address systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, denial of health care, the war economy, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism and white supremacy. And uh, we're having a big mass gathering on June 18th, this next Saturday. But you cannot read the Quran. Uh, you cannot read the Bible, truthfully read it, uh, uh, the Old and New Testaments, uh, without understanding that the majority of what it is about is first honoring God and then love and justice. I mean, there's no way any other reading of the scriptures is a form of heresy. Uh, that is why, you know, recently there was a Bible put out called the Poverty and Justice Bible. They went through and marked all of the passages that had to do with justice and how we treat the poor. They cut all of those passages out and the Bible fell apart. It was no more. And so we have to understand that to say Jesus or to say Allah or to say 
um, Yahweh and not in that same breath say how we care about the least of these, how we care about one another, how we care about policy is, is, is to be inauthentic as a person of faith. There's a great scripture in the Bible, Isaiah 10, that says, woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights, make women and children their prey. Jesus started talking about the, the, um, the, the, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor. And in the Hebrew scriptures, Latash, the word vote and the word voice are the same words, the same words. So that voting, for instance, is not just something man gave us, but something that God literally um, ordained. But we also have to make, be careful here. And, I, and many times the faith community has failed. It failed Malcolm. It failed Martin. Martin was put out of his own denomination. Mm-hmm. Almost every faith community wrote resolutions against Dr. King when he took on racism and poverty and militarism. We cannot walk past that. And oftentimes, even when we talk about faith, we have black panels as though there haven't been white people of faith, you know, because in Selma, it was white and black people that came to Selma. In the reconstruction after slavery, it was black and white clergy that came together. Uh, so we have to be, it's, it's a curious history, you know. Uh, we have to recognize that there's been always been a remnant, but it has never been the whole cloth uh, that has engaged. In fact, if you read the letter from the Birmingham jail, G, uh, uh, G, Martin was criticizing the church, black and white. <laughs> and when, the, when, when he preached a sermon about uh, those four little girls dying and the death of Jimmy Lee Jackson, he said, who caused these deaths? And he said, every preacher that chooses to stay behind the stained grass windows of their church and refuse to get involved. So we cannot have some glorified vision uh, that is kind of like always been the church. What we've had is remnants, both in, in various faith of people who took their faith seriously and were willing to put their lives on the line. Because if you say standing up for justice is a matter of faith, you're at the same time saying it's worth your life. That's what you're really saying. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Bishop Barbara, to actually even build on that. You know, as I was hearing you respond to the question and what you all have said collectively, there is a particular role for the church. There's a particular role for our mosques. There's a particular role for these places of faith um, that they've played and that they continue to play. And I would love to, I'm going to start with you, um, Sister Shabazz, Dr. Shabazz, around since you are leading a center, the Shabazz Center, right? When we're thinking about how those institutions um, serve in our communities to have their ear to the ground. How do they serve in a way that literally um, they can actually identify uh, the needs of our community and how should they, those that are listening right now, you know, how how do we use those, how do we maximize how we use those places of worship in those institutions? Well, in the age of social media, they say we're experiencing a crisis of empathy. And I think it's hard to see a brother or a sister with whom we disagree as our brother or our sister. Mm -hmm. Uh, Churches, mosques, faith centers, they have the potential to serve as an antidote to our collective empathy deficit disorder. If faith leaders really listen to their worshipers, they can learn about their community needs. We remember in the Malcolm X movie where my father had organized Uh, hundreds of people at the police uh, department. It was in 1957. He was the national spokesperson for the Nation of Islam. He was the minister at the local Harlem Mosque. And there was this young man named Hinton Johnson who was witnessing police brutality. He commented that this wasn't Alabama, it was New York. And the police turned on him, beating an innocent young man for speaking, and he suffered permanent brain damage. And so my father was connected with the community, and he trained members of the mosque to advocate for their community. They created a phone tree, and I think this was quite genius. Each member was always responsible for two members. And though the police originally rejected their appeals, When the entire mosque showed up in the hundreds for their brother, they eventually not only allowed my father to see his brother, Hinton Johnson, but they also provided proper medical attention. And I think the expression, 
um, all politics is local also applies to faith leaders and, and the needs of our community. Thank you. You know, that makes me um, think about what you said in terms of the role around protection, the role of being able to provide need, those needs in that moment and really be able to identify those needs. And so with that, I want to come to you, Bishop. I want you, um, um, Bishop Jackson, I want to come to you around, you know, as we're thinking about how can we actually in a moment that what we're seeing right now, we're seeing a lot of discontent in many ways. We're hearing people um, um, in, in different parts of the country. I've heard young people, older people, some that are feeling a sense of this has been a heavy two years. This has been a heavy three years with the pandemic going on, with all the things that we've been seeing around racism and other pieces. And so kind of the role that the church and institutions of faith can actually share in this particular moment. I would be interested in hearing kind of your perspective about that. Well, you know, this is a time which really is going to demonstrate whether or not the faith community is genuine. Uh, for example, this is a time when we need people of faith not only to be priestly, but also to be prophetic. Uh, people like uh, Bishop Barber and all, uh, my sister Shabazz, you know, there's a passage in the book of Amos which comes to my mind almost every single day. It's an indictment on us because really since the 60s, the church and the faith community have not taken the leadership mm. that we ought to lead. There's a patch of Amos, and this is what it says, and it haunts me every day. Mm. It says, I hate, I despise your feast days. I have no regard for your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Take away from me the noise of your musical instruments and the sound of your songs I will not hear, but let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. There is a praise that turns God off, praise that honors him with our lips, mm. but fails to provide service to him in kingdom work. That's the challenge for the faith community in these times we live now, because the challenge is there's a crisis of conflicting voices coming from the faith community. For example, you have evangelical Christians, 10,000 of them ministers signed a petition that said any talk of social injustice is an injustice to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That is sheer foolishness. Mm -hmm. And so we have a challenge in this period to demonstrate that the church is not only genuine, but faithful to God and what he's called us to do and be. Oh, thank you, Bishop Jackson. I want to pick up from that. Um, I want to come to you, Bishop Barber. I want to pick. So given that, and I saw you as 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 Bishop Jackson was talking, I saw you um, share or shake your head as in, um, in affirmation of what he was saying and sharing. And I'm interested in you because I know that you built this movement. You have been one of the leaders of this movement that has been a faith centered movement of multi um, multi different um, um, faith leaders. And in this space where what we're seeing is we are seeing these confusing messages. What do we do? How do we, what do we do in this moment? How do we actually get faith leaders to act, really be able to take leadership in this space of, of movements to actually be able to drown out some of the information that is actually against the faith premises around the, having universal brotherhood, a really a certain our humanity. In this moment, what do you think is the opportunity and how do we address that in this moment to get faith leaders engaged in our movements? Well, Dr. Shabazz, uh, said something, and both Bishop Jackson and I want to try to synthesize. She said a crisis of empathy. That's right. That means people are, are not seeing, or if they are seeing, they don't give a damn. Excuse me. But then Reverend Jackson said that great Bishop Jackson, he quoted that great scripture that basically says that the worship style of the church was blinding the people so much so that it, it discontented God. God said, you, you're doing stuff, but that's not what I want. You're not looking at the right thing. And as I was shaking my head because Bishop Jackson, I was going back up a few verses where the Lord actually gives a plan, Latasha. Mm -hmm. And Amos in Amos chapter five, before you get to the part that Bishop quoted, says, God says, I'm looking for a remnant. Mm -hmm a remnant that will go in the street and cry loudly and lament and tell the truth and expose what is going on and show how bad it is and refuse to be comforted. And then it says in the Message Bible, and then I will come and help you. 
So the, po the point is, we as the faith community, first of all, must put a face on the pain and, and, and shift this moral narrative mm -hmm. and more, make people see what's really going on. You know, we can't have a million people die from COVID and, and uh, poor people die at a rate of two to five times higher. And we haven't even had a week of mourning, not one week in this country. The church has to lead that. That's why we're doing a big mourning piece on the 17th this week. We can't have 32 million people making less than a living wage and 87 million people uh, without health care or uninsured or 700 people dying a day from poverty and 140 million poor and low-wealth people in this country today. That's 43% of the nation. That's 60.9% of black people and, and, and 66 million white people. Part of what we have to do is put a face on the pain. Mm -hmm. Then we have to shift this moral narrative then we have to put before the nation an alternative vision and remind the nation that you're under judgment if you don't care for the least of these. And then we have to build power. I like to call it, Tasha, SOS. You know, you send out an SOS. The church has to stir the soul of the nation, stir the soul of the people. That's the first thing we've got to do. And then, oh, we've got to operationalize our people's participation. You know, the church has to engage in various ways to make sure people are taking advantage of all their rights. And then the last thing is, though, we have to stand for the rights and the survival rights of people. You know, uh, health care, minimum wage ought to be, we push them not just as things but or policies, but as rights. But we also have to push candidates because a lot of the candidates really don't want to deal with poor and low wealth people, which, by the way, as I close, poor and low wealth people now make up 32 percent of the electorate in this country, 45 percent of the, 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 the uh, in battleground state. So any candidate or party that's not addressing the issue of poverty and low wealth is, 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 is morally inconsistent, uh, 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 morally indefensible, constitutionally inconsistent politically insensitive and economically insane. Mm -hmm. And part of what the church has to do is say to the nation, if you don't care about the least of these and social justice, you're never really going to be all that you could be as a nation. Mm. Oh, thank you so much. That's so rich. Paul is so rich around what you share, because I do believe that what we see is we've seen um, the space where the faith community for many communities has been the anchor of holding the humanity has been the anchor. And then what we have not seen, what we're seeing now in this, in the midst of what's going on right now is that we know that we're being bombarded with, with misinformation and disinformation that has actually been targeted towards certain communities, um, poor and low wealth communities, black communities, communities of color to really be able, what we're seeing is this, this, this growing, um, this flood of misinformation, that disinformation that, you know, I, uh, most recently, a, a couple of weeks ago, about a month ago, I went to, it was interesting, I went to a visit to Dubai. And when I was in Dubai, I was asking people around how they were feeling because everybody seemed like they were so light. And as I was sharing with people around what were they feeling heavy, they were like, no, we're not feeling heavy. And initially I thought, I was like, well, maybe I'm just not talking to the right people. And so what I realized is the whole time I was there and I went all over the country to UAE, I, people were at a different place in terms of this sense of heaviness and hopelessness that some of this that we're feeling in this country, what I had assumed was a global position, what I realized was a very Western position, that right. literally those of us in America, in the West, that we have so centered American exceptionalism, right, that in fact, what we're seeing right now, kind of this, 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 this discontent, I think that is part of it. And part of it is, I do believe that we're dealing with psychological warfare in the sense of misinformation and disinformation that people are getting on all kinds of platforms, no matter where you are on the political spectrum, that actually are lending itself to this, this feeling of discontentment, this feeling of, 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 of doom and gloom. And so given that, you know, I want to ask you all, I'm going to come to you, um, Dr. Shabazz, around in this moment, when we're seeing misinformation and disinformation and polarization, how do we build hope? As, as faith leaders, how do we even engage other faith leaders in this moment right now to build the kind of hope we need to go to the next level, to go to higher ground? Well, uh, you know, when I'm in, I just recently was in Chicago, and every time I'm there, I, I go to see 
uh, Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III. Um, you know, what I love about his sermon is that it's always encouraging and it's always positive. I love that he's addressed some of this misinformation with the stained glass images in his church by ensuring proper representation of biblical characters are there. Um, I think we need to distinguish misinformation from polarization. You know, combating misinformation can lead to increased polarization. Sometimes it seems we'd rather live in a lie than face the truth. My father spoke truth to power, insisting that America live up to her promise of liberty and justice for, for all of its people. Uh, we can't avoid being truth tellers simply to keep the peace. The absence of conflict does not imply the presence of peace. Learning the truth of our humanity for all of, you, you know, for all people, not just Black people, but for all people, is an opportunity to instill in our young people values of honesty, forgiveness, love, compassion, truth. Um, you know, it's much like when Michelle Obama says, when they go low, we go high. Mm. Thank you so much. I, you know, in building on that, you made me think about what my grandmother used to always say. And it, it's, it's taken a while for me to really understand the truth in it, but it is. And it's from the scriptures. Um, it's from the Bible. And, and she would always say, baby, the truth will set you free. You know, and, and as a child, I thought that the truth was going to keep me out of trouble. Right. What would almost make me get in trouble. And then I would have to like, I would have to fess up because I would feel some sense of, um, I needed to to share, you know, share something um, so that I wouldn't be in trouble, but that there is an element of uh, that if we look at what is happening with misinformation and, and disinformation, I want to come to you, um, um, Bishop Barbara, I want to come to you around this whole belief around that some faith communities hold around the power and the role of truth. In this moment, as we're seeing the, that as we're moving forward in social movements, what is the role of literary truth or the role, the role of the faith community as we're talking about being able to address this disinformation and this political polarization that we're witnessing in this nation right now? Well, you know, there was a writer one time that said truth spoken in the time of lies in itself is revolutionary. Mm. So we are in a battle, even in faith. Uh, you heard Bishop Jackson mention what uh, so-called uh, extreme white evangelical. I don't call folk evangelicals like that because I'm an evangelical. I call it heresy. And I, what I mean by it, I'm an evangelical, I'm a Jesus evangelical. Mm -hmm. And his evangelicalism started with good news to the poor. So if you don't start there and then claim to be an evangelical, I'm trying to figure out what, what, where, where are you coming from? And I think going back to your grandmama's state, she said, your, your grandmama probably said, and you... He, and you shall know the truth. And it shall say the, the truth. truth. But you got to know it. You got to know it. And part of what has happened, even in our society, which is why we have this crisis of caring, and it is because people just don't know. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons why we're having the mass poor people's low wage workers assembly moral march on Washington on June eighteenth. People don't know. People don't know. That it's, it's so much work and money spent to hide the truth. They don't know there are 140 million people in this country poor and low wealth. They think it's 39 million. They don't know before COVID, 700 people were dying a day from poverty. They don't know 87 million people are uninsured or underinsured. They don't know 4 million people get up every morning and can buy unleaded gas and can't buy unleaded water. The truth of the matter is, what if people knew? You know why people are so concerned about Ukraine? Because they see it. They see it, that the president, when he came to speak to our Congress, you know what he did? He played a video. He said, I'm going to let you make you see this. And part of what we have to do is, is, is to get the truth out, is make people see it. And then attack, attack the lies, for instance, the lie of scarcity. It is a lie. There's no way in the world you can be a country of over $22 trillion gross domestic product and claim scarcity. In fact, Joseph Stiglitz, who's a Nobel Peace Prize economist, says that we ask the wrong question when it comes to fixing issues that could easily be fixed, like poverty and living wage and health care. He said the reason we don't fix them is because the wrong question is asked. And the question is, how much does it cost rather than how much does it cost to leave it like it is? Mm -hmm. How much death does it cost? How much does it cost in real dollars? For instance, child poverty that Marion Wright Elliman has showed us we could fix 
by just taking 2% of our federal budget and putting it in programs that work, cost us a trillion dollars for not fixing. So part of what we have to do is have movements that give people the truth. And then lastly, people have to know the truth of their power. You know, most people, I've gone all over this country from Appalachia to Alabama, Latasha, and when we tell people that poor people now represent 32% of the electorate and 45% in battleground states, and that in 15 states, if just 1% to 20% of poor people who didn't vote the last time would organize around their own values and vote, they could determine who sits in the presidency, who in the Senate, and in the governors. And they say, what? We didn't know that. We thought, we thought. And, and, and the point is, I said, that's right. If people knew the truth, that most poor people don't vote against their own interests. They just don't vote because no politician got, go see them. Hardly any preachers go see them. And so there's so much truth. And lastly, one of the things I think we have to wrestle with when it comes to truth and, and, and even about hope, you know, hope is not going around the despair. It's going through it and, and, and being willing to suffer underneath it to change it. But one truth that I think we all have to sit down with and I say this in homage, Sister Shabazz, to your father, is what was left that we didn't finish. See, I'm, I'm tired of going to commemorations. Like, you know, they have a commemoration for Martin. Commemorate. I don't think Martin and Malcolm would want us to be commemorating. I think they would want us to be taking up the mantle <laughs> and saying, okay, when they, because they didn't just stop work. You see, we have to, re they, they didn't just like, okay, I'm retiring. They were killed. So stuff was left. And so the real truth we have to wrestle with is what was left undone. That's why we took out the Poor People's Campaign, because it wasn't just stopped. It was killed. It was assassinated. It was murdered. It's not like it was done. And for 50 years, people just walked away from that campaign as though it didn't matter. Well, we, part of the truth we have to wrestle with is what was left and what is still left. And that truth then tells us what our job is, because at least our job ought to be finishing. If nothing else, that ought to be part of our job. Oh, thank you for that. Um, it comes with the misinformation, you know, that shared of, of, of Dr. King, the misinformation of Malcolm, so that it isn't easy for us to just simply continue and take the, bat the baton to higher heights. That's right. That's, That's right. right. And so, so given that, I, I want to come to you, to Bishop Jackson, to, to really build on that. Um, we do have this environment right now where we are literally seeing um, uh, we're 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 seeing misinformation not only um, be put out in the atmosphere for all of us, but we're seeing certain communities targeted, right? We we're seeing. Um, I know in Georgia, there's been an effort that we've identified where, where, where black men have been targeted. We, we're seeing where young people are being targeted. We're seeing where some communities are being pit against other communities, almost in the, like in the, we're in some oppression Olympics. And so given that, given the environment that we're in right now, it's something that, that Dr. Barber, you said, you said, we got to get the truth to the people. And so my question to you is really around twofold. One, in this moment, as people of faith, how do we get the truth to the people? And secondly, in light of that, we are also, we got all of this misinformation and disinformation. How do we help people be able to dis discern? How do we help people to be able to distinguish for what is the truth and what is being used to exploit the pain and discontent on many in our communities are feeling right now? You know, first thing it is critically important and we understand that misinformation is a deliberate part of their agenda. It's their agenda to keep us misinformed. My concern is too many faith leaders don't, don't understand how important their position is. Every week, faith leaders stand before hundreds, thousands, and millions of people in this country. And people want to hear something. Too many of our people are like those in the desert. That's and right. they want to be fed. They want to be informed. We need to take advantage of the pulpits and the platforms that we have to give our folk the truth. You see, because part of the message is, for example, as we prepare for the November election, part of this strategy of some mm -hmm. is to keep giving us so much misinformation that we'll become discouraged, we'll become depressed, we'll become frustrated and say, hell, I ain't voting. 
They didn't deliver for me, and I voted for them last time. Well, the message needs to get out. For example, why the George Floyd policing reform bill didn't pass? Because there was a deliberate effort to sabotage it. So it's important that we deliver a message to our people that is the truth. The second thing is you cannot separate hope from faith. You see, you can really determine whether or not folk got some faith by two things. One, whether or not they're willing to do the work. And number two, by whether or not they give up. If you give up, you don't have hope because hope and faith go together. The reason I can remain hopeful is because I got faith. And one of the, th the final thing we really need to understand is you're going to go through something in this life. Jesus was blunt and honest. In this world, you're going to go through trouble. You know, there was a song we used to sing when I was young, and if I could sing, I'd sing it for y'all. David, since I can't sing, I'll just tell you. Uh, the song we used to sing, I'm coming up the rough side of the mountain. Yes. Well, that says to me a lot of folks really don't know where our benefit is. For example, have you ever tried to climb the smooth side of a mountain? But on the rough side, you got something to hold on to. On the rough side, you got something to pull yourself up. So we're coming up the rough side of the mountain, but that's the side we're able to go up. So in the midst of all that we're going through, we've got to hold on to hope and keep the faith and give our people the truth so that collectively we can help our people move forward. Latasha, can I mention one point with Bishop Jackson? Because he just said something powerful, and I want to run a little piece of truth here. Might get in trouble, but it's going to be all right. So, for instance, if you talk to most people today, in this, in black people especially, uh, a lot of times they will tell you the number one issue, and I don't like that number one issue is police brutality. Mm -hmm. Not it's a, a issue, but it's the number one issue. Now, the reason I don't like to say that is because it is a critical issue and people die. But if we dig into truth, do you know how many black folk are dying because we don't have universal health care? Mm -hmm. You know how many black folk are dying because we don't have, have living wages and, and or dying because of ecological? What we have to do is have a real death assessment, not just of one issue. Because a lot of times the society will let you focus on one issue instead of focusing on all the oh we used to say what do we want freedom how much of it we want all of it <laughs> they they actually cause us to pigeonhole our desires when in fact one of the things we're doing I preached a sermon called America must decide death is no longer an option and that every piece of bad public policy has a death measurement. And we need to be talking about that death measurement and then becoming movements for life. For instance, when McConnell and, and Sinema uh, voted along with 49 Republicans against the living wages, $15 living wage and, and whatnot, why didn't all of the churches, progressive churches, black churches in West, West Virginia stand up against that, especially if they had known that when they blocked that living wage bill, they blocked 43 percent of black folk coming out of poverty with one vote. Did you hear me? One vote could have lifted 43 million folk out of poverty. We've got to get that kind of truth to our people so that they understand where the real fights are and what real power we have and what transformations we can cause if we, in fact, get engaged. Absolutely. I want to build on, I want to just remind people that When We All Vote is a nonprofit organization, nonpartisan organization, you know, but I also think that that becomes the nuances around how do we speak to these issues that are happening to, in our community that are not, should not be caught up in a space of now it's become, you know, it's, it's sometimes I show up because I'm black. It's like, she's progressive, right? right? Or I'm put in a box just because of who I am, but we have to find ways to be able to speak to just as you have to speak to these issues that are just impacting people in our community. That is not in the context and not be afraid to say that in the context of that, in some ways that that is attached to a party, a particular kind of belief. No, that's literally attached to what our humanity and us standing in the space of our humanity. So I appreciate you for raising that. And I want to come to you. We only have a few minutes left, but you know, part of one of the things in, in, in faith, part of, I think the business, the product, the outcome of, 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 of different faiths is 
this notion of hope, that hope that every single faith on this earth, there is an element of hope that is in there. And so in the Christian faith in, of which I was brought up, my grandmother used to call it the good news. And uh -huh. she was singing this song, like, what's the good news? So with the minutes that we have left, I'm just going to ask you all to take two minutes each to tell us what is the good news in this moment right now. Tell us from your perspective as a leader in the faith community, what is the good news? And I'm going to start with you, Dr. Chappé, as if you all can do two minutes each and then we'll wrap up. Um, okay, so faith isn't an idea, it's a way of life. The word Islam, for example, comes from the word salama, which means peace. Some people might have uh, the word, is someone there? Yeah, we're here. We can oh, hear you. Okay. Yeah, we some, can hear. some people uh, might have the word peace in their heads, but not in their lives. And that's not a transformative faith. Transformative faith is when you have peace in your heart and you make peace in the lives of others. My mm -hmm. mother made sure that her six girls, after she witnessed the, the assassination of her husband, learned about the significant contributions made by Africans, the diaspora, first world indigenous nations, by women in Islam. We learned about the oneness of God and, and the oneness of humanity. We were taught to love ourselves first and foremost and not rely on others to determine our self-worth. Today, it allows me to see you as a reflection of me and me as a reflection of you, to love you as much as I love myself. My parents knew if I learned to love me, and I think this is so important for young people and it's what I uh, you know, impart on my students and, and the young people at our center, at the Shabbat Center, if I can love me, if I learn to love me, I can learn to love you. If I don't love myself, I can't love you and I will never be of any help to you. I think when we don't learn this lesson, we get caught in a cycle of division and self-destruction and that this is likely why self-love and activism were paramount in, in the Shabazz household. There's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. When we seek the common good for others, we understand that we can only win together. Absolutely. When we work together, we win. And so with that, I want you, I'm turning right to you, Bishop Jackson. Give me some hope. What's the good news? Well, the fact of the matter is, faith and works go together. So if you say you got all this faith, then show me your works. The Poor People's Campaign, showing us their faith. Programs to help educate our children, showing them their faith. And when you have faith, then hope has to be a part of it because you wouldn't be doing the work if you didn't have the hope that it was going to be productive, that it was going to work out. And so my message all the time is to people, you've got to keep hope. You've got to exercise your faith. And I tell you now, every morning I wake up, I wake up with this assurance that God still has the last word in his world. It may be hard. It may seem impossible. But what's impossible with men is possible with God. And if you have the faith, God will make the way. And so I think we've got to tell our people, keep your faith. Don't ever lose hope. And remember in the end, right will win, even though wrong prevails. Hmm. Thank you. I know I'm feeling some hope around that and some <laughs> truth and, and, and inspired about that. I'm, you, you about to make me run around the room, Bishop Jackson. But in that same space, that same space in that spirit, Reverend Barbara, in the midst of what, in a very difficult, because we know this has been a challenging, this is a challenging moment. We have gas almost at $6 a gallon right now. You know, this is a very challenging moment um, that we're in in this country's history. Give me some good news. Sojourner true. God is not dead. That's where it has to start. God is not dead. That's what she used to say in the worst moments of, of, the, of the movement of abolition and other. The second is when I sit on panels like this and go around the country, I'm, I get hope because it reminds me that a lot of people are waking up and they're not beguiled by the lies. You know, every now and then you got to know that all have not bowed, <laughs> that there's still plenty of folk that are living and breathing and want to do the right thing. The third thing is I get up every day and I read Frederick Douglass's speech after the Dred Scott decision when everybody said the abolition movement was over. And, Dred, and, and, and Frederick Douglass said, wow, this decision is murderous. And it seems that everything is against us and monstrous. 
He said, could this action be a necessary link in the chain of events to the downfall of the entire system? Could this moment of pride be the actual downfall of injustice? Because injustice always goes too far. And then he said, because what I do know is that every attempt to ally and stop the abolition movement has only served to empower and embolden and intensify our agitation. So this is not a time to de-intensify, it's a time to intensify. And then lastly, you know, I have to say this, this, there's some rough stuff going on, it's bad, but you know, we need to also know folk face some stuff harder than this. Folk, people face some things harder than, than, than this. I'm not downing this now. I'm not dismissing how de- deadly it is. I, I know a young girl who, who's organizing in our movement, lost 25 family members uh, in a 30-mile radius. But do you know, she said, I got to march with y'all because I had more folk die from slavery down here in Mississippi than die from COVID. I mean, it's perspective. It's not dismissing. But we have to hold on and grab on to those old landmarks and understand that people face some things worse than what we're facing now. And they face them with less. You know, I said if Harriet Tubman could organize 700 people, she didn't have Twitter, she didn't have Facebook, she didn't have email. You know, goodness, well, we can organize thousands of people to vote and we got all this other stuff. And then lastly, Tasha, you're alive and I'm alive mm-hmm. and, and Sister Shabazz is alive, Bishop Jackson is alive. Because look, let's be real about this. All of us gone through COVID. We were six minutes from death, six mm-hmm. minutes from death. Because anybody doesn't have breath for six minutes, you about out of here. And I asked God, I was in a musing moment, one moment, kind of playing Howard Thurman. I said, you know, God, why am I still alive? I, I have I have indeficiencies, immune indeficiencies. I've been around COVID. And late in the night, the spirit said, wrong question. Because that's always the wrong question. Why are you alive? You don't know. You could have died at birth. You could, the question is, what are you going to do with the life you have left? Whether it's six minutes, six days, six hours, six weeks, six months, six years, or whatever it is, or 60 years. And so the very fact that we are yet breathing, the question is, do we realize that breath now is such a terrible commodity to waste? I'm not going to waste it on lying. I'm not going to waste hurting people. What I'm going to spend my breath on is lifting and breathing some more love and justice in this world until I die. Amen. 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 Right. Amen. Amen. That's the that that's the way you close close out a sermon. <laughs> but thank thank you so much, um, Bishop. I think that that what we really understand is that pressure can either crush you or it can transform you. And as people of faith, we believe in the transformational nature of having hope and standing on that hope and doing the work to give our people hope. Thank you all for joining us today. Be blessed. Thank you, each of you all, for joining us and being a part of this panel. Hi, everyone. Thank you. That was so fantastic. Thank you to all of our speakers and hello to everybody tuning in. Thank you so much for joining us for our first ever Culture of Democracy Summit. We've heard from some amazing speakers so far, and we're so excited to continue the day. Next, we're going to hear from some people who sit at the helm of influencing culture across the entire country. Artists, musicians, music industry leaders who dedicate themselves to use their platforms to raise awareness around our nation's biggest challenges. These are cultural leaders advocating for action on the issues they care about. You'll hear from the biggest brains in the company and the biggest brains in the music industry in a conversation led by Felicia Butterfield Jones, who is not only a very close friend of When We All Vote, she's also the co-president of the Recording Academy and a leading voice in the music industry with over 20 years of driving impact at the intersections of entertainment, politics, and tech. But just before we get there, I'll turn it over to our friend, Joshua Graham Lynn, co-founder of Represent Us. We can't hear you. 
all these years, all these months of COVID, and I still couldn't figure out how to unmute myself. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Jess. Sorry for the hiccup. And um, and I was just saying that I was such an honor to be here and what an unbelievable panel that was. Um, I want to start with a question, which is, how do we get from where we are with American democracy to making America the world's strongest democracy? And that's what we're obsessed with at Represent Us, this idea that we have work to do to get from here to there and that there has to be a plan in place. And I believe that plan starts by tackling some of the biggest issues causing the problems in our democracy, things like gerrymandering, which we can fix with new laws and independent commissions, things like extremism, which we can fix by working on the way that we vote and forcing the two major parties to come closer together with things like political corruption, which again, we can fix by passing and changing the laws on the way that campaigns are financed and the way that ethics are upheld by our elected officials. And now we all have known for too long that this is not getting fixed at the federal government. And so it sometimes feels like we can't do anything about it, but there is a path. And we see that path when we look at American history. So these are the states that first gave women the right to vote. You see them stacking up. Here it is again for interracial marriage. And the, the chart across the bottom shows the states stacking up as we move towards the right-hand side of the chart when it finally became federal law. Here it is one more time for marriage equality. Watch as the states pile up, we hit this yellow line, and then on the right-hand side of the chart, you have federal victory. That yellow line represents when a movement reaches maturity, when there is finally enough power to move from state victories to federal victories. And so what we need to do as a movement to fix our democracy, to pass the laws that would fight gerrymandering, deal with campaign finance, deal with the corruption, is to bring conservatives and progressives together all across the nation to pass pro-democracy and anti-corruption laws in cities and states across the country. At Represent Us, we've been involved in more than 150 of these such victories, and we continue to gain power today. But one of the things I always hear is, how can you possibly talk about bringing conservatives and progressives together in this divisive environment? Well, look at this chart. What it shows us is that the vast majority of Americans no longer want to be associated with the two major political parties. They want to be independents. They want something new. And if we come together to focus on democracy, we can provide that new thing. To be clear, what it's actually going to take to get there is a real bona fide movement. We need to work together to make democracy sexy, to make it something people want to pay attention to and want to be involved in. Because at the end of the day, this democracy, this country is ours. We pay for it with our own tax money. We elect our own elected officials to represent us and they don't. And as long as we allow that to continue to happen, we will continue to get the same results. But if we can take this idea from a political idea to a cultural idea, and what you see here is some of the many, many people we've worked with in Hollywood, in government, and in cities and states across the country who are putting country over party to come together to make a statement about this movement and to make it clear that if we work together, if we focus on a real concrete plan, we can fix our democracy city by city, state by state together. And so I'm going to leave it at that for you with the invitation to please join Represent Us or join any of the wonderful groups that are here today presenting to you the ways that we can actually get involved in making things better. But with that, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce the amazing Common. So I grew up with Muhammad Ali as one of my heroes. And also my mother is one of my heroes. And those were two people who I seen at their profession, they were great, but they were using their profession and their greatness to benefit others. And somehow that seeped into me and like, that's what I wanted to do once I like, of course I got into to music and, and art just because I loved it and I'm passionate about it. But once I saw the power of it, I realized that I could do things that really meant something to people's lives, meant something. It made my life even more meaningful when I was able to start utilizing my art and my music to have a social impact or 
just the attention that I would get from the work that I do to say something, to do something, to be active. Voting became something that I really became adamant about because I realized how much um, a vote affects everyone that, that is existing from the from my home to right within my home to people within my neighborhoods and communities to cities that I visit to this whole country. So I felt that the work had to be done there. I saw the, the direct connection to like me dealing with work, this dealing with criminal justice reform to me hoping to get arts in schools and like how voting affects that to what's going on with, with guns and and you know just the violence that we see just having people that are truly leaders in position and I said man I gotta if I'm getting this opportunity to be on these stages I gotta go to to the grounds to the people and, and talk and, and and utilize that that light that I have to to inspire others to to go out and use their light so that's what this has been all about for me I got more work to do we got more work to do um, let's continue to educate ourselves on who's out there this for what we know is good and know is right and um man let's just spread love enjoy life all right Hello, everyone. We are just so honored um, to join you today for a very important discussion. Uh, special thanks to Common uh, for those amazing words about the power of music, which brings us all here today. Uh, we first want to just thank When We All Vote uh, for hosting the first ever Culture of Democracy Summit. And again, my name is Belisha Butterfield-Jones, and I proudly serve as the co-president of the Recording Academy, home of the Grammys. Uh, we also want to thank uh, the first lady, our forever first lady, Michelle Obama, for hosting this amazing, amazing program. Um, Executive Director of When We All Vote, Stephanie Young, and the entire team for hosting us. Uh, but today, and for this discussion, uh, we're going to talk about the power of the pen, music and arts influence on change. And what better time with so much going on in the world, with so much going on around us, uh, to talk about the power of music. It reminds me of even my own journey. Um, I spent the last 20 years focused on driving measurable change, but what brought me to the Recording Academy and to the music industry truly was the power of the art form to transform cu cultures, to transform lives. I, I believe, and I think we all know, uh, that music has an amazing power to heal, to unify, and to educate. And so without further ado, I'm so excited to introduce you all to our amazing panel uh, today. Uh, first, Tawalami Austin is the Executive Vice President of Philanthropy and Social Impact for Sony Music Group. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, it's so good to see you. We also have Sean G, the President of Live Nation Urban. What's up, Sean? Good to see you too. Uh -huh. DJ D. Nice, one of my closest friends in the world who is a prolific DJ, artist and all around creator. Derek, so good to see you. Seeing you as well. And our girls, Chloe and Haley Bailey, who need no introduction, uh, amazing award-winning artists, uh, creators, producers, writers, and just amazing. So, so good to see you both, Chloe and Haley. Great to see you. Thank you. How's everybody feeling? Uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic still. We're back outside <laughs> a little bit. Um, but but when I think of music um, and its long history of being a rallying call and even an organizing tool for social movements, it makes me first want to jump off this discussion about the history of influence and maybe even what inspired you around music to do what you do today. So Derek, I'd love for you, if you don't mind, to kick off your journey to music um, and what inspired you around the social part of what you do. Uh, that's a great question. Um, uh, I want to thank everyone for having me here. Uh, my, my background with music started, obviously, back in the 80s with um, the legendary rapper Karis One. And, and uh, during that time, you know, I was a producer and I was heavily influenced by a lot of the adults that were creating music. You know, I was the youngest cat that was involved in the group, whereas someone like Chuck, Chuck D of Public Enemy was roughly around 10 years older. And they were always talking about things that were happening happening socially, you know, whether it was in New York City or across the country or, or even whatever global impact it had. 
So because of the way that I grew up and, and was always around that type of like hip hop music, everything that I tried to do in my entire life as an artist, as an, as an adult was to try to do things that would make change to bring people, you know, bring awareness to what, whatever, you know, social issues that are going on, but also to do it in a fun way, you know, like, so that that message would have a greater impact, you know, and, um, and that's pretty much why I do what I do, you know, because of the music that I listened to growing up. It's so crazy, um, D, because I remember when we first met 20 years ago, um, you saying to me back then, you know, you already were, you know, breaking records, making history. And even then 20 years ago, I, I think I was in college at the time or just graduated. And you said to me, right, I do this thing called music because it changes lives. Right. I do this thing called music because it's bigger than me. And so I just know we all tip our hat to you because to see the amazing career that you've had. And of course, with Club Quarantine, to see the breakthrough that you had for all of us during a pandemic when we needed it most. Um, you, you just inspire us all. Um, so same question to Chloe and Haley. I'd love to hear your perspective, you know, having he heard Derek's journey and, and to know where you all are, breaking barriers, speaking truth to power, and just doing it with so much intelligence and grace. I'd love to hear what inspired you too. Yes. Hi, Haley. Um, so first and foremost, we just want to thank you all so much for having us. I believe it's truly important to do things like this because music is healing and it's a universal language. And even though you might have different point of views from someone else, music brings us and connects us together. So since we were little girls, you know, my sister and I, we are a year and a half Part. We have always loved music. I forget a lot of times that we're not twins because we do absolutely everything together. And, you know, when we first started music, we we're so young, we just knew how it made us feel. That's all we really knew. We were just like, okay, it makes us feel happy and light and peaceful and joyful. And, you know, that's really what fueled us as we were little girls growing into young women. So now as you know, we've gotten older and we started the process of songwriting and producing our music, we realized that we can truly get the message that we want to get across by using our voice and using the power of the pen and everything like that. And I think as a music lover myself, music has saved my life. And the moments where I felt like I was in the lowest moment and point ever, I went straight to music, not only creating our music, but also listening to others. So it's, I think it's so powerful to know that we have that power in our hands to kind of make that moment of distraction for some sort of healing. So it's like whatever bad thing anybody is going through, they can kind of escape through music. And I'm so happy I get to do it with my best friend. And it's like, as the music we're creating is healing others, it's also healing myself. So it's very therapeutic. And I think it's really important you know, in this day and age, especially our young generation to find outlets because with social media and everything around and, you know, seeing all of the crazy things happening in the world right here at our fingertips and right in front of our eyes, it's really depressing a lot of times. So it's important to have an outlet and I'm happy that music is that for me. Absolutely. I feel like um, First of all, thank y'all so much. And you'll have to forgive me. I just have my picture. I'm on set of The Color Purple and still in costume right now, rushing off the stage. So can't really show you all, but I'm just so grateful to be here and piggybacking off of what my sister said. Absolutely. I feel like music is such a blessing to me. Um, and it's easy for all of us because it helps us understand each other. And I'm just grateful that I can be a part of that. Absolutely. Thank you both. Um, and I don't know if you know, but you're inspiring a generation, if not generations of young women who look up to you. And so just keep doing your thing. Um, Tuolumne, so let's talk about Sony and the amazing work that you are leading there. Uh, we know Chloe and Haley are part of the Sony family, and I'd love to hear from you uh, um, as the head of philanthropy and social impact at the label. What is your role in supporting artists and leading um, as an entity on issues such as uh, civic engagement? Thank you, Valicia. And hello, Chloe and Haley and Derek and Sean. It's great being here. Um, no, thank you, Valicia. My, my background is in nonprofit work and in philanthropy work is what I've done for 
um, we'll say a long time, a little over 20 years um, in the space. Um, and, and with Sony, it was such a pleasure um, coming here and leading this work, um, especially around our social justice fund um, and using our artists as drivers and amplifiers and, um, and leaders to really push social causes. Um, obviously, we know we're a label. Artists play a big role in a lot of the things that we do, and they are knocking on our door every day um, and keeping uh, and holding us accountable for making sure that we are doing meaningful work um, in communities through through this um, social justice fund and through all of our, our giving efforts um, at, at Sony. We know historically that music is, is um, motivating um, its drivers in social causes and protests. Um, historically, it's been used as rallying cries, um, ways to tell stories um, amongst each other, um, and, and just ways of, of communicating. And we try and use that philosophy throughout the Social Justice Fund and communi communicating with um, our communities globally. We're in um, seven regions, 60 countries across the globe. Um, and we're looking at ways that we can use our artists to help us amplify social justice issues um, globally um, around those efforts. So they're, they're um, a, big part of, a big part of what we do. I remember uh, when I first joined the Academy two years ago, um, my first role was as the Chief Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Officer. And I remember, you know, you start a new job and you're excited and you're ready to, you know, just learn the land that you're in. And it was in week three that George Floyd was murdered um, and the whole world um, stopped and the music industry paused. And I think it's important to always say the names of uh, the women who lead movements, and it was Jamila and Brianna who created the Show Must Be Paused movement, and you all know how we felt that day. I mean, just a great sense of responsibility. Um, I remember we closed our doors, and, you know, as a DEI practitioner, you know, we don't have the luxury of taking the day off, right? Like, I had to get to work, and I put together this 10-point plan um, that we executed um, because, you know, someone had, right, like we had within our organizations to do the work to make sure that we were taking responsibility and driving change. So I'm curious to know, um, from your point of view, um, you know, how do you work with DEI? I know Tiffany R. Warren leads diversity, equity, and inclusion with you um, at Sony. So how does that work intersect and how do you see it moving forward? Yeah, Tiffany is um, amazing. And I actually started that same year, um, uh, 2020, June of 2020 is coming up on two years um, in, in a week or so. And um, Tiffany wasn't hadn't gotten to the company yet. So I was really sort of leading not the, the DEI issues, but kind of the in the forefront of of the uprising in the movement and really um, the face, if you will, um, of of, of Sony and, and you know, and, and looking at how we were going to move this work forward. So I, I think Tiffany and I connect on a, on a number of issues, especially around disparities and in communities of color, or what we like to call historically excluded communities. We, through the Social Justice Fund, we fund a number of um, collaborating partnerships um, to bring diversity to music, to pictures, um, to entertainment. We work, uh, you know, collaborat collaboratively in those ways and really looking at community organizations that are, are fostering uh, programs that will do the same in their community. So leading a lot of job development and training, working with the formerly incarcerated to make sure that they have tools and, and they aren't um, discriminated against, you know, um, on their, um, uh, given, given, you know, their history. Everyone deserves, you know, a second chance at life and one mistake shouldn't define um, who you are. So making sure that we're partnering with organizations that uh, that have those values um, and that are driving those um, programs um, globally. Thank you um, so much for that, and it's so true. Um, I'd love to turn our attention for a moment to live events and live experiences. It's something that more than ever gets me excited, right? I think about being stuck in the house for two years, working from <laughs> home, and now being back outside and seeing, right, like live events, concerts, 
Derek, you selling out stadiums. And I think of Live Nation Urban and Sean, um, I'd love to hear from you how important, especially right now, um, do you see the role of live events playing in one, just our happiness, right? Mm -hmm. And then of course, also in how we drive change right now. Um, well, once again, let me start by you know, thanking you and, and, and when we all vote for, for, for having me. Um, it's a great question. Um, I think live music is is extremely important. Um, with live music comes community, and I think that was the thing that we were all, you know, missing um, during the, that period of the of the pandemic. That was the thing that Derek provided for us. That we all sort of, you know, became a community or, or, or around what he was doing. And I think as we all come back outside, it's important to have that community. Um, and it's important from a live music perspective to, to, to build a platform, um, not only for people to come back together, but then also for messages to be spread, right? Um, you know, for me, Live Nation Urban was built on a purpose, you know, and this was 2018 when it started. And, you know, it's a venture that I have with Live Nation. And I went to them and said, you know, I want to build music platforms that are built, curated, um, and programmed from a Black perspective. You know, there, there were a lot of music festivals. There are a lot of music festivals that are everything to everybody. Um, but for me, it was, you know, there wasn't nothing that, you know, outside of Essence um, that was really, really built from a from a solidly Black perspective. And, and not, you know, we, we've heard it like, you know, we're not a monolith, we're a mosaic, right? So across my portfolio, I have a partnership with the artist Her called Lights On Festival. I have a partnership with Roots, the Roots Picnic. Kirk Franklin and Gospel, Mary J. Blige, Strength of a Woman. It's just a, a variety of, of, of platforms. And it's welcoming to anybody. Anybody can buy a ticket. You have a partnership with, with Derek, Club Quarantine Live. Anybody can buy a ticket, but you know it, you, it's curated from a particular perspective. And, you know, once we have that audience, it's incumbent upon us to also give that platform for people that need to message to that audience, right? So whether it's um, me partnering with, with, with When We All Vote, and we did an event um called celebrate georgia um which was a a, a very uh, a very aggressive take on a music festival in the middle of the pandemic in atlanta a drive-in um but it was about building awareness around the importance of voting in the senate runoff um a couple of years ago um so we do big things we use our live platforms for big partnerships like that but we also partner with the local community center in philadelphia the roots picnic was this past weekend and i gave the local community center who you know, basically wanted to give out pamphlets and talk to people about how to, how to mitigate the violence that is happening in the city of Philly, right? It's a three-person organization, and they had a booth as you walked in the festival, and all they wanted was access to that audience. So for me, it's, it's important from a live music perspective to build community, but it's also important to provide, you know, the audience that I bring, you know, to provide to others so that they have access to that audience. So true and so powerful. I mean, I, I can't think of, um, I know we're in a digital age, but still there's nothing like live communication, live events, just human touch and being in, in community with each other. Um, I remember, Chloe, you performing just a few months ago in Vegas during Grammy week and you brought the house down every night, right? Friday night, there was the person of the year gala, Saturday night. We did the Recording Academy Honors event. Uh, we we honored D Nice um, that night. How does it feel right now, um, um, Haley and Chloe, to just know that, all right, you're in a space now where when you talk and when you take a stage, especially a live stage, the entire room listens, right? How does it make you feel? And do you feel a responsibility in that to tell a particular message? I think it makes Hallie and I feel free whenever we have the opportunity to showcase who we truly are on that stage. And whenever I can look to the left or to the right of me and see my sister Hallie right there, it just feels amazing. And before any time I get on stage, I get really, really nervous. And it's like, you know, like at the beginning of a roller coaster when you keep going up and up and up and it's like right before the huge dip down at the fall, like that's the feeling right before I get on stage. And 
the exciting thing is that once those lights come on, it all disappears. And it's like, this is the version of me that I feel the most confident. This is the version of me where I don't feel scared for people to see me and see my sister. Because when you're on stage, you are putting yourself out for everybody to see you, everybody to nitpick, and it's a vulnerable place to be. But when music comes into play, it's literally like we're floating on stage whenever we get to perform. And, you know, that Grammy weekend was so much fun and being able to sing for Joni Mitchell and honor her. And then also for us and our people, it was just a really, really special time. And I can't wait to perform more. And Sis and I were performing at Essence Fest together and Something in the Water. And I can't wait because we haven't performed together in a few months. So it's going to be really, really really fun so i'm definitely looking forward to that any chance we get absolutely yeah it's definitely a very surreal feeling um especially for me i'm the little sister out of us both and you know when it comes to me and chloe's relationship i've always kind of looked to her and you know she's so brave and so inspiring in every single way so when i get the opportunity to be on stage with her it's like you know, you know that you're going to be okay regardless. Um, and yeah, I just feel so free, like Chloe was saying, and so happy to be on stage and know that what you are doing, it matters and it's healing to people. And, um, you know, it's very important in our family. We always heard growing up to whom much is given, much is expected. And so that is always one of our goals in life is to just give back this gift that we're given and um, give it for good in any way that we can. Speaking of live events, I remember the last live event, I hope I'm getting this right. So when we all vote, I hope I'm not um, mistake, um, not getting what, what I believe to be the last live event correct. But in the final days of the Obama White House, um, there was an amazing event. Um, that Derek DJ'd. Do you remember that night, D? It it was uh, one of the best nights of my life. Of my life. Of my life, you know, to um, to be in the White House and to I was playing it safe. You know, if you know me, like I play for different audiences. You know, like I'm playing every event. And, you know, I don't stick to one specific genre, but because we were in the White House, and you know, Obama, you know, President Obama was in office. I was playing it safe, and uh, and then our friend Naomi Campbell was like, "You're not doing yourself. You're not doing what you do. You you know, like, cause I love young music and I love Stevie Wonder, and I'll somehow figure out how to mix all that together." And the moment that she said that, and I just went into a zone of like, it didn't matter when the record was made. If it was made now and it's hot, play it. And to see so many beautiful black people in that East Room dancing and celebrating President Obama in his last days in office was something that I will never forget. Ever. It gives Ever. me feel, it, 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 me, my eyes water, right? John, like, I mean, it was surreal. And if we could put it in a bottle, um, I would, because it was one of the happiest, like most purely happy moments of my life to just feel exactly what Chloe and Haley said, free, right? Free to just yes. be without judgment, right? Um, and so it takes me to the virtual space, right? So, so to go from that type of live experience to being shut down for two years, um, it reminds me, Derek, of how you not only used your platform to you know, find your own peace and joy, but that of millions of people, but you also, what a lot of people may not know, registered over 10,000 people to vote through club quarantine. So could you talk a little bit more about the When We All Vote partnership and how that all came to be? Because you truly like moved the needle um, around voter registration while right finding our joy and peace and happiness in the middle of a, a pandemic. I saw uh, Stephanie in, in Los Angeles last night and, uh, and she actually mentioned that first time we did it, which was like the first week of club quarantine. We actually registered like 27,000 people you know, and, and um, during that time, like to be able to, for one, I, and, and I know Chloe can understand this, Chloe and I can both understand this. When you're performing in front of people, you feel that energy. And we had to somehow find that energy by reading comments. And I found that energy based on hearts. If someone is on their phone and they're pressing hearts for like 20 minutes, I, that means to me that 
they just love what's happening. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that, that was the energy I was feeding off of. And to see these numbers grow and grow and grow and to stay consistently and like, it was just mind blowing to me. And I knew that what I was doing really mattered to people. You know, at that point, it was the early days of pandemic. None of us really knew what was going on or how to, to not only just reach people with music, but it was also an, an important election time. You know, how are they gonna campaign? So to know that a, a, a virtual space, a virtual club actually opened the doors up for people that were, you know, running for office to feel comfortable enough to go in these chat rooms because they weren't, come on, you you would never see Joe Biden in, in a chat room or, you know, in a, in a virtual space throwing his thumbs up. You know, you would never, you would have never seen that in the past. And the fact that it happened during one of the darkest times and that it wasn't just my doing, it was like our little community. We all, I didn't create the, the idea of this being a club. It was the people in the chat like, wait, this actually feels really good. This is like a club. And I just kept going with it because I knew I knew it was it was important. And the music that I was playing was saving my own life. And I, and from what I was reading, and, you know, during those comments, it was saving others' lives. And and you know, it's like this is truly like, man, I, I never would have imagined it. And I, and I'm so humbled by all of the love that I've I've received since then. Yeah, you saved us, D, um, for sure, and you and you continue to, right, even as you do it online and now back outside. Um, so, Tawalami and Sean, I'd love to talk for a moment about the important positions that we're in, right? And I, and I always say, um, don't waste the seat, <laughs> right? Like, I, I take so seriously the responsibility that I have in, in my current seat. I know that you both take so seriously the responsibilities that you have in your seats. And so when I reflect on um, the importance of us fighting for music, right, and fighting for live music and fighting for creators, um, I'd love to hear from you what keeps you up at night, right? Like, what are the things that just make you feel like inspired every single day to get up, right? And do this work because we know there are a lot of things you could be doing right now, but but you chose music for a reason. And so I'd love to just know personally, you know, what inspires you to just do the work that you do in our industry. Sean, I'd love for you to start. Um, what inspires me um, you know, yes, I am the president of Latin Nation Urban, but um, my my entry point into the music business was I'm I'm a manager. Um, when I first came into music, my first client um, was a group out of my hometown of Philadelphia named The Roots. Um, they were my first client. My second client was a young lady out of Philadelphia by the name of Jill Scott. Um, and 20 plus years later, I always say they're going to be my last two clients. We're still together, right? Um, and the thing that, that, that I've learned working with creatives like Black Thought and Jill and, and, and Amir um, is the importance of making sure their voice is heard. Um, you know, the importance of making sure that the creators have a platform to not only create, but to distribute and connect. Um, and that is what, you know, that's how I started my career. And those are the things, no matter who about who I've managed over the years, no matter what festivals I've built, no matter who I've partnered with, the thing that always sort of motivates me is the creative partner that I have and making sure that I can help them build, elevate and get their message out. Right. And on the live side, you know, I have a handful of, um, you know, music festivals and tours that I do that are sort of traditional and solely owned by my venture. But the majority of my my portfolio, I partner with artists, whether it's D, whether it's Mary J, whether it's Kirk Franklin, whomever. I partner with artists because that's the thing that wakes me up in the morning is, you know, am I providing a platform for these amazing creatives to create? You know, when we started Managing the Roots, I would say that the the goal we had was, can they just not have to get a day job, right? <laughs> can they earn a living off of their creativity? Because they weren't making any hit records or anything. It was just like, all right, can we make sure that these brothers are able to live off of their art, 
right? And it's still that, it's, it's elevated, but it's still that core, that core principle for me is, can I make sure that some people have the ability to make a living off of their art? You're so right, and it just reminds me of just not only the power of Black music, but the foundational value of Black music, right? We know Black music literally is the beginning of all music and the foundation that we all, um, you know, have built on. And it also makes me think of, you know, not only is it the right thing to do, um, but Black music controls over 35% of the overall music market share, right? Like hip hop. R&B drives numbers, you know, not only to our business, but to our economy. And so thank you for all the work that you do to fight for artists, because we know, right, that equity needs to happen because all the value that we bring and that they contribute. So, so important. Um, Tawalami, would love to hear from you. Um, so earlier, Valisha, you mentioned that in our roles within these companies, especially um, around philanthropy and, and um humanitarian efforts and give back when uh, a crisis hit, we're, we're pretty much working around the clock. And I remember during the pandemic, you know, um, when we shut down and we left the offices on that Thursday, um, uh, I wasn't at Sony at the time, I transitioned during the pandemic, but we were meeting at my former company, we were meeting on Saturday, on Sunday, artists were calling, how do we give back? How do we, what do we do? What can we do? Um, kids were out of school, uh, families needed food. We had to organize, right, quickly and swiftly. Um, so for me, I've always been in that position within my career to really um, uh, mobilize and engage uh, quickly. So this work inspires me, change, being able to literally create change and influence change um, within, um, uh, within our communities um, inspires me. Um, I also remember coming on to Sony, there was a small election that we may remember in 2020 that was happening, right? And um, being um, two weeks into the job, mobilizing one of our largest um, campaigns, mobilizing over uh, around voting, which is one of my initial uh, partnership with When We All Vote um, and Stephanie um, and reaching out to them, like, what are you guys doing? How can we help? I need to get these artists um, engaged. Um, and we were able to, you know, move 80 artists um, across a campaign that that ultimately drove us to the, the outcomes that, that we uh, are experiencing today with, with, the, with the election itself. So being, you have to be motivated and you have to be inspired um, by the work to, to, to be up and to work around the clock to enter into a new job and to hit the ground, hit the ground and mobilize uh, pretty quickly. So I'm inspired by the work. I'm inspired um, uh, by, uh, you know, companies and individuals and the music industry stepping up during that time and mobilizing millions of dollars to, you know, to impact change around social justice. Um, so this work inspires me. It's, it's, you know, what I feel is my calling. Um, people tease me. They're like, you're a workhorse. You never, you know, you never stop. You go, go, go. But, you know, within this space, we're fighting for our communities. We're fighting for rights. People are homeless. People are hungry. People are, um, uh, suffering in some in some way, and and that's where we come in, um, uh, especially on the side of, of philanthropy and DEI. Um, so the work inspires me, um, and I'm just honored to be able to to do my calling. Thank you for everything that you do, um, Sean. I'd love for you if you could to also just touch for a moment on um, the Warner Music Group Social Justice Fund. I know you were selected to sit on the board of directors, so could you share with us a little bit more about what you all are doing over there? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, uh, the Warner Music Group Social Justice Fund. Um, it was it was formed uh, as a result of you know everything that happened sort of post George Floyd. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, there was like a three week period where fifteen companies said, "I'm forming a hundred million dollar fund." Like, I hundred million dollar fund for you and for you. Um, and uh, I got a call from some friends at Warner. Um, the majority of the board of the fund are, you know, employees of Warner, um, and they had five external uh, board members, and I was I was blessed to be chosen to be one one of the external board members. And you know, I, I went into it with skepticism, 
um, partially because so many people, you know, within a two to three week period were now all of a sudden, you know, I mean, they, they now all of a sudden cared about, you know, the, the ills of society that existed for generations. So I went into it with skepticism. I went into it based on relationships with the people that asked me. Um, but quite honestly, you know, it's been, it's been some of the most rewarding work of my career. Um, you know, we're two years in, I think we've, um, allocated in year one, somewhere between 12 to $13 million, um, that we, that we put to work in the community. Um, the, the, the fund itself is sort of built on, uh, three pillars, investing in companies that are uh, active in education, active in arts and culture and active in, um, criminal justice reform. Um, and, you know, basically as a team, we identify, you know, organizations that are active in those areas and, you know, make investments, like put some money to work. I mean, we've, we've invested in, you know, and had Howard University, we uh, uh, formed a fellowship program. We've invested in um, Diversify the Stage, which is a, a platform that Noel Skagg started to um, provide opportunities for black and brown, you know, and female, pre predominantly female um, people behind the stage and the live stage. Everyone wants to be in front, but, you know, in the tech positions and other positions. Um, invested in uh, Ashe uh, Arts Arts and Cultural Center in New Orleans. So it's just a, a wide variety of, of different investments. Um, and yeah, it's been it's been it's been very rewarding personally. And I think, you know, as a fund, we've we've been able to 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 put some money to work and 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 you know help some folks build and grow their vision. You have great work and special shout out to Dr. Maurice Stanett, who's leading diversity over at Warner. Um, Maurice. What's up, Mo? Um, so as we start to wind down in our last few minutes, I think it's so important for us. I say this in my ripe age that I won't share. Um, <laughs> make sure that we're listening to young people, right? Like I think that we we think we know what you need, but sometimes we're just talking to ourselves and not to you about what you need. And so Chloe and, and Hallie, I'd love to hear from you on what more can the music industry and we do to better serve you? Um, and, and, you know, we want honesty, right? If there's more that you need, you know, let's have the conversation. If there's more that we should be doing or even just thinking about, um, we're open to it all. Um, so Chloe and Haley, over to you. Yes, well, that's a great question. Um, number one, I would say just collectively everyone being a bit more open um, in general. I feel like creatively as a musician, you know, you're really, really sensitive about everything that you make. And, you know, when it comes to presenting to your label or um, just important figures, you get kind of nervous because you're like, oh, is this the right sound? Is this, you know, what's trendy right now? Is it going to trend on TikTok? Is the label wants me to do this way, you know? So I think there are really good ways of just being more open uh, to whatever comes out creatively and um, just encouraging. And I feel like, you know, this panel is just so inspiring. I mean, all of you that sit on this panel, I feel do that in such an amazing way. And, you know, that, that, so what makes me feel comfortable as a creative is to kind of um, just have a safe space where I'm not afraid to write what I want to write, say what I want to say, and not have to be one thing, one exact type of way, um, especially when it comes to, you know, genres. And you know, in this day and age with my sister, he loves so many different types of music. Her solo music is amazing. And you know, she's making like pop records funny because people, you know, they will automatically as, oh, she's an old because she's a black girl. Like she her pop star, you know, I think it's just it's open our music that all just flow together and let there be no boundaries on music where the true frequency of I mean, no boundaries, more open, more encouraging. And I think that's something I know we all can probably do more of, right? When we talk about, and, and it goes back to how we started this conversation, Chloe, about just wanting to be free, right? And freedom means 
not having boundaries, not being limited, but instead being limitless and how we express ourselves, how we create, how we show up. Um, and so, Chloe, I'd love to hear from you, too, on what you think we should be thinking about or maybe doing more of. Yes. Well, everything Sis said is a thousand percent correct. And I think just giving artists the time to grow into their artistry and to not expect every song to hit off right off the gate with streaming numbers and TikTok. Like right now, it's because everything is overly saturated and there's so many songs per week, you know, they rely on a popular trend to chart with music. And, you know, it's great, the internet's great, but it's also the downfall because we are not appreciating artistry and say an album comes, no one's really listening to it within the next week or two weeks. And there's so much music and so much, so many visuals, we are so, like stimulated, we don't know what to focus on. So I think it's really just about finding ways to truly sit there and marinate in the moment of a song. Like that is what I wish that I got to be a part of years ago, even before I was born. But, you know, I'm really grateful that Sis and I are signed to somebody like Beyonce because we are given the creative freedom and the space to grow. And, you know, not everything will be perfect. You have to make mistakes and fall so that you can grow from that. And it's been really nice being able to have that creative freedom to find what we like creatively, even as business women. And, you know, I wish a lot of artists were given that in the industry, but the sad thing is that they're not. It's really about like what hit can pop off online. So that's what it's turned into. So I think it's really just being patient with an artist. I, I think that's definitely number one. So important, so powerful. Um, and, and to just hear you so clear on what it is that you need is inspiring to me. I, I remember when I first started out, I, I knew probably from eight, the age of eight that I wanted to work in the music industry, eight years old. And every single person in my life, I'm from a small country town, told me it's impossible, right? Like, what do you, what are you talking about? You're never going to make it. We don't know anyone that does that. I mean, it has zero representation, right? And I remember being so afraid and then eventually finding my way. And I know for sure, right, if I had that dream today, I would not pursue it. You know, if I had that dream today, I would talk myself out of it and I would let, allow any outside voices to just shrink, you know, my dreams. And so had I not done that at such a young age, I don't, I know for sure I wouldn't be sitting here with you today. And so whatever you do, please protect your freedom and protect your peace and protect that part of you because I see it shining so brightly in you and your sister. And so make sure you, you keep it. Um, all right, so we have just a few minutes left, and I have a question that I'd love to hear from everyone. What was a piece of music that has had an impact on how you view a social issue? And I know that's a hard one, right? There are probably thousands of songs um, that you can think of, um, but if there's one that you'd like to share, um, I'd love for you to jump right in. Man, I can start this one. That's easy for me. I'm a big Stevie Wonder fan and um, living for the city, the way he just described, you know, what was going on in the world during that time is probably one of the most important records that I've ever heard. Um, so that would that would probably be my the, the song that influenced me the most in wanting to make change and to be involved. That's a great one. I would say what's going on <laughs> i mean by barbie gay is like my top one uh where i feel like he just addressed everything so beautifully melodically and everything that he was saying was so strong and made you pay attention i would say that one for me um i'd say um maybe not me personally but in a, a very a song that was really important within my household um, was a uh, little baby, uh, the bigger picture, because it allowed me to, you know, have a real conversation with my kids, you know, cause that was when they were able to, when, when they saw a little baby and they saw that visual, they started asking questions, right? That me playing Marvin Gaye or Jill Scott would not have stimulated in their mind. So bigger picture is probably the song that was said. 
I think I would have to say public enemy, fight the power. Um, Chloe, I was going to say, <laughs> you got um, we had the same one, so I have to pick another one. But um, yeah, that that song, it was in your face. <laughs> um, it was intentional and um, it, it really, um, it, it's, a, it's a motivator. It gets you riled up. Um, so I would say that would be my, my choice. I think I would have to say Nina Simone's version of Strange Fruit. Mm -hmm. And I would have to say Caged Bird by Alicia Keys, even though it's not really speaking specifically on any issue, but it's really about mental health and feeling closed in and in chains and in a cage. And I feel like that's how the world has us as people feeling a lot of the time. So even as I was trying to find my sense of freedom as a young woman, I would constantly play that song. So to me, that's good. Oh, good. All right. So I'm going to take moderator privilege and give two. <laughs> and say, um, so first, and, and I guess it's social impact related and, and um, civic engagement related, but really just what gave me confidence to do this work. So first is My Life album, the song My Life, Mary J. Blige. Um, the year was 94. I'm in high school somewhere um, in North Carolina. Um not quite feeling the confidence, right? That these dreams that I had were were attainable and valid and, and Mary's My Life album, I don't know. It just made me feel a way. And it made me feel like, you know, I can do anything, you know, if I just, you know, believe in and bet on myself. Um, and then the second one more recently um, is Little Nas X, Montero album, right? And, and it's because of how he shows up in the industry and how he shows up in the world so unapologetically back to what Chloe said, free, right? Free to be. And so when I think of, you know, our, our individual and collective roles in the movement, I think the best way to close out is exactly where we began, Chloe, around freedom, freedom to be an executive unapologetically your way, freedom to be an artist and create outside of those boundaries free to innovate in the middle of a pandemic D and change and transform lives in a way that you even couldn't ever have imagined just three years ago. And so I just want to say thank you to when we all vote for hosting this important conversation. I want to say thank you to each of you individually because you are appreciated and seen and valued in our industry and in the world more than maybe you'll ever know. And so I want you to hear a sincere thank you for all that you do, because I know it comes with a lot of great sacrifice and I hope to do this again soon. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, thank you. All thank right, you. thank you everyone. Now we're gonna toss it over to Andy Bernstein, who is the executive director from our friends over at Headcount. Thanks again, everyone. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you when we all vote for having me. I'm Andy Bernstein. I'm the founder and executive director of Headcount. We're a grassroots voter re registration and mobilization organization. We've been around 18 years. We actually are old enough to vote ourselves now. And in that span, we've registered over 1 million voters. Uh, we come from the music world. We're culturally more of a music organization than a political organization. And uh, what we're best known for is registering voters at concerts. So the first slide here uh, is the kind of uh, interaction that Headcount supports literally thousands of times every week across the country. We're at events all over the U.S., uh, supporting peer-to-peer -peer interaction, registering voters, uh, talking about the importance of voting, checking voter registration status. Um, next slide. Our, um, uh, I'm, yeah. uh, our most important relationships are with the musicians themselves. Uh, we work with Billie Eilish, Ariana Grande, Jay-Z, Beyonce. And um, I think what musicians appreciate about Headcount is that we really come from the music world. We understand live music, uh, understand festivals. Uh, but also, I think what they appreciate is that we're truly nonpartisan. We don't have a political agenda. We're not trying to get people to vote one way or another. Uh, we're just uh, on the side of democracy. And interestingly, last year in 2021, we were faced with a real conundrum because we saw that nearly 20 states were rolling back voting rights. And while we don't take sides on political issues, we are on the side of democracy, as I said, and we care deeply about voting rights. So we went back out to concerts post-pandemic, really attacking this issue. Uh, next slide. And the way we did it was through a nonpartisan value statement. Elections should be fair, accessible, and trustworthy, the kind of thing that everyone can agree with. And we went out to concerts and asked fans to send simple short emails or calls to legislators behind this value statement. 
And I'm happy to tell you that we generated over 150,000 of these messages to members of Congress and state legislators, uh, standing up for voting rights, elevating this conversation. Now, as we head toward the midterm elections, we have uh, as big an important job as ever. Uh, the presidential years, everyone's talking about voting. It's the midterm elections year where not only do we need to register new voters, but we need to stop people from being drop-off voters. About half of young people who vote in presidential elections historically then sit out the next midterms, and we can't let that happen. So I want to invite all of you to join us. Um, next slide. Uh, headcount is really easy to get involved with. We are out at concerts literally every day of the week in almost every major city of the country. There's a headcount street team. And if you're interested in seeing a concert for free and registering voters, sounds like a pretty good deal, right? Well, go to headcount.org slash volunteer. Uh, we have literally 50,000 volunteers. It is a movement of music fans all over America who believe in democracy. And anybody watching this, there is a place for you. Headcount.org volunteer. Thank you very much. I hope to see you at a show soon. Good afternoon and good evening to all of my fellow democracy defenders here today. I am so honored to join you all in the fight to build a multiracial democracy that truly represents all of us. I know that all of you have tuned in today, have joined because you believe voting is a critical way to exercise our power. And we must defend that freedom, especially as some lawmakers and corporate lobbyists are working every day to make it harder for millions of people in our country to vote. Unfortunately, this is no accident. It is a coordinated attack on our freedom to vote. They are directly targeting Black, brown, indigenous, immigrant, young folks, new voters, as well as folks with disabilities to silence our voices and maintain their power. My name is Alexis Anderson Reed and I'm the proud CEO of State Voices. We are a nonpartisan coalition of people who, like you, are dedicated to ensuring our elected leaders hear our voices. I have been an organizer and an activist since I was in college, uh, where I first started mobilizing young folks and students across my home state of Wisconsin um, to push for schools um, and investment in school students and educators. And since then, I have dedicated my life to building people power and the path towards a more equitable future. And this led me right to State Voices. Over the last 12 years, State Voices has built a network of over 1,200 partner organizations, and we work in all 50 states, working with communities to bring about the changes that we want to see. In 2020, our network made over 228 million contacts to voters across the country, and we registered more than 2.3 million voters in 2020 alone. Right now, we are witnessing coordinated attacks in our democracy that are unprecedented. We're at major risk of losing reproductive freedom. And so many leaders are dragging their feet on climate action. And it feels like the ballot box is moving farther and farther away. And I can tell you from speaking with folks in communities every single day, they are feeling this right on a visceral level. So to secure a more equitable future, we need civic and we need community engagement. And that's what we are here to bring about because we know that change, it starts with people, it starts from the ground up. Um, it starts with all of us. At State Voices, we center the leadership and voices of Black, Indigenous, Latinx, API, and all communities of color. We center women and young people on low income and LGBTQ communities. I am proud of the fact that 84% of our state tables are led by women and 68% are led by women of color. State Voices is committed to dismantling the tools of voter suppression because we believe that power must be in the hands of the people, not an elite few. So we must have the say in our own futures. And I just wanna say a huge thank you to When We All Vote, to bringing us together, to be in this space, to learn from one another and to have these important conversations. 
Next, I have the honor of introducing When We All Vote's co-chair, a gladiator in the fight for our democracy, Carrie Washington. To the Culture of Democracy Summit. By now, you've heard from leaders and organizers across so many sectors that are doing the tireless work of protecting our democracy and fighting for a future where we can all thrive together. The last few years have proven that voting is how we step into our voice, our power, and ultimately how we fight for change in our communities, which is why I'm so grateful to be part of When We All Vote. When we're working to make sure that all voices are heard, we begin making progress towards a better, brighter, and more equitable future for us all. So, up next, we have a very important conversation that is truly critical to the future of our democracy. Map by map, black and brown elected officials across our nation are being drawn out of their districts from members of Congress to county commissioners. This is diminishing black and brown political power at alarming rates. The 2013 Supreme Court decision, Shelby versus Holder, allowed jurisdictions with a history of voting discrimination to pass election laws and draw political maps without approval from the Justice Department. As a result of this, the current redistricting cycle has accelerated this pattern. Today, I am so honored to introduce the man that fought for voters in that case, former Attorney General Eric Holder. In his statement, after the Supreme Court decision delivered this below to the Voting Rights Act, Attorney General Holder said, it is incumbent on all American citizens to stand up for their rights by registering to vote, going to the ballot box, exercising that most fundamental of rights and voting for their preferred candidates of any party. Our democracy is dependent on each of us and on our active participation in the electoral process. It's been nearly 10 years since this 2013 decision and the fight for fair maps and to protect the representation of black and brown voters is as urgent as ever. After Shelby, the Supreme Court continued to weaken the Voting Rights Act with two more decisions, Abbott versus Perez and Brnovich versus DNC. And earlier this year, the current Supreme Court voted to reinstate an Alabama congressional map that a lower court said diminished the power of black voters. And that's why everything Attorney General Holder has to share today is so important. I ask everyone listening to show up and stay engaged and get involved. 99% of the elections that take place in the US are at the state and local level. And this November, voters will elect 36 gubernatorial seats and dozens of lieutenant governors, attorney general, and secretary of state offices. Why hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Johnson. I'm excited to be with you all for this incredible summit. Um, as many of you know, a growing number of congressional maps are changing based on who's in power, targeting specific voters. Um, basically, uh, specifically, black and brown voters are being drawn out of districts. Uh, diluting black and brown political power at alarming rates. Um, many of you know the history of this and, and some of you are learning it for the first time, but it's my honor to be in a conversation with uh, one of the people that I think is an incredible star worth uh, who has been on the battlefield, who has been tested and who has been consistent. Um, and without the breadth and depth of his entire uh, resume, um, I, I want to introduce to some and uh, present to others, Attorney General Eric Holder. Good to be with you, sir. All right. Well, thanks, Jeff, for that kind introduction. 
Um, and thank you to the When We All Vote team for uh, for allowing me to be with you today. Look, you know, I'm excited to talk about the uh, the impact of gerrymandering um, and the redistricting process with all of you and to discuss what, what I think is our ongoing fight to save democracy. Now, I, I think to understand where we are today, it, it's really important to recognize, you know, that the fight for democracy in America has gone on really since this country's inception. I mean, for as long as America has existed, you know, there have been two opposing forces who have fought over you know, how we express and confer the rights and privileges of citizenship, of, of freedom, and of equality, you know, from slavery to abolition, from Reconstruction to Jim Crow. I mean, those who sought a more inclusive nation have been countered by those who were determined to maintain power at, at the expense of others. You know, anti-democracy forces used poll taxes, literacy tests, uh, intimidation, and outright violence to achieve their goals. And even, even after the landmark Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts uh, were signed into law, you know, these forces found ways to undermine and to ignore the freedoms that America has always promised its citizens. And, you know, I, I saw these threats up close as, uh, as Attorney General. You know, photo ID laws aimed at suppressing the votes of young people and people of color, uh, voter roll purges to delete millions of eligible voters' names, disproportionately, again, impacting minority communities, um, polling place closures and consolidations that vastly increase wait times in minority neighborhoods, um, gerrymanders designed with really, as, as one court described, surgical precision to dilute and diminish the voting power of black and brown Americans. Now, these measures were never spontaneous emotional responses from, you know, dispossessed individuals or sporadic efforts to improve, you know, election security. You know, they, instead, they're part of a, of a highly strategic, you know, well-funded campaign fueled by powerful interests committed to, to undermining our democracy. And, and this fight is why, you know, when I stepped down as, as AG, as Attorney General, um, I decided to devote my time and energy to that this issue of, of voting rights. And I founded, along with President Obama, an organization called the National Democratic Redistricting Committee that was focused on ending gerrymandering and achieving fair redistricting, fair redistricting, so that voters could decide the outcome of elections and not the people who actually draw the maps. And since, I guess, January of 2017, we've been executing a comprehensive strategy that includes litigation, people-powered advocacy, reforms, electoral work, you know, you, you name it. We're, we're coming at this problem from every angle to achieve fair maps for Congress, but also importantly for state legislatures around the country. And I'm proud that our work is one reason why the congressional map in 2022 will be fairer, not, not as fair as it needs to be, but fairer than it has been in, in decades. And at the state level, voters in several uh, previously gerrymandered states are going to vote on fair maps this decade and actually be able to hold, you know, their legislatures accountable. So, you know, by supporting fair maps, strong candidates, and impactful pieces of legislation that protect, um, you know, the values of our nation, we can put a stop to this this, this endless and, and mindless assault on voting rights and on democracy. But understand, the threats to our democracy remain very real, and our work is far from done. So it's important that everyone understands that this fight is urgent, creating fair, um, and just elections is how we create a fair and just democracy. And with a truly representative democracy, we can make progress on issues like, like employment, education, healthcare, housing, um, and, and civil rights. This is how we protect the right to fair representation for people across the country. Before I turn it over to Jeff, I'd like to say that, you know, I think the defining political fight in America at this moment is not really over a specific policy issue. It's over the very nature of our democracy itself. The time to act is now. So thank you once again for, for having me and for caring enough about the future of our democracy to be with me and with Jeff uh, today. Jeff, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, thanks A.G. Holder. I, I, I'm really appreciative of what you said, but, but I think that there are some who may not be clear on the litmus between unfair maps and fair maps. And so as, you, as, as you're processing what the litmus is for even voters to understand as they hear what the redistricting plans are for where they live, how do they know what, what dictates a, a fair map versus an unfair map? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, you know, I would define fair maps as 
uh, maps that have that, that look kind of normal. I mean, you, you, you can tell a gerrymandered map almost by its shape, but not, not always. Uh, it, rep, it, it, uh, it, it reflects, um, you know, uh, natural boundaries, um, you know, rivers, mountains, things of that nature. Uh, it also respects communities of interest so that people uh, of, of similar types, similar groups have the ability to actually have their voices be heard in the districts that are that are drawn. And also we, we can do statistical analyses now and, and really look at a district and say, well, you know, if, if a state has, I don't know, 50 percent Republicans, 50 percent Democrats. Well, why do Democrats have, you know, nine out of the 10 seats in the in the legislature? So there's statistical ways in which you can analyze these things uh, as well. But in a lot of ways, it, it's, it's really kind of common sense. What is it that you see when you look at um, at the district? and understand who is in that district and who is in adjoining districts. You know, that, that comparison also helps you decide what a fair, um, what, what a fair map looks like. And, and so with, uh, tell us a little bit more. I mean, you talked about it a little bit, but, but how kind of the restrictive voting laws being introduced across the country and the redistricting efforts um, are really affecting people of color and underrepresented populations? Yeah, I mean, what we have seen is with, through the passage of these laws that sound to be, you know, kind of neutral on their face and are supposedly designed to prevent fraud from occurring in our, our elections. And there's all the studies show that there's little to no um, fraud that has any measurable impact on the outcome of an election. Um, these maps make it more difficult. I mean, if you look at the law passed in, in Texas that said you have to have a photo ID in order to vote. Well, if you had uh, an ID from the state that was issued with your photo on it that said you were allowed to carry a concealed weapon, that was fine. If you had a state-issued ID from the University of Texas that said that you were a student there, that was deemed to be not acceptable. I mean, you know, so there are those kinds of things. You also have ID laws that say, well, you know, you've got to have like a, a driver's license is fine. And we know by statistics that people in minority communities are less likely to have a driver's license than um, than people in majority communities. So there's a whole variety of ways in which things that appear to be neutral on their face actually have a disproportionate and negative impact on uh, communities of color. Well, and, and go a little further, because obviously we've got a midterm that that is right in our face. Um, and, and how is recent redistricting impacting the midterms? Yeah, I mean, you know, we're going to have, as I said, more fair elections will be fairer this time than they were, um, you know, 10 years or so ago, the last time that we redistricted. Um, there are still some states where the redistricting process uh, is still in the process of being, um, there's still litigation, Texas, Georgia, Florida, um, Wisconsin. Those are places that I, I still have concerns about. Uh, because of the way in which the lines w were drawn there. And we will be able to see in, you know, just a few months. Well, we already kind of have a sense of how the maps um, have been drawn and whether or not they are, are fair in, in, you know, in a variety of states. But it will have an impact, um, you know, on the 2022 congressional elections, as well as on the, um, the state races that occur uh, in November of 2022. But, but A.G. Holder, I mean, when we talk about fair and, and more fair in this election, this doesn't seem like it's a, a, a one win and done kind of fight. So do, do, does the progress that has been made thus far serve as best case models that are perpetual? Or is there a reality that because of the system being what it is, this is a win for now that requires an ongoing fight later because there's still going to be an attack in the same places that you currently have wins? Yeah, no, it's an ongoing fight. I mean, we have had the problem of gerrymandering and unfair redistricting in this country since almost the beginning of the uh, of the nation. I mean, the first gerrymander actually involved um, Patrick Henry, you know, give me liberty or give me death, and him deciding between James Madison and James Monroe. And I can't forget which James he didn't like, but he drew a district so that one of the two Jameses, either Madison or Monroe, um, did not get a fair shake in trying to get to the United States House of Representatives. So that gives you a sense of, you know, how far back this has gone. And it is an ongoing fight. Uh, it means we have to continually monitor um, how the lines are being drawn, what the impact of voter laws are on communities of color, especially. Uh, it, this is something that, you know, as I said, we, we've been with us almost since the beginning of, of the nation and something that we have to um, 
continually be vigilant about and continually commit ourselves to the fight for uh, for fair maps, fair redistricting, because the reality is if we don't make sure that these maps are fair, politicians will get to pick their voters as opposed to citizens choosing who their representatives ought to be. And that way, um, you know, the special interests are, are the ones who have the ability to make the calls as opposed to the citizens of this nation. It, it's ultimately something that is anti-democratic, uh, it's anti-democracy. It's something that's inconsistent with who we say we are, um, you know, as a nation. But but that, but that but but that statement is almost contradictory to your previous statement, which is it's been happening since the beginning of our democracy. So it actually is as much a part of our democracy as anything else. And 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 so with that, how do regular citizens find? advocacy and voice in this fight? What, what are, the, what are the, the, the two to three things that average citizens need to pay attention to? And, and where does their voice matter in this when this has been a perpetual reality of our democracy? It's been a perpetual reality. Um, and it's something that, you know, for too long, our political system has accepted as something that is just part of American politics. And what we tried to do in forming the NDRC in 2017 was to say, look, let's let's just make this system fair and, and you know, make it fair. And Democrats will win some elections. Republicans will win some elections. But the people will actually decide, you know, who wins as opposed to the line drawers. And so, you know, we formed up uh, as part of this this effort, a thing called the, the all on the line um, campaign. And that's where citizens can help us just fight for fair maps. You can find us, you know, on, on the Internet. And we've had citizen actions where people have testified um, at redistricting committees, redistricting commissions. Uh, people have sent in things through the Internet, uh, emails, text messages to express um, their concerns about the way in which lines were drawn. And we, we tried to open up that portal so that um, average citizens, so-called average citizens, because in every average citizen, there is an extraordinary person, um, but so that these average citizens can have a, have a way of influencing the, the, the map making. And I think we were pretty successful um, compared this year to 10 years or so ago. And as a result, with citizen, greater citizen involvement, the maps are substantially more fair than they were um, you know, 10 years before. And, well, and, and, and one of the things I'm curious about, I mean, there, there seems to be some legislative challenges that are a reality to, to, to fair maps. I mean, are we, are we in a place where as much as we fight, we are still ultimately relying on the courts to make the, the ultimate decision on fair and not fair in any given election? Yeah, it's a variety of um, places where, you know, the ultimate decisions are made. Sometimes it's in the courts. Um, sometimes uh, when we, we have tried to stand up with citizen support, these independent commissions that actually um, draw the lines, they are free of, of, of politics. You have one that works pretty well in California. Um, one's work is new and worked pretty well in, in Michigan. Citizens supported them also in Utah, Missouri, um, as well as in Virginia. Some worked better than others. Um, so you have that that uh, that ability a, a, as well, um, and then sometimes it's, it's it's the legislatures that are actually drawing the lines. And there, I think people have to try to hold their um, elected representatives responsible if they are doing things inconsistent with what they're supposed to be doing, representing um, th their constituents. Then they have to be there has to be an electoral consequence for that, you know, come uh, come November. But, you know, it, the, the courts have certainly been helpful, especially state courts, the federal courts, uh, because of a Supreme Court ruling is, when it comes to gerrymandering, have kind of taken themselves off the field. And so we have the lawsuits that we have brought and that have been successful in bringing have largely been in the uh, in the state court system. And every time we have been able to place before the people, giving them the option of putting in place an independent commission, they have voted in favor of that because people get it. They understand that you're asking politicians to kind of draw maps that will have an impact on their own political, po political careers. I mean, they're interested parties. And when you say, all right, we're going to let some disinterested people do the line drawing, uh, the people always say, all right, we'll, we'll vote for uh, putting in place an, an independent commission. Mm -hmm. you, you talked about some of the states that that are uh, beginning to do some things righter. 
um, but but where are some of the states where the real fight is like where, where whether you are a citizen of that state or whether you're someone that is is an advocate for increased democracy, where are the places that we really have to be paying attention to, not only in this midterm, but beyond for 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 a, a broader and, and more aggressive fight? Yeah, I mean, I think th- those states would be Texas, um, Georgia, Wisconsin, um, Florida. Those are places that, you know, give me concern. Um, there were, if you'd asked me that question, you know, 10 years ago, I would have added, uh, you know, a, a few other states. But I think those other states are now in a, a better place. Um, but I think the legislatures in those states that I've just mentioned um, have tried to put in place maps that, are, again, are, are gerrymandered. And there are lawsuits that are now being decided that have been filed and will be decided by the courts. Um, they will ultimately get to, I suppose, you know, this, potentially get to the United States Supreme Court because a lot of these suits have been filed in the uh, in the state court system. Um, but those are the states I think that give me the, the greatest concern now. I mean, I, I'm I'm you know I'm happy that we've made progress, um, but we're not yet at the place where we need to be. And to echo something that I think you said earlier, and I think is really important, is that there's going to be the need for continued vigilance. Um, and continued activity in this space. It's not as if we can say the redistricting process is over for this cycle. We don't have to worry about this again until 2031. We're going to have we have to focus on this issue throughout the course of this decade uh, to make sure that the progress that we want is not lost, and to make sure that in the lead up to the 2031 process, things are not done that make prog- further progress um, impossible. But but can can you provide for me maybe a, a historical? some historical context or reset, right? Because if, if we know that this is part of our democracy, this redistricting process is part of our democracy, that since the 1800s, there have been those that attempted to use it for the purpose of um, power being given to the people that they wanted to give power to. If, 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 if that was the case, then, then wasn't this always designed to provide power? to those in power? Or, sure. or are we to believe that there was a more altruistic reality that we knew that there were going to be shifts in in demographics and we wanted this to, to shift districts based on shifts in demographics? I mean, because, because l- listen, A.G. Holder, I, I like to think the best of America, but often I know America too well to think the best of America. So is, is gerrymandering doing exactly what it was meant to do? Or are we now as citizens really trying to fight to shift it from being what it was designed to do? No, we're fighting to shift gerrymandering from what it was intended to do, which is to support one party over the other in an unfair way. We're trying to get away from gerrymandering to fair um, redistricting. And, you know, when I say it's been a part of the American system for almost as long as we've been a republic, that doesn't mean that I think it's right. Um, it, it means that, you know, we for too long have allowed it to exist and we have to do all that we can uh, to eliminate it. You know, this is a country that used to give its citizens literacy tests or demand poll taxes in order to vote until, you know, in the latter part of the 20th century, we said that was not, um, that was not fair. It was inconsistent with, with our constitution. Uh, and, and gerrymandering has been something that's, I think, a little harder to attack because people don't necessarily see the harm. You can see the harm in a literacy test. You can see the, the harm in a poll tax. Gerrymandering is a little more uh, obscure. Um, and when we formed up the NDRC back in 2017, and I talk about the need to have fair redistricting and you know, to eliminate gerrymandering, people's you know, eyes would glaze over. And I said, well, here's the deal. If you care about a woman's right to choose, uh, if you care about you know, gun safety, if you care about uh, criminal justice reform, all of these things are connected directly to who serves in your state legislatures, who serves in, in Congress. And that is all, is all affected by how redistricting um, is done. And so, yeah, there's no there's no altruism, you know, in this. I mean, in, in gerrymandering, gerrymandering is all about keeping one party in power at the expense of the, the other party and ultimately at the expense of the, uh, of, the of the American people. And, and so I, I, this may seem like a remedial question. Right. But but the more we have these conversations, whether it's about gerrymandering or whether it's about the Electoral College or whether it's about some of these very kind of nuanced process issues of the American democracy, it, 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 
it kind of elevates this reality that we have done less and less as a country to ensure the citizenry is um, competent around civics. And so what, what part of this work is really targeted groups of us um, paying a lot more attention to educating the population on basic civics and the understanding of how the government functions in order to, to almost prepare soldiers in this fight, as opposed to having to deal with a regular basis on the intentional ignorance of, of an American people around the very process that impacts their lives. Yeah, I mean, there is in the reform work that I've been involved in, um, there is a ref an educational component to it, um, making people understand what gerrymandering is, what fair redistricting should look like, what the impact of um, those processes um, can be, um, and, and to make people even just understand at, at some basic levels, I mean, how state legislatures work um, and, and the impact of state legislative action on people's day-to-day -day lives. You know, everybody kind of gets kind of what the president does, you know, um, but you ask people below that, well, you know, what, who's your secretary of state um, in, in Ohio? Who is the state auditor? All of these people have important uh, jobs when it comes to fair redistricting. And so there is a, a civics education component um, to reform, because when you make people um, understand how the system works and how the system can be misused, uh, if you educate people in that way, you get them active, you, you get them upset, you get them concerned. And then hopefully that anger and that concern gets channeled into positive, into positive action. Um, it, it's something that you have to do on a continuing basis. Um, it, it's something that doesn't happen just naturally. You know, positive change isn't promised. You know, pro positive change happens because of commitment, sacrifice, um, and, and people determined to, to make it uh, make it occur. Um, you know, our, our civil rights movement wasn't successful simply because it was time for Jim Crow to go. It, it happened because people committed themselves sacrificed, gave their lives so that the, the structure uh, of Jim Crow um, would disappear. And it's going to have to be similar to that if we want to ultimately get rid of gerrymandering and unfair redistricting. Although I will say this, you know, the, the threats that we face in our time are not nearly as severe as the threats faced by Medgar Evers, for instance, you know, back in the, in the 60s. He gave his life uh, to try to eliminate um, Jim Crow. Oh the threats that we face are not nearly as as serious and therefore there's no excuse for us not to be actively engaged in this fight for a fair democracy um and we do a disservice we do not honor the the people who gave us the opportunities that we have today there's a debt that we owe to those prior generations that we can only pay by continued um civic activism well, and, and, I, and, and listen, as a, as a former National Youth Director of the NAACP, I, I would say that even those who were placed in the position of martyr, uh, despite the fact that they didn't want to be, would say that I don't want you doing this for me. I want you doing this for your children. And so as, as much as we owe a debt to those that sacrificed, we actually owe a greater debt to the inheritors of this democracy, of our country. And so... I'm, I'm curious, though, because, you know, the, the, let's, let's be straight up, right? This is probably one of the hardest discussions that has happened today to be nonpartisan, because so much of this is, is rooted in kind of partisan engagement. But, but, but when I really think about it, does this ultimately come down to an American citizenry deciding that they want to fight against American electeds that think, power is more important than people, regardless no, I of, think it's, yeah. No, I, I think it's the American people deciding that they want to fight for um, American ideals and, and fight for, you know, the, the concepts that we have always said define this nation. And that sounds a little kind of apple pie-ish, you know, um, it sounds a little, you know, maybe even But even who's naive. the fight against, though? If, if that's the case, who's the fight against? Well, the fight is against those in power who want to maintain power at all costs, who want to maintain the status quo, regardless of what the American people want. You know, this has always been, as I said in my remarks, 
a battle between two sides, you know, one side that has power and wants to retain it, another side that's looking for fairness and wants to be treated um, with a degree of equality that they have not had. Now, that has disproportionately been people of color who have been on the short end of that equation. But <laughs> my white friends need to understand that uh, if you are an urban dweller, if you are a, a young person, you know, you're not getting the same equal treatment that other people in this country um, are getting as well. This is an American fight. Yeah, disproportionately people of color need to be engaged, need to be focused on this issue because they are disproportionately, um, you know, the people who, who suffer the most. But this is really an American fight, and it's an American fight against those who want to hold on to power. You know, this is, this is, this is all about power, the acquisition of power and the maintenance of power. And I think that, you know, power is supposed to be with the people and the people have to fight for the power um, that should be theirs. You know, Frederick Douglass said, you know, power doesn't, set, power sees nothing without a demand. And I'd say without a demand and without action. So, you know, a demand has to be made and that demand has to be followed up. Um, with uh, with serious action, and so as 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 we begin to to round this out, I mean, I think that there are there are folks that are watching this who are tried and true um, advocates who, who are well versed on these issues, as well as those that that are just chiming in because they they're interested in in their futures, and I'm wondering if there are three kind of pragmatic recommendations that you can provide to folks to say, if, if you do nothing else, when you turn this, this live off, one, two, and three is what you can do to not only educate yourself, but to be part of the fight in educating people around you um, in, in reducing the impact of negative gerrymandering and lifting fair maps as almost a modus operandi as opposed to an anomaly. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, first and foremost, uh, uh, and this is like always should be number one. People have to vote. I mean, you, you really have, there's no excuse. I don't care how long the lines are. I don't care what the weather is. You have to vote. Um, so that's one. Um, being involved in activities, you know, as you were saying before, you know, civic activities, civic education, um, find organizations that are registering people to vote, educating young people about what the political, how the political system um, works and does not work, you know, be engaged in those kinds of things. I mentioned that organization called All on the Line that's part of our reform effort. Look at that. There are a whole variety of things that you can do, you can do there. Um, and then, you know, just a, a, kind of almost in a general way, just think to yourself, what is it that, that I can do? You know, Dr. King said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. But here's the deal. It doesn't bend on its own. It only bends when people like us put our hands on that art and pull it towards justice. And so that's the third thing I would ask of, of everybody. Ask yourself, what is it that you are doing? What is it that you can do in order to make this nation better? It's not enough simply to be looking at the TV and yelling at you know, CNN, MSNBC, Fox. That's not enough. What is it that you're actually doing? Voting, helping people get registered um, to vote, being engaged in... Uh, in organizations that are trying to make our voting system fair, that are trying to do away with uh, unfair redistricting, you know, join these organizations, support these organizations um, with your time, with your money to the extent you're capable, you have that capacity. Um, you know, there are a whole bunch of ways in which you can be engaged uh, in the fight for, you know, a, a better, a better America. And so I'm, I'm, I'm also a little bit curious um... I think there are a lot of people that, that don't always believe that change is possible. And so I, I'm curious why you think so. Um, because the, 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 the perpetual nature of what we're dealing with from, from the standpoint of inequity, from the standpoint of, of power, kind of ruling those without power, what gives you hope as you do this work? Um, because you've been consistent and, and you and you've been um, incredibly not only consistent, but but very narrowly focused on the areas where you want to create impact. What in the midst of, of this reality continues to give you hope that something can be different than than it's been? You know, if you're pessimistic, um, that leads, I think, to inaction into stagnation. 
Um, it's optimism that I think is the foundation for, uh, for activism and for the fight for positive change. But the thing that gives me the, the, the greatest amount of hope, I, I just, push, uh, just published a book. It's called Our, Un- Our Unfinished March. And it looks at Uh, It looks at our our history, Um, and I I tell it through stories of people who who fought for the right to vote. The first people to fight for the right to vote in this country were white men, white men who didn't have property and who were excluded um, from, from voting. And then you see women fighting for the right to vote. Black people fighting for the right to vote and then fighting for the right to vote um, yet again. And in all of those instances, um, all of those groups were successful um, imperfectly uh, in in getting, you know, getting the the franchise uh, and then had to fight to try to make sure that they maintain, um, you know, the ability to vote. And so our history is ultimately what makes me feel um, optimistic because I, I have looked at you know, the 1840s, as I said, as white men are trying without property, you're trying to get the right to vote. The early part of the 20th century, women trying to su- successfully get the right to vote. Um, African Americans after the period of enslavement and then after the period of, 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 of Jim Crow, trying to get truly get the, the right to vote. Um, those efforts were, you know, largely successful. Now we're still fighting. We're still fighting against those who would try to roll the clock back. But our history tells us that if we stay committed and if we sacrifice and if we don't just have a moment, but have a movement that we can ultimately be um, successful. And so that's where my optimism um, comes from. Well, and, and before I let you go, Socrates said the secret to change is to focus all of your energy, not on the fighting of the old, but on building the new. And so even as we deal with the reality of fighting what's currently happening, what is the vision that you think people should have in this democracy that are looking for an elevated democracy that are looking for an equitable democracy? What are the things we should be building um, to support the kind of work that you're talking about in addition to fighting the realities of, of these things at a legislative level, at the court level? Um, because there are those that are going to be the soldiers of what will be versus the, the warriors against what was. Yeah. You know, I, I go back to what we were talking about earlier. You know, the, the fight for voting rights before and the fight for voting rights today, the, the anti gerrymandering fight of today is not only to pay repay a debt and it's not only about what happens in the election of 2022. It's also about what happens 10, 20, 30 years from now. It's all about it's, st- it's all about the future um, as, as well. And, and so the America that I would like to see would be one where people have the ability to register easily. One of the things I've always called for is for automatic voter registration, same day registration. Uh, I, I would hope that we'd have an America where felon disenfranchisement would um, would disappear, where we'd have guaranteed day, 14 days is what I propose, 14 days of, of guaranteed early voting, the use of the mails to, to vote. We use that during the 2020 election very successfully. The number of people who voted went up very substantially. Um, those are the kinds of really concrete things that um, I hope to see either be put in place immediately or be put in place relatively soon. And I hope that, that, be, that those kinds of things would help define, I think, a better America. Get away, get away with the, you know, put a, put away and and knock down these these voter suppression laws um, that are unnecessary, that are anti-democracy. And that have, as I said, that disproportionate impact on communities of color. Um, and then, you know, at some basic level, we've got to we've got to make peace with our we got to make peace with and understand our racial past. You know, and we have to look back. We do have to study our history if we want to make our future um, better. And so that means understanding our racial history, our electoral history, our civics history. Um, understand. The, the things that we didn't do as well as we should have as a nation so we don't repeat them in, in the future. We should always be looking. Um, I think that quote that you just said it is really important. We should always be looking towards the future. How do we make this country um, better? We, we can do it, but um, it will involve a whole bunch of people um, and a lot of concerted action. Yeah. And, and I agree with you. I hope that all listening will, if you're not registered, registered. If you haven't voted, vote. Um, that the municipal and state elections are places where you show up as much as you show up for national elections. 
but I hope that people, regardless of ideology, will realize, I mean, King said it best that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And while it, it may feel like you're winning right now, it's a setup for you losing later. Um, and so if there is not real justice, then we, then none of us have it. And so AG Holder, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us um, for this Democracy Summit. Appreciate the work that you continue to do. Um, where can people follow you? And um, any last sentence that you would give to those that are listening before we, we sign off? Yeah, I, I spend a good amount of time, I suppose, on Twitter at, at Eric Holder. I have an Instagram account, you know, as well under the same name. Um, and he, here's what I say, you know, I'm sure that everybody, I'm glad that everybody is listening and I'm glad everybody's attending, you know, the, the, this summit, but you can't just, ex, ex, you know, experience it over the course of these next couple of, of, of days. The question is, what are you going to do next week, you know, and what are you going to do the week after that? And people, I hope, will come out of this with a sense of, um, a greater sense of how our our, our system works uh, with a greater commitment to making positive change because we need to understand that we have within ourselves, we do have within ourselves that ability to bring about the change that we all say we want. But it's not enough simply to come to the summit, listen to people speak, and then do nothing. The question always is, what are you going to do? We can't have this moment that we are spending together we need to put together a 21st century movement for democracy. I think we have that ability to do it. And I'm actually optimistic that uh, young people in particular uh, will take this country finally to the place where it, uh, where it should be. Well, and, and that's a great segue. Um, thank you all for joining us for this conversation. With that, I'd like to hand it over to one of the people that I think is, is, is one of my favorite people within the movement that A.G. Holder is talking about. Um, with uh, When We All Vote, and that is my dear friend, Stephanie Young. Stephanie, thank you for having both myself and A.G. Holder on, and um, thank you for the continuous work that you do uh, to advance our democracy. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, everybody. Oh, my gosh, you guys, this has been an incredible day. I hope that you feel inspired what A.G. Holder just mentioned in regards to our history, you are going to get a history lesson as to where this democracy has been. If you tune in on Monday, we are starting this all over again on Monday at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. That will be our last day of the summit, and Mrs. Obama will be our keynote speaker. So first, I have to thank, obviously, Attorney General Eric Holder. I have to thank Jeff Johnson for that amazing conversation. We've had we've had so much from Latasha Brown to Mark Elias and Cheryl and Eiffel to David Hogg, Ali Young. I have a whole list that I have to look at from Deja Fox to Dr. Mustafa Ali and Felicia Butterfield Jones and Chloe and Hallie and Sean G from Live Nation Urban that is literally helping us pull this summit together in Los Angeles. So we could not be more grateful for the cross section of industries that has come together to help make this moment happen. And, and just like the attorney general mentioned, what are you gonna do after you get this information? Well, there's a lot of things you can do. You can partner with When We All Vote uh, if you run an organization or a corporation. Uh, in addition to that, you can sign up to volunteer, take your time uh, to register voters in your community. You can also, if you're a parent, if you're a teacher, you can become a part of our My School Votes program you can also join a voting squad on a historically black college campus. Shout out to Hampton University, my alma mater. There is so much that you can do and we want to inspire you. So thank you for spending the day with us. Thank you for committing to being a part of the work that we're doing. And we cannot wait until you join us on Monday. For those of you who are working in voting organizations, tomorrow, Saturday and Sunday, we're doing some fun things from hiking to meeting and convening. And then on Monday, again, we're going to gather at the Bank of California. So come right here, to, back here to democracysummit.org. Make sure you do that. Save the date. 9 a.m. We're starting Pacific Standard Time, 12 uh, p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Join us. Let your voices be heard. Comment. Let us know how you like today. We want to hear from you. Thank you again. And thank you to our friends at Spark Street. You guys are awesome. You helped make this happen. So we appreciate each and every one of you. Stay safe. Thank you, guys. See you on Monday.